It all started in the big capital. The city was no longer as bright and calm as before. Torn signs on stores, on which one could see inscriptions about what clients were supposed to do in accordance with government regulations. UMART limits the amount of water and food provided to each person, with the hope of everyone's understanding. The store was a complete mess. Food was flying around, clients pushed each other, were rude and shouted. Everyone tried to grab what was left. Buyers were asked to wait in line. Everyone was thanked for their cooperation in building a cultural society. But people didn't listen. They pushed and spoke uncivilly. The store was on the verge of collapse. The main character was covered in beads of sweat. He heard someone calling for help. The little girl stood next to her grandmother and cried loudly. The grandmother was holding her head, from which a trickle of blood was flowing. Even though the earth continues to turn, just three months and humanity destroyed itself and declared an apocalypse. This apocalypse began with one piece of news. Asteroid Rama. After entering the solar system, it is expected to pass dangerously close to the Earth. The Space Research Center will study the asteroid after its collision with Jupiter or Mars. Three months ago, the girl asked Mr. Kong if he was going home yet. The boy refused and asked the employee to go first. Meanwhile, there were rumors in the office that he was divorced. The man told the employee that he probably didn't want to return to an empty house, which is why the guy worked late. Probably the boy wanted everyone to leave him alone. He didn't pay attention to the rumors. Back then, Rama was just a piece of rock floating in space. Only scientists were interested in him. The public ignored him. X-1 Rama, also known simply as Rama, which was supposed to pass close to the Earth, slowly changed its trajectory towards the Earth as it entered the solar system. As concerns continued to grow, a proposal was put forward at an international conference on space exploration to redirect the asteroid using atomic bombs. However, experts say this will not be enough. Today, one of the experts is in their studio to share his opinion on this matter. Professor Taihu Kim was thanked for coming. Thermonuclear engineer Professor Taihu Kim was in the studio. He looked confidently into the lens with his arms crossed over his chest. Rama slowly changed its course and began to show its true colors. Right now, a huge rock about 160 kilometers in diameter is moving towards the Earth at a speed of 17 kilometers per second. The presenter asked the professor whether it was difficult to understand the seriousness of the situation, to which Taihu replied that he would tell it more simply. The distance between the Earth and the Moon is about 380,000 kilometers, the asteroid will cover this distance in just six hours. If an asteroid of this size collides with the Earth at such a speed, it will literally blow the Earth into pieces. The professor said that even huge bunkers would not save them in this case. Even if they act immediately, it is too late to fix anything. They try to inspire people with their meaningless actions. CMBR sows false hopes in people's minds, as if they can believe everything they say on television. The main character noticed that he was very worried. It is becoming increasingly difficult for him to concentrate on work. The employee sitting next to me said the same thing. There are rumors on the internet that it is too late. Everyone is talking about the end of the world. The employee asked him if he really thought so, to which the guy replied that it seemed possible. If everything goes like this, he decided to go to his parents to be with his family. The employee asked Mr. Kang, how does he in turn worry about his parents? To which the main character replied that they had already died long ago. If only they had known about the asteroid three years ago or even a year ago. Even amidst these assumptions, fear and optimism, Rama stubbornly moved towards the ground. As they said before, they planned to simultaneously explode all their atomic bombs in space, several thousand, to redirect the asteroid with waves from the explosion, even if this entails the greatest crisis. Even if they have never faced such a crisis in history, they will do so. While driving the car, Kong looked at the road and listened to the news. The man said that this crisis would be a symbol of hope. This was repeated everywhere. For the first time in history, the entire world will unite to face the threat of Rama. Rama is here for their sins. Oh, collision is a great judgment on humanity. Such slogans were in the hands of people some with slogans and some with loudspeakers, asked to accept the appearance of the asteroid, to cleanse the body and soul of sin in its flame. This is the only way they will go to heaven. Any attempts to challenge God to prevent the asteroid from approaching. The main character watched these two activists in the car mirror. 
The plan will be implemented within just two weeks. When the weather conditions are most favorable for this, the man on the news continued to broadcast, the asteroid is getting closer to the Earth. Is the implementation of the Central International Development Bank plan realistic? To which they responded from the screen that they were carefully checking their plan. According to the information they received, the Central Bureau of Investigation has completed the final checks and is now waiting. People around the world should not be afraid. The man asked not to worry because they would not lose. They will stop Rama at any cost. Therefore, once again, they ask people to calm down and continue to live as they lived. The main character continued driving the car. There was something wrong with the traffic lights. The traffic light was not working again. In this chaos, everything went as usual, until one moment. Kang was holding some food in his hands. He decided to give it to his grandmother, who was sitting on the floor with a wounded head. Her granddaughter sat next to her grandmother, hugging her with tears in her eyes. Then a crowd of people began to jump out of the store, pushing Kong. The groceries from his backpack scattered to the sides. The crowd running out began to step on what had fallen from the boy's backpack. The product that was given to the grandmother was also lying on the floor, and now someone's foot was stepping on him. The grandmother looked sadly at the only food that she did not get, and the main character remained sitting on the floor in bewilderment. He was left alone. Several jars of juice lay in front of him. The main character glanced at one of them, after which, taking the jar, he put a couple of kopecks on the empty table and left the store. With humanity's last hope, thousands of nuclear warheads were sent to Rama. Hope, however, was hidden behind the dazzling fireworks. People looked excitedly at the sky, raising their heads. In the end, humanity was unable to redirect the asteroid, no matter how they tried and no matter what they did. Many meteorites have already fallen to the ground at great speed. The apocalypse was inevitable. The main character sitting on the sofa looked at his childhood photographs. Books were scattered around him. Lots of photos from his childhood to his teenage years. One of them was the end of his training. Kong got up from the sofa and headed towards the window, holding a jar of juice in his hands. He finally decided to open it by taking a sip of the cold, sweet liquid. A huge explosion occurred. A huge giant stone cracked and fragments flew around. The main character stood with a jar in his hands while everything around him collapsed, and he drank his juice for the health of himself and humanity. After he drank this juice, the boy seemed to find himself in another place. Here in front of him is his uniform, backpack, books. He got up from the couch and couldn't understand what happened. Still, the world is coming to an end. But he looked in the mirror and saw himself safe and sound. Chelso Kang, an ordinary office worker, died when the asteroid Rama crashed into the Earth, and he returned to the time when he was 13 years old. Looking in the mirror, he thought that this could not happen. Does life really flash before your eyes before death, or is it just a flashback? He walked around the room trying to remember something. I came across a book about the secrets of the universe. It all started with the author's biography, preface, content. Then a barcode caught my eye. Looking in the mirror again, the main character thought that if this was really a flashback, he would not remember all these things. Kang sat down on an office chair and looked ahead and couldn't stop thinking how this was possible. In front of him were many books and notepads on the table, and also a big computer, which he started to turn on. The Google search said frame, which yielded no results. Collision with an asteroid, also no results. Kang was very nervous, after which I thought that first I needed to calm down. It seems he moved in time. How could that happen? Why and who could have done this? Perhaps these are aliens. They could use his DNA to clone him, then use his memories to recreate this room. The main character thought that they were probably watching him now. He asked if anyone was here. A parallel universe, a many worlds interpretation is possible. The first explanation of quantum mechanics, the world branches out every moment of its existence. Kong thought what if he was in divergence? But based on what he remembers, it is impossible for one branch to influence the other. What about Nietzsche's theory of eternal recurrence? But in this case, he would not remember anything about his past life. But that's how he remembers. Maybe the afterlife is like heaven and hell. But for him, this situation is neither grace nor punishment. And the memories are so real that it doesn't feel like a dream. The boy put his hand to his head. Then someone opened the door to his room and called him by name. A woman standing on the threshold saw that the boy had woken up. It was his mother. She asked why all his books were on the floor. 
Why is the room such a mess? The woman began collecting books from the floor and asked him to put them on the shelf when he finished reading them. The main character bulged his eyes in surprise. The mother continued to walk around the room talking about the mess. She asked if he was looking for something. Then, looking at her son in surprise, she asked why he didn't answer. Kang simply stood up from his chair and rushed to his mother to hug her. She noticed that he was behaving very strangely, and she asked if he had a nightmare. Kong thought that, even if it's because of the afterlife or he's just a clone, he doesn't care. After all, he saw his parents again. The father came up and asked the mother in surprise what was wrong with him. Kong knew it wasn't a dream, but now he wants to think it was just a memory. A long-lasting nightmare. Okay, the hero was already sitting on a bench on the street. He wondered if it would happen again. After seeing his parents, he discarded theories about cloning and aliens. After all, his parents were cremated, and the ashes were buried in the cemetery. Even aliens couldn't get their DNA to recreate them. He doesn't know what to expect now, but he is sure that this world is the same. Well, how can this be, and why exactly him? There are better people than the average office worker like him. Kong entered a room and looked at the paintings on the walls. More suitable people, for example, whose photos are on these walls. But still, the frame moves towards the ground. People looked at the model of the land at this exhibition and said how beautiful everything was. If this world is no different from the past, then the future is predetermined. The collision of an asteroid with the Earth is a fact. This is what the main character thought while looking at the model of the Earth. Thinking about how and why is a waste of time. It's irrational. Hold on to unsolvable problems. Only one thing is clear, that he is faced with a problem for which he knows the cause and consequences, but he does not have a solution. He must save the Earth. I stretch out my hand to the model of the Earth. The main character closed his eyes, after which the following thoughts came to his mind. The parents asked Kang if he liked the land model. They noticed how the boy looked at him and touched him with interest. Then the father invited his family to take a photo. The mother, hugging her son, stood in front of the lens asking her husband to show the ground in the photograph. And so the man began to photograph his family. Kang smiled sweetly in the photo. Meanwhile, the woman on the TV screen was broadcasting that the universe is infinite, the future that awaits them. And as the professor said, if they had discovered the asteroid three years ago or even a year ago, all this was intertwined in Kang's head. He continued to look at the model of the Earth and listen to the news. The father was still standing with the camera asking his son to smile. He asked about something, and suddenly his son became thoughtful. Kong really thought there might be a way to stop the asteroid. And here we are a month later. The main character stood in front of the school sign, where new students were welcomed, the universe of scientific explanation. The teacher welcomed everyone to the seventh grade. She congratulated them on their first day of high school, and I imagined that her name was Miss Yuri Na. She is not their homeroom teacher. The main character thought that he didn't remember much of his past life, but the memories partially remain. It's like some kind of deja vu. Old memories appear at certain moments. The teacher said that now they will always have one class teacher and Odnoklasniki. When he watches the news, he has the feeling that he has already seen it. After talking with his parents, he has the feeling that this conversation has already happened. Even this class, this teacher, classmates, everything is familiar. The teacher asked us to enjoy these three years together. Kong, sitting at his desk, thought that this is not deja vu. This memory is returning. The teacher said that she understood that they were still a little shy. She's sure that's the case with most of them. And she asked why not introduce themselves to them too. The woman decided to start with Chelso Kang. The main character thought that he was being punished since he was called first. The teacher asked what he liked to do. And what does he want to become when he grows up? The boy thought about what he liked to do, what he wanted to become at that age. He didn't think much about the future, but now everything is different. The main character said that he dreams of becoming an astrophysicist. The teacher realized that he liked to look at the stars and I asked what he wanted to do when he became an astrophysicist. Does it have any scientific goals? Kong replied that he wanted to detect asteroids heading towards the Earth while they were still at a safe distance, so they can prepare and stop them. He explained that he wanted to look for asteroids, even if they were very far away. He wants to search for asteroids early to predict their trajectory and save the world. 
The teacher said that the chance of an asteroid hitting the Earth is extremely small. Is she speaking correctly? To which Kong replied that this was quite possible. One of the students told another that Kong most likely took all this from the film. The second began to ask what is the chance that an asteroid will crash into the Earth. The boy replied that he sounded like his little brother. Another classmate asked if he really couldn't differentiate between movies and real life. The teacher asked everyone to be quiet, and she told the main character that he had a great dream. There was a boy at the back desk. He immediately stood up and exclaimed that this was simply wonderful. Kang was very surprised that this boy liked his story. A classmate stood up from his desk, approached him and shook his hand and said that he was for him. He explained that he also wants to work in technology. This boy's name was Taihu Kim. Taihu Kim, the man who was interviewed on television. Kang began to remember key researcher of the Asteroid Defense Committee. When the end of the world was approaching in his past life, he was very famous. This interview inspired Kang to become an astrophysicist. The teacher explained that he couldn't just get up like that when it wasn't his turn yet. Taihu took the main character's hand and began to pull it up. He exclaimed that technology is the pinnacle of knowledge. Everything is valuable, a word that defines human history and their possibilities in the future. Kong asked if this was a utopia. Taihu answered in the negative. Technology is not a utopia. Even imperfections are part of them. If you want to prepare for something that may not happen at all, then the chances of success are negligible. Taihu said that he would still find out everything he could about it. Try even though it may not work at all. Taihu exclaimed that this is technology, and he did it without even realizing it. The teacher replied that this is a difficult concept. Well, the boy said that it's not at all difficult. As soon as they start, then they will understand everything. He even told the teacher that she could do this herself. Then he asked Kang how he wanted to do this. Tehu began to explain that this is string theory. Waves, waves, rocket. He wants to work with rockets. And he asked Kong why not string theory. The main character thought that it was necessary to develop a powerful enough rocket engine so that it could change the flight path of the asteroid. He thought about how he managed to involve Taieha. Kong said that string theory is interesting, but it is too difficult to prove in practice. He is not interested in purely theoretical research. Taiehu raised his hands up and exclaimed that this was all fun, to which the main character replied that he says what he thinks. He prefers a field where he can conduct practical experiments and get real results. For example, the development of rocket engines. Taiehu, looking at what his classmate was drawing, thought, he said that if Kong chose to develop a rocket engine, he could help him. Taihu was very surprised that he was thinking about rocket propulsion systems. The main character answered that yes, he thought so. But the propulsion systems that exist now are not enough to redirect the asteroid. We need something better. For example, a thermonuclear engine with a liquid core. If something happens, it will be useful. Taihu was very surprised about the thermonuclear engine with a liquid core. Current scientists have not advanced one step in the field of studying solid core technology. This is the next generation. Is it really possible to make a profit from an engine that is two generations ahead? Taihu asked if the development works out as he thinks, how fast it will be. Kong replied that the push is more important than the speed. Well, he hasn't calculated anything yet. Then a classmate asked if he had rough estimates. The main character's brain is already boiling. He answered his classmate that he didn't know, maybe 10% of the speed of light. Taihu, lost in thought, immediately jumped up and took his classmate by the shoulders. Looking into his eyes, he joyfully exclaimed that he could do this too. He was very passionate and inspired. Leaning towards his classmate, he invited him to develop this together. After all, two heads are better than one. Kong thought what kind of development was this, because he really doesn't understand. But he still agreed, answering that he was always happy to help. Twenty years later, the media interrupts the broadcast for a breaking news broadcast. An international space development conference was announced today. Countermeasures against Rama were unsuccessful. What does the end of the world mean? The end of the world is approaching. The main character was sitting at the table with his classmate. In front of them were many jars of juice and food. The previously mentioned countermeasures of the International Space Development Conference against the Rama asteroid. They were the use of rocket propulsion to change the trajectory of an asteroid. He asked Taeha if he didn't say that everything was under control. However, 
the plan was deemed unfeasible due to technological limitations. Professor Taihu Kim, who was in charge of working on the project, took responsibility and left his post. The International Space Engineering Conference has announced that they will soon be revealed to the public. Taihu said that he also just found out. More information was revealed at the press conference. Taihu asked if Kong had heard of the company submitting a resignation letter for him. They sat next to each other talking about it. Taihu sat with his head down, clutching his hair with his hand. None of the experts believed in his statements except him. Taihu told the main character that he could become a world-famous astronomer. The television broadcast that Professor Chelsu Kang had finally joined them. He was the first to discover the asteroid Rama. According to their information, as soon as they discovered the asteroid, the light sail effect, the jet string effect, caused by the vapors of frozen gas. The presenter told Kang that he stubbornly insisted that there was a danger of him colliding with the ground. Professor Kang said that this is an acceleration caused by the uneven gravitational field of the ellipsoid. Kong thought that after he became an astronomer, he discovered the asteroid three years earlier. He accurately calculated its course and warned the whole world about an imminent collision with the ground. Is this really not enough? For them, he is just a famous astronomer who ended up on TV and talking about the threat of an asteroid. They probably think this is an excuse to increase funding. Tehu exclaimed that he has known him since childhood, so he knows that he is not like that. But for everyone else, it's crazy, especially when he says that a piece of stone, which even now is not close to the ground, should fall into it. They just pretend that they are working on a solution to the problem so that people don't worry. Well, now they are very worried, and they shout that Rama is approaching the ground. What to do in this case? Taihu opened the refrigerator and exclaimed that they were out of beer. They still haven't developed a propulsion system, although it might just be better to launch nuclear warheads. The main character told Taya that he was on the team, and I asked him if he wasn't working on the engine. Taihu exclaimed that of course he worked, but the others refused to cooperate with him. They wouldn't allow him to take full advantage of testing because it was supposedly too dangerous. They ignored his instructions on how to assemble the parts, and the director was only interested in using the project as a cover. How was he supposed to finish developing the engine when he had to deal with all these people around him? He asked his friend why he didn't tell him about this earlier. He didn't have clearance. After all, he could have told him that there were some problems with the project. He said it was out of pride. He asked if the guy was hiding all this because of pride. After all, maybe this is not so important for Kong, but for him personally, it is very important. Kong replied that after everything they've been through, Tehu explained that he wanted to finish the engine and say this is it, tell him and the rest of the world. Well, when he saw Kang on television, where he asked to reserve praise until the danger was past. For the first time, he realized that everything was not going the way he wanted. It wasn't easy at all. The main character exclaimed that it would be easier if not for his pride. Tehu asked if he really believed what he said. Kong told the guy that he wasn't completely serious when he started working on the engine. Then he asked him to forget about it. After all, this was all probably just for Taihu's amusement. And he told him that this is the kind of person he is. Taihu asked if he knew about this. Kong replied yes. And he began to blame himself for trusting him. But now Taihu felt much better after he expressed everything to the main character. And here we have a man with a slogan again. Rama is here for their sins. O oh, collision of almighty judgment on humanity. The man shouted into the loudspeaker for people to accept the arrival of the asteroid, to cleanse their bodies and souls from sin with cleansing fire. This is the only way to heaven. Any attempt to defy God's providence and impede the approach of the asteroid continued to be loudly shouted. Kung thought as he passed by that they were a complete failure. This time, he was also unable to save the earth. Well, why only this time? Was there ever a second chance? What if this is life's incredibly lucky chance? As they said on television, they will test their plan step by step. The main character sat on the sofa holding a jar of water in his hands. He lifted it up and opened it, after which he again decided to drink to his health. And then the boy opened his eyes again. He was lying on the bed. When he woke up, he realized that he had returned. Approaching the table, he picked up a calendar on which the month of April was. Kong realized that last time he returned on a different day, two months earlier. It looks like it won't return to the same point every time. 
Meanwhile, at school, the teacher greeted her students. She walked along the corridor, approaching the class. Looking at Kong from the side, the woman thought that being gifted was not bad. But he needs to make friends. The teacher noticed that all the students were chatting with each other, and the main character was sitting on the side all the time. It seemed to him that he remembered everything from his past life. But in reality, he doesn't remember anything. He doesn't remember anything about astronomy or what he studied in college. It will be difficult to learn everything from the very beginning. Now he realizes that he was a rather irresponsible astronomer. There was a limit to what he could do. After the International Space Engineering Conference created the Rama Defense Team, he did nothing to help stop the asteroid. It was important to discover the asteroid earlier. Well, it was not necessary to trust only Tehu to stop the asteroid. Instead of focusing on finding the asteroid, focus on developing a propulsion system that can change the asteroid's flight path. How far will they go with this? He studies the Fourier transform and the Laplace transform. It also remembers transition formulas. Tehu asked why memorize something that he would understand if he understood the technique. Kong replied that it was not that he did not know how to solve mathematical induction. He just wants to know them by heart. Taehu said that if he can't remember them, it means he doesn't understand technology. If you shorten the technique, you will be able to remember how to write formulas without even memorizing them. The main character stopped talking to his friend. He asked him if he didn't want to help, then let him be left alone. And so they flew day after day. At the entrance to the school premises, there was a slogan, Thank you, teachers, for your love. Meanwhile, the students gathered around Taihu while Kong walked around alone again. The students told him it was really cool. They can't believe he made it to a professional team. The guy replied to his fellow students that he had received many offers, so he decided to sign a contract with one of the teams. The main character listened to Taihu's conversation with the students very carefully. He was still a trainee and played as if he were quite skilled. Kong suddenly called out to Taiha. He said that the boy said that he dreams of launching rockets. Taehu confirmed his words. And as he left, he exclaimed that as time goes on, everything changes. His dreams also changed. Taehu began to go down the steps, and Kong looked after him. And in class, they asked me to turn to page 52. Today, they will measure changes in mass during chemical reactions. They asked to look at the substances in front of the students. They will need a solution of hydrochloric acid, calcium carbonate, and much more. During lessons, Taihu didn't even listen while falling asleep. The main character thought that Taihu always does what he wants, and there is no sense of responsibility. He almost trusted him again. And now, he won't let anyone help him. Kang decided to stop the asteroid himself. He was completely sure that he did not need help. He can do everything himself. And here we are 20 years later. The corporation told all engineers to return to their jobs. At 0809, 22 seconds, the 28th engine combustion test will begin. Started checking pipelines, checking valves, checking fuel tanks, checking oil pressure, checking nozzles. All systems were ready. After cross-checking, the all-clear sounded. The woman thought about what would work this time. She exclaimed to the doctor that everything was ready. And I asked the main character if they were starting the engine. Kong replied that we need to get started. And then the engine ignition countdown began in reverse order, after which everyone exclaimed joyfully that they had done it. They finally succeeded. Now they will receive a bonus. The woman who was an employee of the main character told Dr. Kong, very happily raising his hands up, that they finally did it. The boy didn't react at all. She, in turn, asked if he was not happy. And leaning over, she said that it seemed to her that he was not happy at all. After all, in his place, she would be in a trance. They have just laid the groundwork for exploring Mars using their rocket engine, to which Kong replied that they still have a lot of work ahead. We need to repeat tests, start analyzing data, and much more. The woman was surprised that he was still thinking about the future. He doesn't plan to use it on the upcoming shuttle to Mars. You asked if she was thinking correctly. The main character replied that if all this is possible, then why not? Moreover, everything complies with the standards. Much more testing needs to be done before Rama arrives. After his words, the woman shed tears and said that it looked like she was staying late again today. The main character asked Dr. Odley to print today's report and send it to him. We need to send it to the Mars Exploration Committee. She was very surprised and wanted to object, but still remained silent. 
She had two tickets to the musical in her hands. The woman thought that even on such a day he was all about work. A man told Dr. Kong that he had heard that the research was successful. He exclaimed that this was very excellent news. Kong thought it was Smiloff. If it weren't for him, he would have started working on the engine a year earlier. He is the stereotypical leader who is greedy and incompetent. When Kang came into his office, he asked for forgiveness and asked him to sit down. Because he needs to make one call. The new report requires urgent study. Kong thought about how he had clawed his way into this position. He asked the man if it was urgent, to which the man replied that if it were not urgent, he would not have called. They said that an asteroid could fly near the Earth. The man answered the phone that he was reading the report. Kong thought that the time had already come. Did they really find him earlier than the first time? Or he was simply lost in time? Looks like they're putting together a task force. Who will lead it? Probably Charlotte, because she works with possible asteroids. The man decided who would lead this group. The main character thought it was interesting who he would choose. The man exclaimed that his answer was, of course, negative. This is Charlotte. She's an expert in this field. It is necessary that she concentrates energy in her area. There was a message here that the Asteroid Task Force also needed an expert on engines, namely for consultation. Asked to look at the documents before, as some of them already know, they believe that 10 asteroids could collide with Rama. 1,902 Shaposhnikov, 243 Idas, 243 Idas and Dactyl, 288 chapters and six more. Fortunately, none of them are more than 100 kilometers in diameter. The woman said that the problem is not as difficult to solve as it seems to her. The main character took a book in his hands and asked if this was the first meeting. It sounds like they've already decided what to do. The woman replied that even if they discuss options, they need to start somewhere, so she came up with a plan. Kong decided to guess and said that their plan was to redirect the asteroid using nuclear warheads, to which she replied that it is, because now it is the safest and most effective solution. The main character at the meeting answered that nuclear explosions will not redirect the asteroid. The woman noticed that he also had a plan, and she asked Dr. Kong to share with them. Kong explained that it was necessary to install thermonuclear engines on the surface of Rama and then push it away from Earth's orbit. The woman said her point of view on the words of the main character, that thermonuclear engines will be effective. Well, that's too expensive. It will be difficult to install them on rockets. This was the opinion of Kang's employee on this matter. Kong said that as he understands, their group has good funding. The woman replied that he forgets about the prices for services to which the main character exclaimed that it doesn't matter what the prices for the service will be, the fate of entire humanity is at stake. The woman said that he was exaggerating. As she understands, their plan is no different from using a tractor to transport hand luggage. Someone asked what they would do if the tractor was also not enough. Then the woman looked again at Kong and said that she understood that he was proud of his developments in the field of engines, but now they needed untested and unexplored fusion engines. They need internal combustion traction engines, therefore nuclear warheads must be used. From there they would get more than enough energy to redirect the asteroid. Dr. Odley asked the employee if she had considered fusion engines as a solution. The woman replied that she had considered it, so she could say that this was not a solution. The main character thought that at the moment, Charlotte was right. But they won't be able to stop Rama this way. Even if he told them right now that Rama would crash into the ground, no one would believe him. Of course they will think he is an idiot. Charlotte told Dr. Kang that she was the asteroid expert, not him. And she invited him and Dr. Odelli to a meeting to hear their thoughts on what to do in an emergency. She invited the two of them because they know about engines. Kong thought that if the plan was doomed to fail from the start, he might miss his last chance to save the world. The main character, sitting at the table in front of his notebook, thought about what he should do. Charlotte turned to the main character and asked if he had any objections. Kong thought that if it weren't for Smilov, he wouldn't be sitting here. Charlotte looked at the main character questioningly again. She said that if they had nothing more to say, they would accept the plan with internal combustion traction engines and end the meeting there. Dr. Odeley asked the woman to wait a little. The main character exclaimed that Rama is not heading to the asteroid belt. He announced that the asteroid would soon change course, and he thought that he had no other choice but to tell them. 
that his destination is the earth. Otherwise, they will die. Charlotte was surprised and asked Dr. Kang what he was saying. Is Rama heading towards the ground? The woman asked if he had evidence. The boy was very surprised to hear about the evidence and thought about it. Without thinking twice, the main character replied that he had no evidence. Then Charlotte held her head and began to think. Opening her eyes, she asked if he really just wanted them to take his side. And then I asked if they were playing games here. After all, everything is much more serious than he thinks. It may all be a joke to him, but the rest of us are here to ensure the safety of humanity. Charlotte told the main character that he has a big ego. After all, they all also have a doctorate. After which she asked them not to come to the meeting anymore. The main character began to think that it would be too late if he waits for the evidence to come out. Therefore, something urgently needs to be done. Something needs to be done to warn everyone about Rama. He thought that some people would definitely believe him. Well, no matter if they believe him or not, he will tell the world about Rama. He will get their attention. Talk about the end of the world will be sensational. Kong said that if he told them that the current countermeasures were not effective enough. Dr. Odelli listened to him in surprise. Some time passed. The boy sat at the bar counter thinking about something. Then someone put his business card in front of his face, where it was written Daily Magazine. A guy appeared in front of him. He introduced himself as Oliver Townsend. He is a journalist from a daily magazine, and he asked the main character if he was Dr. Kang from the ICAR. Oliver said that he thinks the boy understands what their magazine is about since he addressed them. He explained that they are not a scientific journal. He doubts that a man of his caliber has anything to say to interest his readers. The main character turned to the guy and began to assure him that there was no need to worry. This will be interesting to everyone on the planet. Oliver immediately broke out in a sweat after hearing that to everyone on the planet. After listening to him, he was simply shocked and asked if the boy had gone crazy. And here is the newspaper headline. Sensation alien weapons are heading towards Earth. Interview with Dr. Chelso Kang, father of the fusion engine. The Earth is in danger of colliding with an asteroid called Rama, which he calls an alien weapon. Hence the International Space Development Conference. If this continues, the Earth will be destroyed. A man in his office scolded the main character. He asked if he understood what he had done. He told the whole world that everyone is in the Icar except him, and he pointed his finger at him insolently. After which he exclaimed that the main character probably thinks that everyone except him is an idiot. He was very angry and pointed his finger right at the boy. Kang said that he didn't do it on purpose. The man said that it doesn't matter whether it's on purpose or not. The fact itself is already a problem. He created anxiety in society, humiliated his colleagues and undermined the reputation of the ICCR. What did he think he would do to him now? Kang replied that he thought it would be suspension or dismissal. Then Dr. Odley called out to the boy. She said that the journalist took the words out of context. Did he really use it for advertising or used his name without permission? After all, that's how it is. She exclaimed that he was simply deceived. It's not too late to explain everything to the boss. She is sure that he will return it back. The main character turned to the doctor and said that the journalist did not take his words out of context. In the interview, he said what he wanted. Dr. Odley was left standing in bewilderment. Did he really give an interview? The main character began to leave, collecting his things. The woman ran after him, asking where he was now. Kong replied that now he has a lot of free time. He will go and tell the world about the Rama threat in much more detail. Dr. Odley asked if he would give interviews again, to which the boy replied that he would do the same and more. The woman asked what if the ICAR sues him. The boy replied that then most likely it would be much more difficult for him. Dr. Odley walked him all the way to the elevator and asked if there was anything she could do to help him, to which he refused her. After some time, the latest news of the week, the presenter said that they had a special guest in the studio who was at the epicenter of this week's news and asked to greet him, nuclear propulsion development leaders at CCRC, Dr. Chelso Kang. The boy was already in the studio. The main character answered that the former leader. The presenter said, that Dr. Kong is an expert on space-related matters. He is here to share fascinating facts with them. She asked if he wanted to tell them about a secret alien race classified by the CCIR. The main character answered that yes to the alien race, but no to the race. He's here to talk about Rama, about an asteroid that is heading towards the Earth. The woman immediately grabbed her face with her hands, thinking that he was flying to the ground. 
and I asked if he meant that there was a possibility that this asteroid would crash into them. Kong immediately agreed with her. She said that, as he had said earlier, he was the head of nuclear engine development at the ICCR, and he was an expert only in engines. The presenter said that she did not know that asteroids were somehow connected with engines, and I asked if he had evidence that the asteroid was moving towards the Earth. The main character replied that she was wrong. He is an expert in the field of astronomy, but can still predict the phenomenon from raw data. Oymyamya was the first interstellar object discovered in the solar system. As they all already know, its unusual structure allowed it to function as a solar sail. As a result, Oymyamya exhibited non-gravitational acceleration as it moved away from the sun, and he left the solar system along a trajectory that did not at all coincide with their assumptions. Plus, the possibility of the asteroid accelerating through evaporation, like the moments they observed sublimating as it got closer to the sun. A man asked Dr. Kang for forgiveness, and he said that as he said, the asteroid functioned like a solar sail. Shouldn't it slow down as it gets closer to the sun, not speed up? He is afraid that he does not understand his train of thought. The main character began to explain that the Rama surface is quite unusual. In addition, the combination of the asteroid's rotation and gravitational anomalies will gradually accelerate it. The man replied that he did not think that they now possessed optical instruments that could give them an understanding of the overall picture of something so distant. Kong thought that if he told them that he saw the future, they definitely wouldn't believe him. The man said that he was conditionally right, and he suggested if he could provide them with calculations that substantiate his statements. After all, he wants to believe him. Well, if there are no calculations, then it turns out that it is based on a single precedent. And he asked me to give them an example. The main character said that as far as he knows, Rama has no precedence. When the interview ended, they shook his hand and said it was a good job. The guys from the film crew thanked the boy for coming. The presenter asked her guys if they were sure that Kong worked at the ITKR. After all, what he said was a little wild. They thought that this would definitely cause a stir and that he should write novels and not be a scientist. That's how no one believed the main character. He, in turn, got behind the wheel of the car. The boy thought about the events taking place all the way. Then his phone rang in the passenger seat, and I thought that it must be Smilov again. But Dr. Odeli called him. He stopped the car, and then several guys approached him. They explained that they wanted to talk to him, namely Dr. Smilov. They handed the phone to Kong. He began to say that he knew that the boy was crazy, but not to the same extent. He continues to go around and aggravate what he has done with his article. The man exclaimed that he had gone too far. The ICR will not ignore this. The main character said that Rama is changing course, and he asked to keep an eye on him. It's not too late to start preparing countermeasures. If they start, they will still have hope. Well... Let them not think that they will stop the asteroid with nuclear bombs. It just won't work. The boy explained that the only way is through the motor system. Smilov exclaimed whether he was in his right mind. Kang continued to explain if the focus was on developing the propulsion system and how to land them on the surface of the asteroid. Then they can take him off the ground. In this case, Rama will change course after unexpected acceleration. Smilov said that he was already tired of this nonsense, and he added that, in any case, the ICCR will have a case against him. Kang exclaimed that he could confuse this with miscalculations. Well, this is not a mistake, so I advised them to keep a close eye on him. Smilov asked him not to say that he had not warned. Reviewing the news once again on Google, Smilov wondered how he knew that the asteroid was changing direction. Immediately, the man stopped the news because someone knocked on his door. He was surprised that this man came again, and he began to warn him that it would be hard for him if he came to say nonsense. For example, about the fact that the asteroid behaves unexpectedly or something similar. The man, going into the office, replied that unfortunately it was so. It was Director Klasky. Smilov jumped up when he saw the director behind that man. Klasky in turn stopped him and said that they had finished calculating the trajectory of Rama and he explained that he was heading towards the ground. This was unexpected news for Smilov. Meanwhile, some guy came into the office and said hello to everyone. He explained that his name was Chelso Kang. He is the new leader of the asteroid defense team. 
and he said that he was looking forward to when they would start working again. Meanwhile, the live news broadcast began. The presenter said that it was located right in front of the St. Tusville Space Center. The CCIR had previously announced that the Atlas P project would be launched at 10 o'clock in the evening, 8 in the morning local time. The project is to send 30 rockets into space and land them on the surface of an asteroid. Using their thrust, the rockets will redirect the asteroid. 10 missiles are already ready to launch, and 20 MKKR as soon as they are ready. The next launch will take place in three weeks, and the last one in six weeks. The presenter on TV said that she was sure that this was an incredible spectacle. But is there any reason why they divided the rockets into three parts? But they didn't send everything at the same time. The other presenter replied that of course there is, all because of the elongated football shape of the asteroid. Each rocket will land due to a special mechanism at different points on the asteroid, until they all ignite and change its trajectory. This was all shown on the monitor tap. The presenter at the other end of the screen said that everything is now clear. Sounds like an effective way. Meanwhile, the countdown begins for Atlas P-01, and now 10 9 8 7 3 2 1. Let's take off. The ignition of the first stage rockets began. The guy said that the goal had been achieved. The first stage engines are stopped and separated, and so the division was successful. We have already started preparing the engines for the second stage. In three, two, one, zero. Here a joyful cry was heard. Someone mentioned the name of Dr. Kang, and he exclaimed that everything worked out. Dr. Odley appeared in the office. Looking at the main character, she exclaimed that they successfully launched all ten missiles. At this time, the main character was talking on the phone. Someone told him on the other side of the tube that there was a problem in rocket number 13, in the second stage, and he explained that there was definitely a problem there. It seems the same thing happened with the L3 or T1 shutters. They asked to replace them urgently. The main character said that they just said that he worries about little things. They've gone crazy there. If even one of the missiles explodes in their atmosphere, the nuclear emissions will be enormous. What will they do if this happens? Listening to all this on the phone, the boy could no longer stand the screams and threw the phone. He wondered how these so-called experts were able to get a job here in the first place. How can you take all this more calmly? Taehu just lamented to me. The main character thought about what if Taehu was here. He remembered those words that the guy said about pride. He remembered what Taehu had told him about how their dreams had changed. I think about his words. The boy missed him. But I still decided not to trust anyone anymore. If he doesn't do it himself, he may make a mistake. Dr. Odley came into his office. She waited for the boy to finish talking on the phone. Kong asked her what she wanted. The woman began to explain that the launch of all the rockets was quite successful. Looking at his watch, the main character replied that everything was just on time. He asked if she wanted anything else, to which the doctor replied that no. Kong exclaimed that this was good work. I started dialing someone on the phone again. He said into the phone that he needed a chief engineer. Three weeks later, Atlas R-10, landing attempt. Watching everything through the monitor screen, they noticed that the landing was successful. Propulsion System 10 is already in place. Someone contacted the main character, telling Dr. Kang that drilling was already starting, noticing that he looked strange. It was Dr. Odelli. She explained that everything was going well. This was the last rocket, and she advised him to go home early to rest. Kong replied that this is not at all necessary. The woman began to explain to the main character that he is the basis of this project. There is no need to let him get sick. Kong told her that even if they lost just one missile, they would not be able to redirect the asteroid. They can't afford to make that mistake. Meanwhile, the Atlas R-10 nuclear installation had already been secured. Dr. Odelli ran up to the main character, hugged him, and exclaimed that everything worked out. Kong thought that they were already halfway there, but they succeeded. After all, if everything is in order with the propulsion system, they can continue. But then, the employee said that there were difficulties with the P-10 Atlas. The altitude control system works intermittently. A problem has been found in the direction of the gravitational force. The gravitational force at the site is higher than they thought. The main character asked the employee if there were other landing places nearby. The man replied that they had not found them yet, but it would not be surprising if they were found. Kong asked if it was possible to measure gravity only in this area. Dr. Odelli replied that it would be difficult. 
They take measurements in orbit, so it will be difficult to focus on just one area. She is not sure that they will be able to detach the P-10 Atlas and install it in another place. He landed in a difficult place, may slip or fall if they touch it, all due to a gravitational anomaly, or because he landed on a hill. The mountains on Rama are steeper than they expected. Here various exclamations began to be heard. The main character exclaimed what was the matter. Will anyone tell him what happened? One of the employees exclaimed that they had lost the P-10 signal. RO-5 and RO-6 also lost their signal. Raise the collapsed Earth. Did they really lose three whole missiles? Then Dr. Odley looked at the main character. The boy fell unconscious. Something happened to him. Apparently this news had such an impact on him. Kang was already in the hospital. Dr. Odelli was next to him. She waited for the boy to regain consciousness, and finally he opened his eyes. He was surprised what Dr. Odelli was doing here. Kang remembered that they had lost three missiles, but they still had those that needed to land. Employees gathered around him. They wondered if it was true. Did everything really fail without a chance of success? Therefore, you should not trust a person who goes on television for fame. Everyone started blaming Dr. Kang. The second man who was nearby asked him to stop. Stop looking for the guilty as it is now pointless. He exclaimed that they would then determine someone's guilt. Now we need to discuss their next steps. The man who was the director announced that the Atlas project had failed. But to be honest, he didn't have high hopes for him. But he is still very sorry. However, they will not declare that the project has failed. Ultimately, public unrest may interfere with their evacuation plan. The main character sat with his head down. He thought about their words about the evacuation plan. The man said that, as they say, you can't hang everything on one nail. Did he really think that they would trust him alone with the fate of humanity? They had been preparing escape plans ever since the threat of the asteroid became apparent. Kong couldn't believe since when did they already have waste plans. When they said they could no longer fund engine testing, was this really because the money went towards the evacuation plan? The director began to ask, since Atlas's plan had failed, whether he could entrust him with the project's evacuation plan. He is confident that with his abilities, the main character will be able to bring the project to fruition. International Space Development Conference. In front of us is the Port David Space Center. The last stage of the project is Noah. The main character was next to Dr. Odely. She asked him why. Why can't he fly with them? The boy explained that he had already said that he was not fit for health. Then Dr. Odelli began to worry very much, and I asked how they could do it without him. The Atlas and Noah project became possible only thanks to him. Kong explained that she would be there. Therefore, he is confident that everyone will do a great job in this matter. The main character looked at the woman and thought that she was upset, and I wondered when was the last time he was upset. Dr. Odelli called the boy a liar, and she said that he didn't trust the others. He never trusts anyone. He always does everything himself. Why is he retreating now? Or he thinks that he is not too good for space. The woman exclaimed that she would not fly then either. Kang asked her to calm down. If she doesn't fly, then who will control the engines in the spacecraft? Odelli said that if it was because the Atlas project failed and he felt guilty, then there was no need. After all, he did everything possible. The Dr. Kong she knew would never let failure stop him. With tears in her eyes, the woman asked why he was giving up. The boy, holding her hand, tried to calm her down and replied that he was not giving up. There are other reasons to stay. Then Dr. Odely calmed down a little and looked at him with interest. She asked why she was the only one who was so sad at this moment. Then someone started calling Dr. Odely on the radio. She was asked to immediately board A-23. After the woman had already been called several times, the main character told her not to worry because they would meet again. They began to say goodbye. The doctor asked when and how they would meet. Is it really in another world after death? The main character told her that it was not what she thought. Well, let's just trust him. He assured her that they would definitely meet. Then holding Dr. Kong's hand, the woman sobbed and asked him to promise something. And closing her eyes, she said that in the future he would trust her and share all the hardships with her. The main character's heart sank when he thought about Dr. Odley. But she is just a memory that he will have to forget about. The boy sat on the floor, opening a jar of juice for the third time, after which he knocked it over again, drinking to his health. And so Kang woke up once again on the bed. There was another month on the calendar again, another date. 
His mother asked him to get up so he wouldn't be late for school. The main character was sitting in class looking out the window. Early detection of an asteroid, or more accurately predicting its course, will not prevent disaster. Not even breakthroughs in engine technology. Then what to do? It's a pity that he doesn't know Rama's location right now. Of course, even if he warns everyone, no one will believe the child. He still has memories of Dr. Odley, who asked him how she could help. What was it all about? The doctor asked in parting that the boy trust her next time and share his time with her. Then Tehu approached the boy. He asked if he was doing any development today, to which Kong asked again as if not understanding him. The friend again asked if he was involved in development. After all, he's been doing this for several months now. Have you really given up? Kong replied something like this. It all became somehow meaningless. There is no point in developing a better engine. Tehu asked what he was talking about. It sounds like he's already thought of something. The main character explained that he just lost interest, that's all. Just like I lost interest in becoming an astronomer. Kang wondered why he was silent. Is it really so obvious that he is lying? Tehu asked how he really stole someone's developments, so he decided to give up everything because he was no longer interested in it. The main character said that he himself decided to become a professional gamer. How then could he steal his developments? What is development anyway? Isn't this the best? The comrade began to ask if he forgot his name, and he reminded that his name is Tehu. I point my finger at myself. He's a technician. Has the main character still not realized that he is a technician? Therefore, he must be the best. Kong asked what this had to do with him. Is he really bothering him? After all, he sits on the sidelines doing nothing. Then Tehu pointed his finger at him and exclaimed that this was indeed so. Doesn't he understand? Kong replied that he did not understand. Then the comrade held his head and said that Kong is sometimes very stupid. Now I have to explain to him. He studies it all so hard that he even doubted whether he could keep up with him, and he asked if Kang understood what this meant. This means that he must be a developer. Kong exclaimed that he is now the developer, but he had to be a developer in this, and that's the whole point. He must be the best in this field. The guy exclaimed that engine development is actually easy. Tehu grabbed his head and said that if someone becomes the best, then he will no longer be able to be him. Kong inquired that the boy said that his dream had changed. Apparently, that's why he doesn't agree to be second anywhere. And so he decided to become a professional gamer, to make sure that he would become the best in this field. Taihu replied that he was beginning to understand. Kong continued that Taihu now says he wants to get back to developing rocket engines. Because he gave up this business and Taihu can become the best again, Kong asked if he understood him correctly. Taihu exclaimed in response that being a professional gamer is cool. Well. Developing a rocket engine is even cooler. Raising his hands up, he exclaimed that now there is not a step back. The main character, clutching his head, replied that he agreed. Let everything be to him. Tehu, smiling, said that it's good that he hasn't signed a contract with anyone yet. Otherwise, there would be a lot of problems. Kong thought that he regretted wasting so much time on this idiot. Then, someone not far from them said that he would return everything to her, as she had promised. Some girl at school asked the other girl to pay off her debt. Yes, in response, she asked for a little more time, and I asked if they were friends. But the girl insisted on her own. She claimed that she had already given her time, had she forgotten? And she asked her not to stand here and say that she would return everything. She asked the girl to quickly repay her debt. The main character was very surprised when he saw this girl. It was Yumi Gong. And here is the first day of the new semester. The teacher thanked Chelso and Taiha, and she asked them to take their seats, after which the already tired teacher asked who was next. I started choosing from the magazine. She called Yumi Gong to the board. The girl came out and stood in front of the class and introduced herself. She voiced her dream, announcing to everyone that she dreams of becoming the richest girl on the planet. She explained that she understands investments, sales, real estate, bonds, whatever they call it. She understands it. She said that she also lends money, about 1.5% per month, 20% per year. If you need money, anyone can turn to her. Well, if they don't pay on time, she'll do whatever it takes to get hers. So she hopes that no one here is going to borrow money and then not pay it back. The woman exclaimed that this was very wonderful and asked if there was anything else she wanted to share with everyone. Yumi replied that she could show an example of a loan statement. 
The teacher said that this is not necessary and she can return to her place. The main character thought that at that moment he remembered everything about Yumi Gong, and these memories were not pleasant ones. There have always been nasty rumors about Yumi Gong, about how she trails behind her debtors, makes them work, or how she sued people who defaulted on their loans. She even forced parents to pay costs and moral damages. If someone still refused to pay her back, she would do everything to ensure that the person had a bad credit history for the rest of their life. Now, when the girls were fighting, the students thought that Semi and Yumi were quarreling again, most likely over money. Everyone was talking about how Semi still hadn't repaid her debt. She better do it quickly. Yumi is too pushy. All these rumors are ridiculous. Kong thought that even if Yumi was so evil, she is still just a schoolgirl. Looking at her, she wouldn't be able to do any of the things that are rumored. The main character is sure that everyone is exaggerating. He watched the girl from the side. Going down the steps, he thought that Tehu is a strange person. He always runs away from duty. But he said that he would help him take his homework to the teacher's office. Their numbers on the list are not even close. Why is he always assigned to be on duty with him? Then the boy heard girls arguing around the corner at school. Semi told Yumi that she would repay her debt and asked why she bothers her all the time. Yumi said that she couldn't wait any longer. She needed to pay the bills. Doesn't she remember what she said a month ago? She said that if she had lent her a little more money, she would have paid it all back the next month. The main character standing around the corner thought that the teacher's office was right there, but the corridor was occupied by girls. Even if he goes to the stairs from the other side, he can still bump into them. It won't be very good. So he decided to just wait. The girl screamed, which she made clear. She said it was the last chance. Does she look like a weakling just because she lent her money every time she asked? So she is not a weakling and was watching her, to understand what kind of person she really is. Semi replied that she treated her normally all this time, and this is all her gratitude for this. The girl said that she seemed to be mistaken about her. The boys who were nearby said that they were constantly quarreling and that was enough for them. Semi started crying and saying that Yumi was very rude. Has she ever considered her a friend? Semi squatted down and began to cry. She really thought that she and Yumi were quite close. She said that she would return everything to her. Yumi replied that friends should keep their word, especially those related to money. She asked her to stop squeezing out tears and return her money. And this is her last warning. Semi, wiping her tears, asked why this was the last warning. She's going to call her mom. Then Yumi, getting ready to leave, replied that she would simply sue her. Semi immediately jumped up and exclaimed how she could do this to her. Yumi replied that she had given her enough time to repay the debt. Well, since she refuses to admit her guilt, then she has no other choice. Semi asked if she was serious now. Yumi said that to be honest, at first she thought about calling her parents, but then she decided that it was better not to. Looking at her, it becomes clear where this attitude comes from. So, instead of dealing with her parents as well, it's easier to just sue her. Semi immediately began shouting at her indignantly and calling her names. She exclaimed that the girl had insulted her parents. Yumi said that if she doesn't want to hear this, then let her behave appropriately. Then Semi raised her hand above the girl's head. She wanted to hit her with a swing. Yumi calmly said that if she wants to hit her, then let him hit her. But in this case, let her be ready to pay for it. She will report that she is fighting and will make sure that she is punished or reprimanded. Then the girl screamed that she would give her this damn money and asked if she was satisfied. Semi turned to her classmates and asked if they had money. After which, the girl threw a whole wad of money directly onto the floor of the corridor. Semi looked at Yumi and asked her not to even think that they would ever hang out with her again. After everyone had left, Yumi calmly began collecting money from the floor. Raising them, she saw Kang. The boy asked why she wasn't trying to be gentler. This only makes her life more difficult. Yumi asked what was wrong with him, to which the main character replied that of course it was none of his business, but it was very sad to watch her. Then Yumi replied that she just does it her way. Does he really think that it's not sad to watch him? He is always in books and doesn't even talk to others. He has no friends other than Taihu. She asked if he was even a friend to him. Then she apologized and said that she would rather take advice from someone who has better social skills. The main character began to remember the events that happened to him before. And looking after Yumi, he wondered who it was. However, such an attitude will not lead to any good, the boy thought, looking after his classmate. And then, the next day. 
Before us is the door to the main character's class. There, the girl Semi was already crying with all her might. Yumi called Semi's parents yesterday and threatened them to pay back the debt. That is, she knew that she wanted to get her money back, so why involve her parents in this? Minnie and Yunmin and everyone else heard. They said Semi was crying and apologizing. Semi said that she would repay the debt, but Yumi continued to threaten to call her parents. Semi, sobbing, exclaimed that it was her fault. There was no need to take money from her. Now her parents have been dragged into this too. In any case, Yumi went too far. The girls told Semi that if she did not return her money, then Yumi would definitely not consider her a person. Little did they know, apparently Yumi was the same in elementary school. One of the students said that he heard that she forced people to work for her if they did not pay off their debts. Someone replied that she even raised the interest rate. How can you treat people like this? Yumi looked at the girl contemptuously as she left the class. Her classmates thought how dare she even look like that when she was so guilty. The rumors are true. She left because she felt guilty. They also pretend to be cool. The main character was lying with his head in his hands. He had an idea. Kong approached Yumi and said that he wanted to offer a solution to her problems. She asked why he did this. Kang thought that maybe because in a past life he also suffered from rumors, but he can't explain it to her. And he answered that it was because he couldn't concentrate on his studies when there was such an atmosphere in the class. The girl looked at him very surprised. She didn't expect to hear such an answer. Yumi began to laugh until she cried. The boy thought that she was like a different person when she laughed. After she had laughed enough, the girl asked what the solution was. A little time passed and Kong approached Yumi. She was sitting at her desk. He asked in front of all the students if she gave loans. The girl turned and answered him positively, and she asked if the dear client needed money. The main character replied that he needed two dollars. He wants to go to an internet cafe after school, but he forgot his wallet at home. Tomorrow he will give them to her. The boy asked if she lends such small amounts. She said that the girl answered that of course she does, minimum one dollar. Then she handed him the list and said that the interest rate was only one and a half percent per month. I saw him sign a paper. He told Yumi about this in the corridor, that tomorrow he will borrow some money from her in front of everyone. That day the girl asked why, to which he explained that then they would see other Odnoklasniki that he had borrowed money from her. She handed him the money, thanking him for his cooperation, and she said that she would look forward to new meetings. Everyone in the class began to look at her in surprise. Lounging on her chair, she exclaimed that she had another client after which she supposedly went to the toilet. And Semi asked Kong why he took the money from her, because the girl is dangerous. They asked him if he had heard rumors about her. When the boy asked which ones exactly, classmates responded that Yumi was very bad. When the boy asked how bad it was, one of the girls said that she heard that Yumi communicates with bad people, and then he tells them to collect debts from those who do not pay on time. Semi said that she heard that they even take clothes and things as payment for debts. That's why she can lend so much money at once. The main character asked if they were saying exactly what they were saying. The girls answered that it was absolutely true. Semi said that they warned him because they were worried about him. Then the boy asked if everything would be fine if he gave the money on time. Semi looked up at him in surprise. He asked if he would have problems if he repaid this debt on time. Semi replied that she wouldn't, but something was wrong with her, didn't he think so? And he gets involved with such a person. Kong said that if the rumors are true, then yes. But did they themselves see that Yumi was communicating with bad people? Semi exclaimed that she herself had not seen it herself. But Semi's friend from elementary school saw it. A friend told her this. The main character, looking at the girl, asked if in this case she could tell what kind of friend she was. Semi closed her eyes and began to smile and replied that she did not know her name. And I thought, why was he asking about this? The girl asked why he was protecting Yumi. Kang explained that he is not defending. It's just all strange, that's all. The other boy said that he also heard all sorts of things about Yumi. Well, that's different from what they're saying now. He was immediately asked what exactly he heard. Kong told Yumi a day ago that if they spread gossip about her, he will do it on purpose too. Kang said in front of everyone that he heard how strict she was, sometimes even too strict. But she always keeps her word. She never cheats about money. So you can sleep peacefully when you borrow from her. You don't have to worry about it at all. Money aside, she's a very good friend. She never broke the law. Kong told her yesterday that it would be pretty good gossip.
Semi immediately exclaimed that it couldn't be, and she asked with curiosity where he heard this. Kong replied that he did not remember. Semi immediately asked if he really thought that they would believe him if he didn't even remember where he heard about it. The main character told Yumi yesterday that if I continue the conversation in this direction, it will make many holes in the history of Seven. And then he points to them. Then Yumi flew into the classroom and asked why then should anyone believe the words of Semi. She exclaimed that she heard what the girl was talking about. She said that Chelso couldn't be trusted because he didn't remember who he heard it from. And she, in turn, remembers the name of her friend from elementary school who told her all this about her. If she remembers, then let him bring her here. If she believes rumors that she doesn't remember who she heard from. And she asked Semi if she would then believe the rumor from her classmate Chelso. Then one of the classmates said that they had never seen Yumi do something like that. They only heard gossip about her. A classmate began to remember from whom he heard this gossip, and then I remembered that it was from Semi. Just think, the second classmate also heard this gossip from her. Semi exclaimed that she had personally experienced this. She saw everything personally, and she started pointing her finger at the girl. She asked if they all heard how Yumi spoke badly about her parents. Classmates confirmed that they heard it. The girl again began to point her finger at her and say that it was all true. She really insulted her parents. Semi asked if she had anything to say to this. Yumi replied that she was indeed abusive and she does not deny it. But Yun Semi spreads false rumors about her. Did they really not even notice? And she asked Minnie if she had ever been ashamed that there were rumors about her that she cheated. Minhee also wanted to justify herself when a rumor spread about her that she bought sneakers with money that was left for the needs of the class. She thinks so. The girl made a lot of efforts to clear her name after this. She spread all these rumors. Semi immediately grimaced and asked who said it. Is she really saying that she was the one spreading the rumors? The girl exclaimed that she had no evidence. Minhee said what she heard. Semi herself personally said that young Minnie cheated. She told her about this personally. The boy standing next to him said that he did too. He heard the rumor about sneakers from her. Now the girl froze in the fact that she was exposed. Semi immediately exclaimed that it was true that Gong Yumi had insulted her parents. Even if she started rumors behind their backs, it doesn't change the fact that she insulted her parents. Semi exclaimed again that Gong Yumi is a bad person, the most terrible person, and they agreed with that. Yumi asked why they were suddenly behaving this way, and approaching Semi, she said that she had gone too far and was impatient. The girl closed her eyes and said that even if so, if she in turn had repaid her debt on time, this would not have happened. It doesn't matter how many days have passed since the day she promised to repay the debt. Even if she acted like that, she shouldn't have said that to her. After which Yumi asked her for forgiveness. In class they began to say that Semi did not give the money on time. They are also spreading rumors and trying to completely bury Yumi. She is the abuser, and she is the bad one. The class was now saying that they knew that Semi was actually bad. A classmate asked if it was true that she insulted her parents. The girl reassured Yumi and said that she did not believe her. And after the school day, the main character was sitting at the bus stop. Yumi approached him with two jars of juice. She handed one of the jars to Kong, and she said that this was a small gift from her to him. After all, thanks to him, everything became good again. Kong exclaimed that he didn't expect her to buy him anything. Yumi said that she knows how to express gratitude with gifts. The main character thought about it and asked where he could have seen her before. Apparently, he confused Yumi with someone in his memory. It was as if he had misunderstood her all this time. How many people had he misunderstood in his past life? He couldn't think of saving the earth, but instead of losing his goal, he saw a friend in need, and I was able to help him unlike in my previous life. Although he did not save the earth, he was able to help his neighbor. And so the main character opened the jar and thanked the girl for the drink. They both raised the jars and clinked their glasses and began to drink. Kang lowered the jar down and looked at the girl and asked why she suddenly intervened. Yumi replied that she thought that if he stood up for her, it would sound like an excuse. Didn't he promise to do it himself like an exemplary student? He defended her found a counterbalance to Yun Simi's arguments. The girl explained while drinking the drink. Like the bad rumors about Gong Yumi are misunderstandings. He thinks they would understand. Does he think that he has such a great influence on his classmates? He has the image of a diligent student. From the outside, it seems that, yes. But Yumi said that he still remains an outsider. He is only friends with Kim Taihu. 
Every day he has this expression on his face as if he is going to die. He has no social skills. He really is an outsider. To solve the problem completely, it would be better for him to come out and reveal that Sammy is spreading rumors. Yumi said that she and Sammy were close. It is not surprising that she knows that she can behave like this. She said this because if he said it, it would sound unnatural. And when he appeared on the roof, he said that he had a solution. It was a little stupid. The girl, spreading her arms, said that this was why she wanted to surprise him. Kong thought that Yumi was more capable in matters of relationships, especially capable of him in his fourth life. He can believe that he understood this after her advice. Yumi continued to say that the fact that he is a boy and protects a girl can play such a way that the words do not reach his classmates. They might think he is. Well, the girl didn't finish and hit him with her elbow. Kong asked something. She is fighting. To which Yumi interjectedly replied that he deserved it. The main character asked why and what he did wrong. Yumi exclaimed that because he looks at her as if she was exaggerating. And I asked what exactly she was exaggerating. Kong explained that she gets that impression when she lends money. She draws up receipts herself, makes sure there are fingerprints everywhere, and so on. Yumi exclaimed that this was a thorough procedure and not an exaggeration. And in everyday life, it is completely different. She only behaves like this when she lends money. The girl said that if she wants to borrow, she will give it. And she asked what happened to those two dollars. After all, even they need to be given away. The main character asked if she would ask him to return her money, to which Yumi replied that of course she would ask. And about the excuse about the internet cafe. This is so strange, given his image as a diligent student. It was necessary to come up with something more believable. Kong thought that in his fourth life, he still needed to find a way to save the Earth. More precisely, he hasn't tried yet. However, this time he helped Yumi and gained strength. Now he again began to think about how to save the Earth. And he came to the conclusion that with current technologies, they will not be able to prevent a collision with an asteroid. Maybe we need to build a shelter on the moon. The CCIR has paid attention to this area of development. This is the starting point for exploring deep space, a source of rare resources, and a site for their processing in low gravity to produce special alloys. Well, until now, this has not been developed, because the question was whether it was really more economical. In the meantime, if he presents a plan, then building a base on the moon will become a reality. Technological developments can be complex. The boy wondered if a person could stay on the moon for a long time. Gravity on the moon is six times lower than on Earth. He imagined himself born on Earth and imagined himself born on the moon. Studies have been conducted that low gravity entails a decrease in pressure on bones and muscles. He imagined himself ten years later. Can children grow up normally on the moon? Too high due to low gravity. Complications due to long-term hypertrophy. As a result, the destruction of muscles that will not keep up with the growth of bones and also fractures due to the fragility of bones, taking into account gravity, and so on. Can a person live on the moon for a long time without problems? So we need to figure out how to create a shelter in outer space, maybe just create a shelter project that he created in a past life. After thinking, the main character thought that after all, no, it will be difficult to build a shelter that would suit him. Even if he proposes to build a shelter in advance, the ICCR Council will consider this a waste of money. The main character thought for a long time and then realized that he needed to act separately. Since the IKR has no choice but to obey, even though the leadership means they will build in space using private capital, then it can act freely. Then the issue of the assembly period will be completely resolved. Maybe he can build a residence in space. This is possible because the residence will be built using modern technologies, a structure that can be created if you have enough money. The main character thought how much it would cost. Perhaps a trillion one, although most likely much more. Maybe ten trillion. I listed different amounts, but the boy settled on a trillion dollars. This is how much it will cost to build a space residence of type Irish one at the Lagrangian point L5, which can accommodate 10,000 people. The main character, while calculating everything on the computer, thought about where to get so much money from. The next day, the students were doing general cleaning. Kong suddenly approached his comrade Taihu. He asked if he could ask him something. Taihu asked a counter question whether he wanted to ask about technology. Kong thought that he had very little contact with Taihu. And now you need to get closer to him. 
He said that let's say he wants to build a space residence, and I asked how best to do this. Tehu was very surprised why this happened all of a sudden, and he asked if he wanted to create a development this time. He noticed that the main character often changes industries. He asked what if Kang changed the industry if they said they don't sell residential developments. Kong replied to his friend that there would be no more changes, only if something special happens. Taehu exclaimed that it means the main character can change everything again and again. He called him behind him. When they approached the table, Taehu took a pen and opened the notebook. He asked what size his shelter would be. After which I drew Bishop's ring. Nearby I drew a McKendry cylinder, but the boy replied that it was much less. The comrade exclaimed that in reality it is impossible to create such large shelters. But the main character said that with all the world's forces, it would take hundreds of years to create something like this. He will be satisfied if it can accommodate about 10,000 people, although I would like more. Taehu said that it is better to start gradually than to start big at once. Chelso explained what he thinks about the island Type 1, or something like Kalpana. Taehu noticed that he draws poorly. It looks like he drew bread. Kong said that at first, he thought it would be an improved version of Island 1. His friend asked him why. After all, Kalpana looks quite fresh. The main character in turn noticed that Taehu draws very well. Taehu began to explain that it was designed for future generations, so it probably compensated for the shortcomings of previous ones. Kong replied that he didn't know about it, but it didn't fit because of the weight. And he immediately crossed it out. Taehu asked what he meant. Kong explained that Island alone weighs 500,000 tons, and Kalpana is 7 million tons. If he has to choose, of course he will choose what is easier because it's cheaper. Well, if he had already decided on the type of residence, then what did he want to discuss? Comrade Tehu asked him. I listened carefully to what he says in response. The main character replied that he wanted to discuss the issue of price, based on the cost estimate of whoever invented Island alone. If you look at things realistically, taking into account the current times, then it will cost about a trillion dollars. He wanted to discuss with his friend how to solve this problem. Taehu exclaimed that he thought he had some kind of problem with the development. Why does he consult with him about money? Taehu started picking his nose. Kong, meanwhile, answered him that he thought the problem was technical, and he was asking him about the money. But he has no one else to share his thoughts with except Taehu. It's useless. Even if it is Kim Taehu, he is his last hope. Because developments and prices are interconnected. How many things were developed? But nothing went beyond the idea because of money. Electric car. Electric car technology was developed before gasoline cars, but was not widely used due to the cost of production. Bulb. The first production of the light bulb was not commercial due to the generation of large amounts of heat and short lifespan. Only after a while did Edison turn it into a source of income. Underwater vehicle. It was designed to carry passengers across the Atlantic Ocean and moved at a speed of about 160 kilometers per hour. But due to increased fuel prices and the need to replace parts along the way, there was little use. Taihu, still picking his nose, asked what his plan was for building a space shelter. The main character exclaimed that his plan was to conquer the moon. I am basing this on the materials received there. Build a colony at the Lagrange Point L5 between the Earth and the Moon. I would like to know if there are ways to somehow save money or earn them. Taehu said that he also doesn't know how to earn so much. Kong exclaimed that the biggest costs would be labor and relocation. Taehu asked what if we use artificial intelligence. In this case, there will be no need to hire people. If it is possible to replace people with artificial intelligence, otherwise the workers will have to pay wages. Pay for space to host. Well, if you can save money on transportation that needs to be delivered to workers on the moon, then you can save a lot of money. Tehu said that it would be very expensive to transport materials for the exploration of the moon if you create a technology that can reduce transportation costs. In this case, it will be cheaper to send goods from the ground than to produce and purchase materials for a base on the moon directly. Of course, rockets are not the answer because transportation by rockets will be more expensive than building a base on the moon, costs $10,000 per kilogram. Meanwhile, the students who were cleaning began to play pushing each other. They stuck out their tongues and just went wild. So the mops started flying out the window. Tehu, looking at this, suggested using a space cannon. 
After all, a space gun is a huge gun that sends materials into space. It is based on a very simple reaction principle. Its structure is also a historical concept and has been considered since the times when humanity only dreamed of space travel. Why isn't it being used now? Because it has a big disadvantage compared to rockets. The space gun collects speed with initial acceleration. This means that at the very beginning, the acceleration will be very high. Therefore, people cannot travel in a space gun. However, a space gun can compete with rockets in terms of price. If the launch is successful, delivery from the ground will cost about 30 per kilogram. However, you can't put people or anything in there that might break. Well, if you focus on the fact of how everything is sent into space, then a space gun isn't a bad idea. The main character, looking out the window, asked why he didn't think about it. If a space cannon shot delivers supplies directly to a space shelter construction site, the cost will be much lower than transporting them to a lunar base. The production time will be less than mass engines or orbital elevators because the operating principle of a space gun is quite simple. They looked out the window at that mop that landed right in the dense green bushes. He probably didn't think about the space gun because he only thought about rockets and delivery to the moon. Kong exclaimed that it was necessary to develop a plan to build a space shelter using artificial intelligence and a space gun. He thanked his comrade. Tehu replied proudly that there was no problem. After all, he is a technique. The teacher ran up to them and asked if everything was okay with them. They noticed that the main character's face was scratched. And they asked what happened to him. Tehu said that he was fine. Only Chelsaw got hurt. The teacher asked if someone could take him to the first aid station. The main character said that he could go alone. But then Yumi came up and said that she could go with him. The teacher quickly herded the children into the classroom. She asked if they were in their right mind to play in the corridor. Meanwhile, Yumi and the main character have already approached the first aid station. They called the nurse but noticed that she was not there. The girl looked inside the office. She saw a lot of medicine there. Yumi noticed that it wasn't too deep early, and she suggested that the boy simply treat it and cover it with a Band-Aid. Kong said that he could do it himself, but the girl exclaimed that she would do it. She said that the window was broken and she had to step aside, and he, in turn, stood still. Kong explained that they were talking to Taihu, and he was very focused. Yumi asked what they were talking about. Kong replied that it was about money. He discussed with him how to solve the money problem. Yumi said that you should have asked her about the money. Why is he looking for money where he doesn't need it? And I asked how much money he needed. The boy replied that he needed about one trillion dollars. She immediately exclaimed why he needed such a large sum. After all, before that, he asked to borrow 2001. Explanation of the Chelsea Space Shelter Development Plan. She explained that she had her own business plan, but his plan is simply incredible. Kong replied that even if this problem is solved, he does not know what to do with the money for research. Where can I get this money for research? Yumi asked if he had to earn them. Kong replied yes, especially considering that there is little investment in research. He's not sure about robotic automation research or who would fund a space gun or a space shelter. Gerald Bull, who tried to build a space gun. The main character continued to film his thoughts here. After all, he couldn't find investors, so he worked under a dictator. Meanwhile, Yumi was already putting a bandage on Kang's cheek. Here the girl thought a little and then raising her finger up, asked how much money he needed, and she asked if he needed a trillion. Yumi began to write something on a piece of paper. She asked if he wanted to be like Gerald Bull and work under a dictator, after which she handed this paper to Kang. His eyes became like those of an owl. And here we are 20 years later. Space Development Center, Laboratory for the Development of Space Guns. The installation of the test instance is complete. The vacuum level has been checked and everything is clean. The command was given for everyone to retreat. It's very dangerous to be around. They built it themselves, it's so huge. The guy said that honestly, when he first heard that they would need to build a space gun, he thought it was crazy. The second guy replied that he also thought that Kang Chelso was crazy. Do they have any idea if the gun will work? Then the universe will be just a stone's throw away. This will be the beginning of a greatest era. And after discussing what was happening, they finally decided to take the next step. The girl at the computer said that the hydrogen charging was completed. She begins the second contraction. The girl exclaimed that they were waiting for permission to ignite the piston. Everyone looked at the main character.
Kong gave the command to begin, and then the woman exclaimed that she was counting to three and they would light up, after which the countdown began. And here are three, two, one, fire. The piston is lit. The pressure of the compressed gas increases. 4,400 atmospheres, 4,600 atmospheres. The guy exclaimed that something seemed wrong. They reached the target number. The first launch begins. Everything around seemed to have turned upside down and gone in a circle. There was a strong explosion and the main character fell to the floor, losing his glasses. All the employees were lying around the office. Kang said that it was good that there were no casualties. Yumi said that it turns out that space guns are more dangerous than she thought. Kong agreed with her. Essentially, this system transfers all its energy into the projectile. As a result, the rocket fell to the ground and exploded. The girl asked what could be the cause of the accident, to which the main character replied that he doesn't know yet. Everything is in a similar state, so it will take time to find out everything and draw the right conclusions. The girl asked if this would happen again. After all, if this happens often, then it will not be possible to say that the space gun saves money. Kong told her that he didn't think something like this would happen again. The reason is not really the project. He thinks, given the scale of the explosion, he has some guesses about this. The main character began to explain that they carry out an explosion behind the piston, burning gas. And he asked if they understood what he was talking about. The girl replied that she understood. She said that after an instant compression of the gas. Here she paused a little and clenched her fists. After compressing the gas and then instantly expanding, the piston in the system moves. The girl did not unclench her fists. She said the problem was in the compression process. Kong explained that there was a crack in the piston. Or he damages the environment. This leads to the device exploding due to the combustion of compressed gas. The girl asked whether it all happened just like that, or whether there had been some problems before. The main character replied that some parts were still faulty. Recently, various types of projectiles were launched. He thinks that the parts are already pretty worn out. The boy picked up some paper from the floor. At this time, the girl asked if he had checked it. He explained that they were checking. In addition, there are standards according to which parts need to be changed after several starts. For example, the gun needs to be changed after several shots and the piston too. Then why did the accident happen? He thought that fast charging would reduce the life of parts. In addition, there are standards according to which parts need to be changed after several starts. For example, the gun needs to be changed after several shots and the piston too. Then why did the accident happen? He thought that fast charging would reduce the life of the engine. The girl asked if this was due to a mistake. Kong agreed with her and said that now he can only assume this. The girl asked if he could prevent this from happening again, to which the boy replied that he could. Then, turning around, she headed towards the exit and agreed with the boy. She said that, in this case, they would continue. He was surprised that she was already leaving. Yumi answered the main character that she was leaving because she needed to earn money. She explained that she needed to work hard to finance the new laboratory. She was always only interested in money. Waving her hand, she asked him not to thank him, and she said that they would pay off later. Yumi asked the boy to be more careful. After this, the building was rebuilt. The second space gun no longer had the same disadvantages as the previous one. The test resumed. Based on the first failure, the main character tried many things. After several tests, countless bullets turned into burnt cartridges, and finally, experimental projectile number NA-257, he reached a height of 500 kilometers. It was an incredible success for the main character. Everyone shouted that they had finally succeeded. They will go down in the history of space developments. One of the employees immediately shed tears. The employee began to calm her down and asked what he was saying. He said that if they listen to Dr. Kong, everything will work out. Another guy raised his hands up and looked out from behind the computer and asked if it was a good thing they didn't leave then. Another guy exclaimed that he simply could not believe that he was seeing something that he could only read about in a book. He simply touched. Here the main character addressed the guys. He thanked everyone for their work. And he said that firstly, you need to make sure that the UCS received the projectile. Now humanity has another way to get into space besides rockets. And all this is thanks to them. One of the collaborations asked how it was thanks to them. The guy standing next to him exclaimed that it was all thanks to Dr. Kang. 
The girl with a microphone on her lips thanked the main character for his efforts, for not giving up and moving forward. One of the employees asked if there would be any rewards for a successful launch. The second one asked if they were entitled to vacation. The third replied that they cannot go on vacation because there is a lot of work. Kong said that they did a great job. He cannot believe that it is possible to send a man into space using a space gun. The boy again mentally thanked all his employees. Sitting at the computer, he thought, what about the projectile? A guy looked at him in front of the screen and replied that about this, he thinks they need to improve it. Then everything began to fly around them. Things that were in the room flew off the box. The main character said that it seems that this will not increase the accuracy of the equipment. The guy on the monitor agreed with him, and he said that this was too much even for something like food supplies. He thinks he needs to work on it. For now, it is possible to raise the human mass, and this is the maximum that they can do. The boy agreed with him and turned off the computer. Yumi appeared then. She entered the office with a bag of sandwiches. She said that she heard that the Ukrainians received a shell. Now all his hard work has paid off. She had a bag of sandwiches in her hands. She brought them to the boy. She said that she bought it from a cute wrapper on which it was written, Sandwich, and a funny smiley was drawn. Yumi explained that she now receives interest on the debt. Now she will have more money. Her efforts are slowly being rewarded. Kong must be very tired of eating in the laboratory all the time. Is she thinking correctly? On a day like this, you only need to eat steak. And so all the time, one of them is busy. Still, she asked for space on the weekend. They should still celebrate it. After which, the girl approached the main character, who was sitting at his desk in front of the computer, and asked him to eat. The guy replied that it sounded pretty cool. She asked what happened to his facial expression. Kong asked how she understood this, to which the girl replied that it would be strange not to understand. After all, it's all written all over his face. Then the boy lowered his head and smiled and said that it wasn't that anything had happened. There was just a small problem. And holding his chin with his hand, he said that it was still a big problem, which is associated with the construction of a shelter. This will all be very difficult. The girl asked in what sense. Will it really be difficult to build a space shelter? She asked him to come and sit down. And I asked why, suddenly. She heard that Kang received information that the UKs had accepted the projectile. Doesn't that mean success? The boy replied that they managed to send the object. But to seriously build a space shelter, you need to raise the projectile even higher. And he asked if she understood. Yumi answered yes. It is necessary to reach the Lagrange point L5 with as little influence as possible from the gravitational field of the Earth to reduce the cost of determining its location during construction and reduce labor costs for space shelter personnel. Kung said that the projectile, however, was damaged even when raised into low orbit, and now there are no solutions to this problem. The girl immediately said that it was impossible now. She wondered if it would be possible if he spent some time improving the space gun. Then the main character looked at the girl with regret and replied that he could not do this. There is very little time left. Yumi asked in what sense there is little time. Did she give him any deadlines? He sent a projectile into space for the first time. It will only be an extra expense if he gives up everything now. The main character told her that no, because it's time to fix everything before the asteroid arrives here. Yumi was surprised which asteroid he was talking about. Then the boy began to remind her that he had told her a long time ago about automation of construction in space, automation with robots. He plans to start working on it. The girl looked at the main character with great surprise. You could always hear something new from him. He explained that, therefore, when the development of a space gun moved forward, he wanted to conduct research. Yumi, looking at him, asked whose money he would use to conduct this very research. Then the main character, looking at the girl intently, said that, of course, her wife. She lowered her head and replied that she would give it to him because she was an idiot. Kang said that since there is not much time, so the only thing he can do is to develop a space shelter and get support from the CCIR. First, he wants to conduct research into automated robots to attract the attention of the Space Research Council. It can be used in many areas, and he finds it interesting. He will build trust with them through cooperation, and then he will say that he needs a space refuge. To do this, they need to develop a plan. The girl was already devouring the sandwich by both cheeks. Apparently, she ate when she was nervous. She asked the boy if he was hiding something from her. 
The main character looked closely at the girl and then released his eyes. He said that he could not deny it, but he understands that he cannot tell her this. Yumi asked if he was sure that he wanted to stop developing the space gun. Well, the boy replied that he was sure. Now it's pointless to move on. The girl lowered her eyes and said that this was no longer according to plan. Well, let it be as he says. He thanked her. Yumi said that she really didn't want to repeat the story of Gerald Bull in the 21st century. Well, what can she do? She was the one who lent him money 20 years ago. And sitting in the chair of humor, she threw off her hands. She exclaimed that she was not a dictator. She said that she would be him. Well, it even sounds funny. The main character again asked her for forgiveness. Yumi said that it was a matter of trust. She trusts him enough to simply go along with his plan, which basically goes nowhere. She hopes that one day he will reveal his secrets to her. The boy lowered his head and listened carefully to what the girl was saying. He thought about what Yumi could tell about the asteroid. After all, an asteroid will soon destroy the Earth, and somehow he survives and starts life again. Looking at the girl, he wondered if she would believe him. The girl answered the phone and asked why the person was silent if he called. She asked how he could increase funding, and then she laughed. The girl talking on the phone asked the person not to worry, and then looking at the main character, she said that she would sell him. The boy looked at the girl with very surprised eyes. He said that it seemed the price was not what she thought. Yumi replied that he was absolutely right. Kong Chelso is much cheaper than she thought. Then she bit her lip and closed her eyes and exclaimed that it was probably because the body itself was not for sale. Yumi quickly sold the space gun development laboratory. Luckily, there were many interested buyers. After people saw the results of sending a projectile to the UX, they wanted to somehow make money from it. Yumi sold all her laboratories and personal research and development in one fell swoop. All this is thanks to the girl's hard work, so her comparison with the sale of the main character was correct. There were losses due to the haste. If there was more time, she would have received more. She asked why there was a rush, and I drove an expensive car straight to a nice new office. The main character seeing her off called the girl. Then he thanked me, saying thank you for your trust. The girl, sitting in the car, looked at the boy and asked him to forget about it just so that this time he remembers to pay her. The boy, looking after the car as it drove away, thought that he simply did not have the opportunity to forget about his debt. Automate construction in space. The task turned out to be more difficult than he thought. Development of a system for determining location in space. Development of position control technology without environmental support. Development of sensors and systems for determining materials. Development of systems to protect internal systems and components from charged particles emitted from time to time by the sun. Development of technology to increase the service life of spare parts in space. In case of failure, they will develop equipment for quick repairs and much more interesting things. A lot of problems needed to be solved. Success in launching a space gun does not mean success in other areas. It seems to me that he was often despised in this area. The employees were talking among themselves. A fully automated system that doesn't even exist on Earth yet, the guy couldn't believe that he wanted to do this in outer space. He said that everything has some limitations. And he continued to say that he should have finished developing the space gun. Why did he suddenly jump from this area to another? He thought that if he succeeded there, then he could easily succeed here too. He will have to try hard to find a solution to an unsolvable problem. After all, how much time has passed? While the employees were discussing their boss, Yumi approached them and heard their conversation. They didn't expect to see her and immediately jumped up to say hello. They asked what she was doing here. Well, the girl asked if she had come where she shouldn't have, and she said that she was very sorry to hear this from them. Then she laughed and said that she came to see them. They work so hard. Do they really think that she won't come to support them? After which the girl looked at her watch and asked what time it was already. She said she would talk to Dr. Kang and they could go home. The girl headed further towards the main character's office. She needed to talk to him as soon as possible. She finally got to the boy, and I asked Kang Chelso what was happening with the mood in the team. Does he really not cope with his employees? The boy, standing with his back to her, said her name. The girl said that she understood that he was busy with research, but she asked him to pay attention to the team. Here, the main character turned to the girl when she approached him. Smiling, he said that it seemed they could conduct the first test. 
The boy turned to her and pointed at the monitor with his hand. I asked to see what the most problematic part was. This is the stability of robot arms in space. He thought that if he moved the parts, no matter how he changed the robot, it wouldn't turn out the way he wanted. The girl listened to him carefully with her eyes down. He explained that he thought, why not start over? He explained that he thought he could control the atmosphere in the company. Well, as expected, he can't do much. The relative speed of construction robots 2 and 3 is zero. They secured the position of materials 1 and 2. Section 1. Ordered to begin work. Work begins on Section 1. Position control is completed. The location relative to the material has been established. He moves the robot's arm. The drive is turned on. The goal has been achieved. The error is about 5 micrometers. This is within target. You need to start welding. The plasma welding machine is working. An arc has been confirmed. Welding work begins. Now everything is fine. Just fine. The welding is done. The welding machine returned to its starting position. They succeeded. The main character was confident that they would be able to do, and much more, they would certainly succeed. Of course, who doubts this? Someone laughed and asked if it wasn't just two welded metal plates, to which the boy replied that this was the first test. If they continue to develop this technology, they will be able to build in space. The employee asked if something like this could happen someday, to which the employee replied that she knew that Dr. Kang was developing a space gun. After he had some success, he changed his research field to automated construction robots. Nobody understood what was wrong with him. If he wants to build a space shelter, then that explains everything. The girl exclaimed that Dr. Kong wants to build a space shelter. He's just an incredible person. The employees discussing him could not believe that he was trying to create something they had only read about in books. Then the main character's phone rang. Someone on the other end of the phone asked him to pick up the phone. After all, he knows what will happen if the boy doesn't pick up the phone. Kong had already reached for the phone. Someone on the other end of the phone furiously told him to immediately take the phone in his hand and asked him to be kind. Of course it was Yumi. The main character answered the call and asked what happened. The girl, pressing the phone to her ear, went to the window and told the boy that she had news, or rather, good news and bad news. Standing in front of the window in her office, the girl asked what news he wanted to hear first, bad or good. The good news was that IKR was interested in developing automated construction robots. But maybe they can use robots to repair satellites. One of the people of this ICER center spoke. The ICCR was not interested in building a space shelter. They wanted to use this technology elsewhere. The main character thought about what upsets him, why they contacted him. However, on the one hand, he understands them. They are unaware of the Rama asteroid threat. The CCIR doesn't need a huge space shelter. There is no need to be greedy, the main character thought from the very beginning. You need to focus on making connections. Kong told the man that they could only do it if they didn't have to fix two small parts. It will be possible to do them too if they offer research. But if they use them now, what will their accuracy be? The man asked the boy. The main character exclaimed that they can do everything that a person can do but the movement of robots is a little sharper than that of a person. The man said that this was enough, and with great excitement I asked whether cooperation was possible in this case right now. Something needs to be fixed. Looking at the main character, he said that the boy must have heard about the eyes of the mash. Kong, listening carefully to the man, asked if he meant the telescope located at point L2, to which the man replied that it was so. Not long ago, the space telescope engine that kept it in orbit stopped working correctly. The engine is standing still. The faulty part is so far away that it is difficult to send someone to fix it. But they can't leave her like that, so they contacted him. The man immediately asked if he could fix it with the technology of the protagonist. The boy, after a brief silence, replied that he thought, First you need to look at this problem. After all, it's difficult to understand everything in words. The man exclaimed that it seems Kong knows how to keep his word. This is very good after which the man began to look for some kind of remote control. He couldn't find it for a long time. He searched under the table and in the closet. Kang, looking at him, said that perhaps the remote control was under the TV. The man actually took out the remote control and asked how he knew about it. Kang thought that for some reason this place was familiar to him. In his previous life, he worked for the International Space Development Committee, so it's natural. When the man asked how he knew where the remote control was hidden, 
The boy replied that he usually puts it that way. The man said that all people are alike, after which he turned on a huge monitor in front of him showing the main character a draft plan and what they have at the moment. The boy thought it was like he had a feeling of deja vu. I don't want to feel anymore. Employees sat behind monitor screens. There were three seconds left before reaching the goal. The countdown has begun. Three, two, one, zero. Engine starting. The woman at the control panel with the microphone gave the command to open the robot's arms, after which it was necessary to secure these hands. Everything was done. Robot number three was secured. He clung right to the edge, checking communication with robots one to three. The connection is good. A woman and a man who came to them asked if everything should go well. The main character answered yes, and he asked to trust the skills of his employees. The woman said with a heavy sigh that point L2 is so far from the ground. Everything was put off because of the distance. Her heart almost sank. The next step was to work on the disconnect. Everything was in progress. The man watching this thought that he could not believe it. 30%, 54%, 75%. The man couldn't believe they were so calm, despite the fact that they do such delicate work. Although everything looks very slow, it speeds up the process and eliminates repetition of actions. And this is the biggest problem in space work. He's just incredible. The fuel module disconnection is complete. There was a team to prepare a replacement part. Spare parts alignment confirmed, after which they finally started moving. Start installing the engine. Check the reverse installation of the engines, after which they make a stop. The robot's hand is directed towards the corrected part. They began to turn the object towards the target, and now the installation was completed. Check the connection. The girl said that at the moment the error is 900 nanometers, 800 nanometers, 950 nanometers, 800 nanometers, and the test is over. The employee said that all measurements were carried out with an acceptable error of a nanometer. The main character replied that he understood. This was acceptable and good. He asked employees to stick to the schedule. The guy sitting at the control panel said that the plasma welding machine was working. They will start welding. After which they began to do this work and the soldering was completed. Taihu exclaimed that the propeller had already been replaced, and clenching his fist, he was delighted with Kang Chelso. He called him crazy. He asked to let him develop a robot later, and he said that the boy was simply incredible. Then some woman approached Brigadier Kim and asked him, taking him by the shoulder, what he was doing here. Does he not know that they are busy? The woman exclaimed, taking him by the shoulder, and that she felt embarrassed when she saw other teams here. Taehu began to get out and explained to her that he had not finished watching yet. It was Dr. Audrey. She didn't like anyone new in their enterprise. The guy asked her to let him go quickly. He asked the main character for help. He just wanted to watch. A man standing next to Kong asked if he knew the engine development team. He was very surprised, to which the boy replied that of course he knew him. Dr. Kim Taehu is the head of the engine development team. They were classmates. They reported that the fuel waste had already been collected. Robots one, two, three taken from satellite. The renovation is complete. The team exclaimed that everything went well. The man who came from the other team said that he was very happy. Well, this isn't the end yet. The main character said that there was still an operational test. Need to try it. After which he thanked everyone for their work. The staff also thanked Dr. McDowell for his work. When Kang saw off a man from another team, he told him that, to be honest, Everything went better than he expected. He thinks he underestimated Dr. Kang's abilities. The man extended his hand to the main character and exclaimed that he had excellent technical skills, after which the boy thanked the man by shaking his hand. He asked if the boy could do it again if something like this happened again, if there is something wrong with other parts or some other problems. The main character thought that he would help if possible, after which he decided that he would definitely succeed. Yumi appeared then. She said that you shouldn't leave immediately after finishing work. She was furious, and she exclaimed that she needed to stay and attract attention. She asked the boy to ask for another job, at least ask to be in touch. After all, they need to say a word about him. Then Kong still told the man that it was not so difficult to help him, but he would like to ask him for a favor. Having finally decided, he looked at the man and asked him to put in a good word for him at the ICCR. The boy again lowered his gaze and said that he would help in any situation that he could, but still he asks for one favor. He just needs someone to put in a good word for him at the ICCR. The boy looked up at the man, waiting. 
He in turn shook his hand again. Kang explained that the laboratory needed to be developed. The man replied that this is a private research institute, so he must be worried about the prices of operations. If rumors need to be started, they will find out how good Dr. Kong's technology is. The boy asked whether it was better to be evaluated by his colleagues than to receive recognition from the outside. Thoughtful, the man replied that, and he promised to tell his colleagues. He will tell them that they can contact him if anything happens in space. The man said that he helped him, which means he is simply obliged to help him in return, so he promised that he would try. The main character thought that Dr. McDowell would keep his promise. After the satellite was repaired, the MCCR began to contact it. Development of robots for servicing space stations, requests for the repair of worn-out satellites, sharing of control systems, requests for the development of robots for the Moon, Mars, and so on. Even this time, no one wanted to use robots for the same purposes as he did. But he was well connected to inform the public about how much technology had advanced and that people could trust it. He strengthened his relationship with the International Space Development Committee as he established working relationships with as many people as possible. But then the boy, sitting on a chair, thought for a long time until his thoughts were interrupted from the side. The employee contacted Dr. Kong. The boy asked if something happened. The employee explained that he called him, to which the doctor replied that everything was fine and asked him to wait a minute. Looking at the boy, he began to explain that he called him because, well, then he started thinking again. Ikiar should have contacted him. After all, Rama was discovered and the expected trajectory must now change. He is sure that they are now developing an evacuation plan. Why don't they call him about technical cooperation? He's very famous, and I'm sure that they know that he has the technologies they need for this. An employee standing nearby realized that the boy was distracted again. Then the main character remembered how Yumi advised him to interest them in his developments. She was very angry and raised her hand up and told him to ask for a job, ask to be in touch. He remembered how the girl screamed that if he did not return her money, she would certainly kill him. He decided that he couldn't just leave it like that. A gray-haired man with a neatly trimmed beard opened a magazine in front of him and asked why the boy wanted to meet him. The main character explained that he heard that the financial situation of their laboratory is not the best. And he added that he was asking him to buy their laboratory, or perhaps he wants to sell the technology. He didn't come here to ask for a favor. Kang replied that it was possible. The man exclaimed that he had not even thought about it. The boy began to explain that he needed to discuss something else. What he talked about is only one side. The main character said that they can discuss all this if, of course, he wants. The man immediately turned to look at the boy. He asked him not to waste much time. If he wants to say something, then let him immediately get to the point. Then Kong started talking about the Rama asteroid. The man asked him what he meant. The boy said that he came to discuss what measures would be taken against him. The man replied that he did not understand what the boy was talking about. Why does he think that some measures need to be taken? Kong exclaimed that he knew very well that the man understood everything. Asteroid Rama is moving towards the Earth. The man asked where he heard about this. The boy thought that he would not believe him if he said that he had already seen it. He asked if it mattered now where he learned about it, and I thought that I just needed to convince him to listen to him. He exclaimed that the director would decide whether to listen to him or not, and asked to listen to him. He predicts that if the situation worsens, the IKR will launch an interceptor missile at the asteroid, and he asked the man whether this was true or not. He in turn tilted his head towards the table and asked the boy to answer his question. How does he know this? The main character got up from his chair and exclaimed that nothing would work out, and the IKR will use Fort David, and he will try to secretly escape into space. The gray-haired man raised his head from the table and was very surprised. He asked the boy how he knew all this. Then the main character began to explain that there were about a thousand people for twenty, thirty years. The gray-haired man could not calm down and continued to ask the boy where he got this information from. Kong asked why he thought he was developing a space gun. Has he done research on building robots? He believes that it is impossible to stop the asteroid, so he is trying to build a space shelter. The man asked if he knew in advance and prepared for this. Well, it's like if the asteroid was discovered quite recently. Kong said that unfortunately, he abandoned the development of the space gun because it was almost impossible to use, but he excelled in robotics. 
The shelter problems he is currently working on are problems of module size and the complexity of setting up zero gravity. All this can be solved by redeveloping the basic model based on the use of automatic robots. But he came because he was puzzled, because he didn't want to use this technology in CCCR. He asked the man to think about why he came to say that he knew the truth. Now saying the wrong thing can be dangerous. The man exclaimed that maybe he considered this an opportunity. After all, he has all the developments for building a space shelter. Kang said that he understands that the man is suspicious of him. But the boy asked to believe him. Their laboratory can help the International Space Development Committee. The gray-haired man, continuing to sit in the chair, thought about it and then asked if this was all he wanted to say. Kong thought he didn't sound too convincing. The man replied that it was unconvincing. It was reasonable. But because of this, he cannot involve their laboratory in space developments. We need to collaborate to use their technology, and this will attract the attention of others. One day everyone will know about the Rama asteroid. What will people think if they find out that they were building a space shelter? Chaos will reign in society. For safety's sake, their plan must be kept secret. He met with him today because he was afraid that he would judge him for refusing. The main character exclaimed whether it was time to attract the attention of the public. After all, the Earth will be destroyed by an asteroid. The man asked not to talk nonsense. How can he be sure that the International Space Research Committee will not be able to stop the asteroid? They will need his help to stop him. The man asked why then he couldn't stop him on his own. Why can't he even build a space shelter himself? Why can't he do this if he is so confident in his abilities? The man advised him to do it himself. At first this was impossible. Construction of a laboratory, development of safety technology, cooperation with the ITAR. The first step was taken wrong long ago. Instead of relying on the ICAR, the main character had to build a shelter on his own. The boy thought about this with his eyes closed. He was suddenly, suddenly told that he could no longer conduct research. Kang was sitting at the table reading a notepad. He wrote something down in it. Then the boy heard someone's steps. It was the click of heels. His employee and friend appeared in the doorway in front of him. The main character immediately rejoiced and exclaimed with a smile that of course Yumi had come to save him. But when the girl came in, she smiled slightly and answered the boy that it was not at all what he thought. After all, she was caught too. She asked if he had any idea how surprised she was when he suddenly went on vacation and disappeared. To which Kong replied that he really could have gone on vacation. Yumi exclaimed that this was nonsense. After all, this is too suspicious for him. Kang Chelso in vacation, these words are completely incompatible. She remembered how they spoke with the main character on the phone. He answered her that he needed to rest a little and asked her not to worry. He realized that Yumi Gong could not be fooled. Well, in the end, he had a good rest, so we can consider it a vacation. He asked her if this was a beautiful house. This is the excellent villa of the director Daniel. Yumi asked what happened. Why did the IKR take him into custody? Kang asked if she heard Dr. Daniel's explanation. The girl said he wouldn't go farther. He also tried to hide his whereabouts. The boy said that it's not easy to explain because it all sounds like nonsense. The girl asked if she had ever felt ashamed with him. Of course it wasn't, so she asks him to tell him more and more. Yumi, looking at him, asked him to be honest with her. Kong thought there was no need to hide anymore. Looking at the girl, he began to gather his thoughts and think about where to start. Then the main character began to talk about how he was detained because he knew about a super-secret asteroid. This asteroid will destroy the Earth. The boy told her with concentration the whole truth, because he understood that he shouldn't deceive her anymore. He began to explain that he was living his life again in order to stop this asteroid. The girl couldn't understand what he was talking about, and she asked the main character to repeat everything from the very beginning and more slowly after which the boy told Yumi about his past lives, also about the asteroid Rama. He told her about how he left and then unexpectedly returned, as if waking up. He himself cannot understand how this is all happening to him. At first, Yumi was of course very shocked, but then she listened to him silently. Then she asked if what he just said was true. The main character asked if this looked like a stupid joke, and I thought that Yumi didn't believe him either. Really ask her to believe I have no evidence, this is most likely very stupid. But then, he sharply turned his head in her direction and asked if she really believed him. I believed everything he said, the girl answered yes. After all, he had never joked before. 
especially in such a situation. And she added that after hearing his story, she understood why he was in such a hurry in his research. Well, now all his secrets are revealed. The boy asked me to wait. But the girl asked what he meant anyway. After all, everything is confirmed by logic and science. After all, this is all true too. The girl put her hands to her eyes as if trying to explain something. Then she raised her hand up, pointing her finger somewhere. She asked if the boy thought that she could believe in something like that. After which she explained to him that she simply believed him, because he is him, because Kang Cheol Su said so. The main character thanked the girl for her trust, to which she replied that she always said that she believed him. In fact, he was the one who didn't believe her. She looked into his eyes and said that he said that soon the earth would be destroyed. Was she right? And I asked if there was any solution. The boy thoughtfully replied that most likely Daniel could ask him for help, although it would be too late. Looking at him, the girl thought about it and realized that he didn't have any solution. The main character's notebook lay open on the table. So, these are the results of the fourth life. The failure of the space gun. The success of the development of robots. The next project. Yumi asked if he was already thinking about his next life. To which the boy replied that of course he thinks. For her, it's watching the ending. Yumi exclaimed that he couldn't do this. He won't make any money that way. Kong replied that of course it is difficult to create a business alone. He'll do it, but that's not enough. If you want to achieve more in this life, if they stick to the plan, they can increase funding and build a space shelter. Yumi said that he didn't succeed in this life because there wasn't enough funding, because she didn't keep her promise to give him a trillion dollars. The boy replied that they could buy time. Thanks to the losses and time spent on the space gun, he would like to remember everything, but he's not sure he can repeat it. It's difficult. The girl asked if he still had memories from his past lives. Is she speaking correctly? Kong replied that he only remembers types of research or important events. He cannot remember anything complex or every day. Is there any other way? I wish there was an easier and more specific way to create seed capital. Yumi wondered what exactly he remembered from his past life, and when a lot comes back or leaves his memory. The boy tried to explain what he remembers as if in pieces. Sometimes his memory comes back to him in some moments. The boy insisted on some simple and definite way to create initial capital. But the girl could not help him with this now. The main character still looked at her, expecting that she would somehow calm him down. Meanwhile, the gray-haired man spoke to the cameras that, as already announced, the project would consist of sending thousands of atomic bombs from the Earth every day. Using a blast wave, you can change the orbit of an asteroid. The CCIR is waiting for final checks to be carried out, so the man asked everyone not to worry or worry. He guarantees that there will be no defeat. They will stop the Rama asteroid. The man asks to stay in his place and continue his work. The woman on the news continued to broadcast that at that time the International Space Research Committee was confident that the asteroid had been stopped. However, despite the fact that all plans were carried out, the trajectory of the asteroid did not change. As a result, many are wondering whether the CCIR plan was a success or not. Stores are stocked with essential items, and unrest begins throughout society. Yumi, approaching the main character, exclaimed that everything was as he said. It seems that Director Daniel is not going to contact them until the last minute. The girl knocked on some door. Apologizing, she turned to the guys. She asked how long they were going to keep them here. Apparently they still won't stop the asteroid. Yumi asked to stop and let them out of here as soon as possible. The girl began to pull the door handle and call them. Well, it turned out that the door opened. The door suddenly opened and she found herself on some porch. It was dark outside. The sky was very red. The sky was a very scarlet, bloody color. The girl noticed that there was no one on the street anymore. After which, they went out with the main character and wandered somewhere through the mountainous area. Yumi said that she was already very tired. She asked if this was really the end. Then why would they do this? And she asked Kanga if he was tired. The boy replied that he was tired, but he remembers it for sure. He remembers mistakes from his past life. Yumi sighed and said that she was not in the mood. She wanted to die sunbathing on a yacht or on the beach. Kong said that she herself asked to come here with her. He personally liked to look from below. Yumi asked that he didn't see how she was trying to find the good in this situation. Then, the main character handed her a jar of juice. She thanked him by taking the drink. 
The girl thought, I open the jar, will it work if they drink with an asteroid? The main character replied that he didn't think so. And looking somewhere into the distance, he also began to open the jar. He decided it was worth a try after all. For him, it was always like last-minute rituals before he fell into oblivion and returned back. Yumi exclaimed that she hoped this would work. If she could go back in time with him, he wouldn't have to suffer alone. Before taking a sip of juice, the boy looked at the girl and said that everything would be fine. Well, if she can't go back to the past with him, then he'll go back alone again. The girl asked him to talk about it again, tell the whole story and this secret again. Then when they return, wake up again. Kong thought for a moment and glanced at the girl. He wondered if she would trust him again. The girl, closing her eyes, exhaled and answered the boy that of course she would believe. After all, she trusts him very much. And she asked me to look at her. She exclaimed that she was now next to him. What other proof was needed? But he still asked what would happen if she didn't believe him. The girl asked not to worry. Then he can prove everything to her. And she can't help but believe the evidence. He can tell her about what happened between her and her father. Or something about her life. After all, he knows all this. The boy replied that he knew. But he was not sure that he would take all these memories with him. Yumi asked Kong Chelso to just say, then he will do everything. After all, they have known him for more than a couple of days, and quite a long time ago. Therefore, he can also trust her and simply calm her down. The main character said that he was sure that the girl would really remember everything when she woke up. She, in turn, began to reassure the boy that if she remembered this conversation, they would definitely tell him everything. He promised her the same. That if he remembers this, he will of course tell her everything. She asked if he promised her this. The boy immediately promised. And so they decided to raise their jars and drink to it. The girl asked not to forget Gong Yumi from this life. And smiling, she began to drink the liquid. And after they drank from these jars, the boy woke up again in his bed. His mother came into his room and woke the boy up to get ready for school. But he was already ready and left without saying goodbye. He was in a hurry to meet Yumi. And when I saw her, I asked how it all went. Yumi replied that she told him just recently, but he was so impatient, even though it doesn't seem that way at first. Came here early in the morning. The girl took out some notepads and books from her backpack. She explained that first of all, she thought about it in general terms. Handing him a whole stack of books, the boy asked what they were. The girl replied that this was their business plan. After all, he asked her for a trillion dollars. And he said that he was thinking about how he could earn them. Holding the books in his hands, the boy realized that she had not returned from the future. They created memories together. Yumi, who believed in him, simply disappeared. The girl could not understand that he was looking at her like that and asked if there was something on her face. She asked why he was looking at her like that. The boy thought that that toast was completely pointless. Yumi continued to touch her face. I think she has something on it. She asked why he didn't answer her. And Kong was very upset, realizing that everything was pointless. The girl asked if he could see her at all, because he thought very hard about his own. She asked him again why the boy did not answer her question. And so the boy opened a project to earn one trillion. He began to study it carefully, looking at every line. Then various memories arose before him, about how he was in a past life. He also remembered Yumi. Then I thought I needed to concentrate. This is not the time to remember this. After all, it's better to think about something useful in this life. With sufficient funding, space robotics can be successful. If he wants to build a space shelter, you better do it regardless of anyone. Even if they cooperate, it is better to build a shelter in advance. We need to learn from past mistakes, so as not to repeat them in your new lives. This is how the main character decided to act. He bowed his head. The boy thought about what he had learned that the space gun was impractical. We need to find a new way to save on transportation. Yumi, sitting next to him, asked why he was like this today. Kong asked which one it was. The girl replied that he was strange, and she asked where such a bright light came from. He explained that she placed the piece of paper in front of his face. The sunlight reflected off the paper, and it took a while to get used to the amount of light. Yumi asked if he had heard of dark adaptation. There are two types of receptors in the human eye rods and cones. Rods are more sensitive in dark places and cones in light places. At night, building neurons do not turn on and off instantly. They need time. Yumi asked how he could joke so boringly. Is he really in high school? 
After all, he behaves just like an old man. The boy replied that he was not joking. After all, she said that before. Yumi asked when. Kong remembered that Gong Yumi from her previous life knew that he never jokes. And Gong Yumi from this life never spoke like that. The main character began to think and tried to understand what happened, putting all the puzzles together. He remembered how they sat before drinking the juice. How the girl said that she would not be able to return to the past with him, and he would return alone again. Kong realized that Yumi here and Yumi there are different. Taiyu didn't trust him, but he doesn't know how she will react now. But then, he had an idea. He told the girl that he was going to remove the plan for building a space cannon, which was written down here. The girl asked why. He said that he would use it to save on transportation and build a space shelter. Kong replied what he said before. But the space gun is not as practical as he thought. The girl asked in what sense. After all, he speaks as if he has already tried it. She looked at the boy carefully. The main character said that he tried the last one. Yumi asked him to stop. After all, he's only joking today. Then the boy looked at her and replied that he had already said that he was not joking. He tried to awaken the girl's memories, but so far nothing had worked. The main character looked at the girl again and said that he was living this life for the fifth time. She looked back without understanding anything. He said that if they knew, that they would see the end of the world. But there was still time to find a way to prevent it. Yumi replied that she probably would have done something. For example, an underground bunker. She can't just sit and wait for death. Kong explained that many would think the same. And he too. The boy began to show her a plan to earn one trillion. The girl, looking at the notebook, exclaimed that she didn't understand. This is their plan. Then she exclaimed that building a space shelter was not just a dream, and she asked him if this was a plan for salvation from the apocalypse. The main character began to explain to the girl that in the future the Earth will be destroyed by an asteroid and humanity will die out. He said that he had observed this four times already and was living this life for the fifth time. She again asked if he was joking, after which the girl looked at the main character and realized that he was completely serious. The boy looked at her with the last hope, and asked her to believe him. He explained that this was not a joke or a prank. Yumi said that even if he was telling the truth, why did he decide to share it with her? After all, he could have told anyone, such as his parents or Taehu. To which the main character explained to the girl that he told her specifically because she said that she would believe him. But the girl could not understand anything. Kong continued to explain that she was from his fourth life. She asked him to tell her everything again if he returned to the past without her. And he said that she trusted him very much in his fourth life. And I wanted to help. Yumi said that liars usually look people in the eyes to appear sincere. Kong replied that he had not heard her say that for a long time. Does it really look like he's lying? Yumi asked if he knew what she was trying to do. Kong replied that of course he knows. He had seen her tactics many times. She herself told him how it works. Yumi thought that she hadn't told anyone about her, but he could have heard it from someone else. Then the main character asked her how about the fact that he knows everything about her father. The girl was very surprised how he also knew about her father. The boy began to explain that they had known each other for a long time. Yumi told him to bring her father if he trusted her. She said that then she would definitely change her mind. Hearing this, streams of sweat flowed down the girl's cheeks. She asked him to tell him what he knew. The main character began to explain that she lends people money, and this is because her father forces her. Is he telling the truth? Yumi asked him to continue. He made her do it so she could learn how to handle money while she was young. And he also wanted to show her what terrible power money can have. To be more precise, he wanted to show her how stupid people can be when it comes to money. She said that she learned a lot, especially after that incident with Seven Yun. The girl tilted her head and asked if he knows so much about her. You probably know who her father is. The main character, looking at the girl, said that Zhong Han is gone, director of the GJ group, and asked if he was saying correctly if he was her father. She asked if he was familiar with the situation. Kong replied that she told him that she was his illegitimate child. The girl asked if she told him about her mother, to which the boy replied that she told him. Her mother died during childbirth. The girl sitting on a chair, clenched her fists and said that they were really very close. After all, no one knew about it. In order for her to share such information with him, she had to be a very close person to her. 
Then the main character leaned closer to the girl and asked if she believed him now. He really hoped that she would remember. Kong asked if she would help him. He explained that he could not prepare for the impending disaster alone. He just needs her help. The main character waited for an answer from the girl, hoping for her understanding. Yumi asked if he understood that when someone talks about a difficult situation in her family, he should at least console her. This is all very strange. It's strange to hear him talk about her past as if there was nothing unusual there. The girl exclaimed that it was very invigorating. Honestly, she still can't believe what he told her. Can't believe him 100%. And who would immediately believe it? Well, if everything he says is true... The girl raised her head up, thinking. She asked Yumi's past if she thought the same. That's probably why she decided to help him. The main character replied that he thought she would never know. He clearly remembered all the events, unlike her, and I really wanted her to remember too. Yumi exclaimed that she knows that people who look at her the same way he looks now simply cannot lie. Approaching the main character, the girl agreed with him. She said that she believed him, and she added that it would help. An asteroid will destroy the Earth in the near future. And for some mysterious reason, he returns to the past. To the time when he was in high school. His fourth attempt, in which she took part, failed. Because they didn't earn enough money, and probably the space development of the gun didn't pay off. The main character replied that it was so. So this time, he will move in a different direction. He is considering using reusable vehicles to reduce transportation costs. Yumi said that's not what she meant. She talked about how emotionally difficult it must be. This is probably what's going on in my head. Kong asked what he should think about. He just needs to do something. It seems to him that first of all he needs to colonize the moon. Because from his past life he knows that he can develop the necessary engines and robots. He doesn't remember all the technical details. But they know that they are capable of doing this. With the help of technology. He wants to build a space shelter larger than the previous project. To do this, they need more than resources from the Earth. To build on such a scale, they need to colonize the moon and use its resources. Moreover, it is unlikely that they will receive any help from the ICCR. So they should exclude UKs from their plans because they belong to the ICKR. The main character, explaining to the girl, said that in this case they need their own space station. They will develop reusable space vehicles, and they will use them to build a private space station. They will be able to use the space station as the last to colonize the moon and build a space shelter. Thus, it will be possible to build a space shelter of the required scale. The girl raised her hands in front of her and closed her eyes and asked the boy to be quieter. Slow down a little so she can figure it all out. Step 1. He plans to develop propulsion systems and robots, then reusable space vehicles. Step 2. He's going to build a private space station. Step three, he's going to colonize the moon. And step four, construction of a space shelter. Yumi asked if she understood everything correctly. Kong replied yes, and if it is possible to build a city on the moon. She asked if this was a short plan. Then you can focus on each of the steps. Kang said that if they fail at least one of the points, they will not be able to achieve the main goal, namely a space shelter. Yumi said that the plans are impressive. Well, the amount needed for this is astronomical. Does he really think it is possible to build a space station without the help of a government or international organization? He said that she could help finance the development of a space gun and robots, so it thinks it can also fund the development of reusable space vehicles. But even if they can find a way to benefit from reusable vehicles, they will barely have enough to build a space station and a colony on the moon. They don't have an unlimited amount of time. Kang said that in his fourth life, she said that all this was possible. Then the girl leaned over to the boy and asked how. The boy replied that he became friends with Minsu. Yumi was very surprised, really having become friends with Minsu from their class, with this modern druid. And here in front of us is the room where their class was located. A classmate began to tell him that his name was Minsu Song. The boy said what he dreams about. Standing in front of the class, he exclaimed that he dreams of becoming a druid. The teacher was very surprised, and the boy began to explain that they love animals and get along well with plants. Now he grows crocus and avocado, and the pineapple seed he recently planted has already sprouted. The teacher exclaimed that this was impressive, and she asked if he dreams of becoming a farmer. The boy replied that no, because he said that he wanted to become a druid. Then the teacher asked if he wanted to tell him something else about himself. 
The boy replied that he gets along with animals. He would show if there was a cat, dog, or bird here. But he will gladly show you when such an opportunity presents itself. Everyone was very surprised by his dream. The teacher asked if this was true, and she asked me to show them sometime. The boy promised that he would do so. He is sure that there will be such an opportunity this semester. The girl was very surprised why he was the one. Why exactly a boy named Min Su Song? Kang explained that he would become the founder of a very large company. The company will be called NGS. He will open it when he finds a way to produce meat and will turn it into a profitable business around the world. Kang told Yumi that if they could convince Min Su to let them buy his company's shares early, then they could make enough money to build a space shelter. So they will need to puzzle over business ideas and ways to make money. They watched the boy. He, in turn, watered the flowers and said something to them. Yumi asked the main character if he was talking to them. Well, the girl replied that he was really talking to them. Just don't turn your head. Kong asked when he noticed them. Well, the boy replied that he had recently noticed it. He explained that it was not difficult. After all, it's morning, natural energy is boiling. The druid's power was also at its peak. He was in the process of uniting with nature. So of course I noticed when something unusual appeared. He was an interesting, strange boy. Once I felt the appearance of my classmates. He began to explain to them that in simple terms, he had just been part of nature. The girl looked at the boy with surprise. He said that one could even say that he was one with her. And he began to talk further and tell me something. The main character thought how he could feel them like that. I wonder if they can make friends with him. Minsu invited the kids to admire the flowers with him so that they try to feel the surrounding nature. For example, communicate with animals. Many doves flew into his arms. He closed his eyes, feeling these birds. The main character asked the boy why he wanted to become a druid. Is it not to use the ability of plants to grow quickly or control the minds of animals? Minsu said that he did not want to be a druid, like in books or games. He wants to be a real druid. Druids were ancient Celtic priests. He wants to continue their work. The druid strives to awaken inner strength by communing with nature and one's origins. He began to explain that in this way they cultivate the spirit. And I tried to explain something else. Yumi asked Kong if he was sure that this boy would make a breakthrough in cell cultivation. Because he doesn't even smell like science. She asked if he remembered it exactly. Is he really sure that it is him? The main character replied that, of course he was sure. And sitting opposite the girl, he asked if she was thinking about something. Meanwhile, news release. In their next story, they will talk to a man who made a breakthrough in cell cultivation. With them in the studio is the CEO of NGS, Mr. Minsu Song. He will share with them the secrets of his success. And so the presenter greeted Mr. Song. She asked if he could first tell them how the technology for producing their meat differs from others. The boy replied that of course he could. He developed cell replacement technology, which they call third-generation meat technology. Other technologies involve pressing meat cells produced in bioreactors, or using 3D printers to shape cells into the desired shape of meat. Therefore, the resulting meat does not taste as good as the real thing. However, his company's third-generation technology allows them to produce meat in larger chunks and closely replicate the taste and texture of the real thing. The presenter exclaimed that this was simply amazing, but it's difficult to produce meat in whole pieces. Minsu replied, yes. The larger the cell, the more difficult it is to distribute oxygen and nutrition to the cells so that they grow. If cells do not receive enough nutrition and oxygen, they die. The woman said that, however, animal cells grow very slowly, don't they? It takes a lot of time to produce one piece of meat, and I asked if there was any secret to speed up the process. Minsu replied that the secret is the gel-like structure of the extracellular matrix, which makes cell production possible. It can be called Ymir. It is the world that becomes the target cell. This is approximately how cells are replaced. The presenter asked whether Ymir behaves like stem cells. Minsu replied, no. If you look closely, they behave differently. The biggest difference between the two is the ability for cellular differentiation. Unlike stem cells, which have the ability to become different types of cells depending on how the name is managed, Emir can only become a certain type of cell that has been programmed in advance. The presenter thought that in this case, 
Ymir is the basis of his meat production technology, and she asked if he could tell them anything else. The boy replied that he was afraid that he couldn't. After all, the rest is all a trade secret. The presenter apologized, and I asked whether it was possible to use Ymir only for the production of cells. Based on his words, it seems they can be used for even more important things. Minsu replied that, of course, he believes that depending on what they are designed for, they can be used not only for the production of cells, but also for growing artificial organs. The presenter asked whether these artificial organs would be different from real ones. The main character was sitting next to Yumi. They were just watching the news. The guy called them amazing. Looks like they are taking a big step into the future. Yumi said that as long as they have the right product, money won't be a problem. Global meat production is worth a trillion dollars. Healthcare costs more than $200 billion. If they become full-fledged participants, it will not be difficult to get the trillion they need. These are their chances of success in the next life. The girl explained that the chances of success will depend on Minsu's son. The memories were somewhat fuzzy. Yumi asked the main character if he would eat. That morning, Yumi expressed interest in the path of becoming a druid and how they saw the world. She said that they were really interested in druids, but it was not easy to learn everything. If there was time, the girl asked to tell the boy in more detail, after which she invited Means to take a walk with them so that he could tell them as much as possible what they wanted to hear from him. The girl, looking at the table, asked Minsu why he only ordered fries. Isn't he hungry? The boy replied that, not really. He just can only eat this from the entire menu. The main character asked if he was a vegetarian. The boy replied that, not really, but he tries not to eat the meat of animals that did not grow in open pastures because he is a druid. Minsu began to explain that according to the teachings of the druids, souls go through a repeating cycle of birth and death. Souls can be reborn as a wind or a mountain or even a person or some kind of animal. Therefore, animals raised in pens are endowed with the same sacredness as human life, so he believes they deserve the same respect. They cannot be kept in such inhumane conditions. After all, they can live like this in their next life, too. That's why he doesn't want to eat burgers sold in chain restaurants. This is a conscious decision that he made on his own. In the future, he wants to find a way to produce meat so they can consume meat more ethically, the boy explained, trying to reach them. Can by improving cell production technology. The main character thought about what he remembered correctly. It is Minsu who will become the founder of NGS. Minsu will become interested in biology and develop new cell production technology because he is interested in the philosophy of the druids. Yumi exclaimed that he was absolutely right. After his words, she wants to know even more about the druids. The boy immediately grabbed his head and laughed. He said that he never thought that he would find someone who shared his interests. Yumi said that it was terrible that they could only get meat by killing animals. In that case, he can tell her more. For example, about the cell production technology he spoke about. The girl exclaimed that they could help him come up with something. Looking at her, Kong thought that she seemed convinced too. Minsu asked if she was telling the truth, and he shared that he actually has ideas, but there is something that he cannot understand. Yumi asked him not to worry anymore. After all, Kong is a very brainy guy and he can safely figure this out with him. The main character was very surprised when the girl pointed her finger at him. Kong said that he cannot be a professional in every branch of science. Well, Yumi immediately stepped on his foot under the table. Minsu immediately began to show what he was working on. He said that firstly, he studied modern meat production technology and carried out several studies. He studied why people prefer real meat and I thought about solving the problem. As a result, the main reason why people ignore artificial meat is that it has a different taste and texture from regular meat. So he began to think about how he could solve this problem. The main character looking at the boy exclaimed that he could help him with this. After the boy went away to order something, Yumi asked Kong if he was sure that they wouldn't tell Minsu. Kong asked what she meant and what to talk about. She explained that he knows what will happen in the future and lives life again. Meanwhile, Minsu stood near the counter and asked if apple pie was being prepared from eggs. Then the boy ordered a burger without a cutlet. Kong replied to Yumi that he had certainly thought about it. But now, in order to convince her, he had to tell her her secrets. So he doesn't think Means will believe this nonsense if he doesn't have anything he can do to make him believe him. Yumi again asked if he would tell him about this. 
The main character replied that in the end it would not be easy to believe. The boy explained to the girl that even now he is not sure that he can convince him. From that day on, Yumi and Minsu became friends and found common interests. At the beginning of autumn, she and Yumi told Minsu about their plans. The boy was very surprised by this. Opening his mouth and bulging his eyes, he asked if they wanted to be druids with him. The girl asked what he was talking about. After all, he and Chelsea want to become billionaires who will radically change the space development industry. Kong put it in his head that he does not strive to become a billionaire. In fact, he just wants to achieve his goals as quickly as possible. Cooperation with them will help him too. After all, he has an innovative idea, but it's difficult to find initial capital for the project. Kong explained that he and Yumi started their own company, so they would fund his research in exchange for shares in his company. They will give him as much time as he needs to develop his idea. As soon as his meat production technique finds a basis in the meat substitute market, your company will begin to rise in price. Then they will continue their actions to get the necessary money and build a space shelter. Yumi said that if he successfully develops in this area as he plans, they think that it will only be a matter of time before he controls the substitute market. It will also pave the way for growing organs in vitro. Minsu immediately asked what they were saying about artificial organs. Isn't that too much? The main character said that he had read his plan and could say that it was really possible. After all, he is much more capable than he thinks. Here Yumi, in turn, laughed and exclaimed that she never agrees to unprofitable business. Minsu agreed with his hand on his head, and he said that in any case he would need investors. And once they offer, he will lose a little. Yumi said that it was so. There is no need to hesitate when someone offers to turn your dreams into reality. Minsu said that he doesn't know, but he will feel a little uncomfortable if he signs something with her. Kong immediately replied that he understood him. Minsu asked why. Ayumi immediately jumped up and began hitting the main character on the back. I asked what he wants to get from her. Minsu immediately laughed and said that he was just joking. And here we are 20 years later. She and Yumi founded the KNG Space Development Corporation, after which they presented their plan to the public. Plan for building a space shelter. They stood on both sides near a huge monitor on which the plan was shown. Making money from reusable propulsion systems, using robots, building a space station, colonizing the moon, and the construction of a space shelter. At first, people laughed, because their plan did not require developments affecting several areas of science. This requires simultaneous development in several directions. However, he decided to develop the necessary technology. Rocket 1047 landed successfully. The power plant successfully returned to its initial position, and they managed to carry out their plans. Right according to the original plan, everything was slowly falling into place. They had a really friendly team. Thus, the opinion of people and not their companies gradually changed. KNG Space Development Corporation successfully built the space station within the planned time frame. The KNG-1 space station has a unified structure, two rings rotating in different directions to create artificial gravity. This allows people to stand there, just like on the ground. This is impossible on UX, which is a combination of several modules. Due to the fact that KNG alone was built as a single structure, it was built quickly. The TV presenter said that the difference is visible in the pictures. Robots play a key role in such rapid construction. Is she right? The guy sitting next to me answered yes. They also make it possible to reduce the cost of transporting materials into space thanks to reusable power plants. By the way, KNG recently announced their plan to build a second space station. The presenter replied that this was truly revolutionary. KNG alone is incomparable to other stations. In this regard, they have Dr. Chelsu Kang in the studio, the chief technical director of the Space Development Corporation, and, accordingly, his brain. Meanwhile, the gray-haired director asked the people sitting opposite him if they were saying that the ICCR was lagging behind the private corporation. The guy replied that, to be precise, KNG is 195% recycled materials, when their stations are only 65, and this is 30% less. The gray-haired man exclaimed that they had known for a long time, and who gave him permission to speak at all? The director asked him to calm down. After all, there is no point in taking it out on that person. The director asked if there was any way they could influence KNG alone. The guy replied that when KNG first announced that they were going to build a space station, 
They bought shares in the space station in exchange for permission to build it. The director asked to buy more shares. They must tell them that they must prevent the militarization of space. Then they will have no choice but to agree. The director again ordered his people to buy KNG shares. They understood his order. But the director hit the table and said that this was not enough. If the hour per company continues to lead in the field of space development, then the need for the existence of such an institute will be questioned. The girl sitting opposite said something about the moon. The director asked what she meant. She explained that they would claim the moon. If they control the development of the moon, then there will be no question of suppressing them. Then the director asked how they would do it. After all, they don't have such an opportunity. The girl said that they know that another company is already working on this. The man found this plan quite disgusting. Kiss one place, KNG. But the director said that they would unite with them. The employees asked how this could happen. Even if they succeed, the KNG undoubtedly have more power. This will not be enough to stabilize their situation. Then the director stood up from his chair and exclaimed that they needed to confirm ownership of the lunar base. There is a significant flaw in the KNG structure. The man stood up from his chair to explain it to them more clearly. If they take advantage of this disadvantage, they will be able to increase the number of their shares as soon as the construction of a colony on the moon begins. Well, if they play all their cards right, they might even take over this whole damn company. Meanwhile, Yumi was talking to someone on the phone. She asked, why don't they discuss this later? After which the girl passed out and lost heart a little. The main character asked what happened. Yumi replied that MKKR wanted to acquire more shares of the space station. They have already fulfilled their part of the agreement. Who do they think they are? Why are they suddenly making such demands? Kung thought why they needed this. In their previous life, they showed no interest in his research. Yumi said that they are like a typical Korean mother-in-law. She wouldn't be so annoyed if she were at least married. Then Minsu came to them with some boxes in his hands and asked how long they had been waiting. Well, seeing that Yumi was upset, he asked what happened. Aren't they celebrating the completion of the space station? After all, as they say, nothing brightens the day like a piece of meat. The boy opened the boxes of pizza and burgers. Kang asked if this was meat from his production. Minsu replied that it was so. They will be the first after scientists to try it. He has a good feeling. The boy, looking at both of them, asked to try it quickly. Yumi closed her eyes and said that she had no appetite, but still she could not resist and tried. Kang asked if it was really fake meat. After all, it tastes just like normal. If he starts selling this, he will then take over the entire meat market. Yumi exclaimed that it was very tasty. Minsu replied that KNG is moving by leaps and bounds, and the production of meat and artificial organs is keeping pace with them. So why worry then? The boy asked everyone not to worry. The main character said that Minsu was right. Whatever happens, they have already come a long way. Minsu agreed with Kong completely. They exclaimed at once that everything would only get better for them now, but it's not over until it's over. Then a request came from the SER, so that they changed the plan for colonizing the moon. Yumi was already sitting opposite some guy to whom she asked why change the plan. And I asked if something was wrong with him. The guy replied that it was not so. Yumi asked him to be honest with her. The ICR has some problems regarding this, or what he means. The man replied about the base on the moon. They think it's too big for the original proposal. Too many buildings. Is there really hope in building such a large mining facility, an operating plant, and a mass engine in the early stages? Why don't they immediately bring the base to perfection? They know that they are trying to build not-so-necessary facilities planning to build a space shelter in the future. Do I think it would be better for all of them if they focused on monetizing the moon first? So this is what the ICCR needs. But their goal, of course, is to build a space shelter, and they are not going to change that. If the ICCR wants to deviate from this plan, then there is no need for them to colonize the moon. This is how Yumi explained to the man sitting next to her. He asked how she could be so categorical. The CCIR, as an international organization, has the right to express its opinion. He asked me if she thought so. He thinks that they don't even know that what they are doing is not just expressing an opinion. The girl asked for forgiveness and said that she no longer had time to sit here and listen. She explained that her assistants were conducting it. Two healthy guys had already approached the man. He shouted after them that they would regret this. 
The conflict between King and Icker continued to grow. The ICRC threatened to deny KNG permission to colonize the moon if their demands were not met. They also threatened to make it difficult for KNG to use the St. Tusville ICCR launch site. However, the threats did not last long. Confused by delays in KNG's plans, shareholders soon learned that the ICCR was denying permits, requiring KNG to comply with their demands. The majority of shareholders sided with KNG and voted against IKR. They supported Chelsea's views, and thanks to Yumi, who skillfully played her cards, investor discontent increased. When the countries funding the ICCR began demanding that the organization refrain from attacking the KNG, the ICCR was stymied and gave the KNG everything it needed. It was a victory. The victory of Yumi's insight and the ingenuity of the protagonist. After this, the KNG Space Development Corporation completed the construction of a base on the moon, which became an outpost for the colonization of the moon. KNG sent five specialized workers to the base to begin development of the Earth's natural satellite. They checked whether this system works. Control Center, are they sure there is a connection? The girl in the spacesuit replied that it seemed to be working. Why is she starting her report? Local time is 8.52. The temperature is 50 degrees. They arrived at the base in the Aitken Shackleton Crater. A five-man squad led by Captain Kate will remain at the base until the official colonization of the moon. Thanks to robot builders, the metalworking factory is almost ready. Yumi told Kong that Yongsu Guk is something, and she asked if he remembered how he said that he would become an astronaut. Kong replied that they were monitoring the work. Now he is there, one of the first on the lunar base. The main character thoughtfully asked if he knew him. Yumi asked what he was talking about. After all, this is Yongsu Guk. They went to middle and high school together. Yumi asked Kong if he really wasn't interested in the people around him. There was a lot of fuss when Yong Su was chosen to explore the moon because he was their classmate. There were conversations about preferring some over others, nepotism and something else. Kong replied that he really didn't remember. The main character glanced at the girl and said that he did not call her to talk about that guy. The girl looked in his direction in surprise, but stopped talking about this guy anymore. She asked if he wanted to sell their NGS shares. She told the boy that he wanted to, because they had finished building the lunar base. They will need more money to develop in this direction. Yumi laughed and said that she would look for a naive, that is, generous buyer who would want to buy their shares at a good price. They own the bulk of NGS shares, so they can develop a lunar, no, also build a space shelter after selling them. We just need to conclude a deal before the end of the year. Kong replied that this should be done only when they have enough time, and I asked if they had enough money until that time. After all, the company no longer has any funds left. Yumi looked at Kong and asked the boy not to worry. She will take care of issuing a large number of shares. The main character said that the shareholders would not be happy about this. The girl replied that she would sort it out. She will do everything possible to get the necessary amounts. And she asked the main character not to do anything, just to make sure that people are interested in what they are doing. KNG Space Development Corporation has officially announced the completion of construction of a lunar base. They announced that they were now beginning to colonize the moon and build a space shelter according to their plan. They also unveiled plans to build a city on the moon and organize mass transportation. Kong worked very hard to build interest and investment in the company because they were working for those two things. And in the end, they succeeded. Even though they issued new shares, the price began to rise. They were at the dawn of a new space age. Meanwhile, a man slammed his fist on the table, surprised that his employee was talking about the lunar base and mass transportation. He exclaimed that all his words were nonsense. After which, looking sternly at the guy, he asked if he had accurately conveyed everything to him. The guy answered exactly. He personally met with their CEO to ask them to scale back the colonization plan. Well, as he knows, they can only suggest, since they are an international agency, they have no power to directly influence their decision. After all, KNG is a private company. The director asked what was going on with their attempts to acquire more shares. They tried, but everything has a limit. The guy replied that the majority of the shares were still held by the two directors of the company. The employee asked if there were other ways to solve this problem. 
The director asked not to panic, because there is always a way. Then the man who was also at the meeting asked which one it was. He is sure that they will not want to divide their shares under any circumstances. They are interested in my money. The director exclaimed, pointing his finger towards his employees, that focusing on one thing is always risky. The guy showed the director all the information they found about Chelso Kanga and Yumi Gong, at the request of the Klasky director. They found all the personal information they could, including family, dating, health, and capital. Mr. Kang's capital consists mainly of his shares in the company, and his parents live a normal life in Korea. On the other hand, as the boy explained, they found something interesting about the past of Mrs. Yumi Gong. Using all this knowledge, they can plan a lot against this company, primarily through those people on whom they dug up information. The gray-haired man said that he didn't know if they remembered what he said, but there was a significant flaw in the KNG structure. He could have taken possession of KNG at any moment, but he didn't do this because he was waiting for the construction of the lunar base to be completed. First, they needed someone to pave the way for them. The gray-haired man, holding his temple with his hand, exclaimed that now it was time to put their plan into action. Meanwhile, the main character told his employee that they had done a good job, and he suggested moving on to the plan of the lunar city. Yumi asked the boy if he was going home, to which he replied that yes, since he had resolved all urgent matters. The girl, looking at him, asked him not to say that he would get behind the wheel in this state and she offered to let him down, to which the boy handed him the car keys and said that he could just call himself a taxi, but the girl took the keys and said no. They haven't ridden with him for a long time, so they need to go together. The main character had no choice but to follow her, and now they were already driving along the highway. Yumi suggested that Kong go on vacation in the summer, have a well-deserved rest, and eat delicious food. She suggested that he go to the ocean, for example, and even better in Gangneung. Yumi suggested that he go there, and the boy asked how long she had not been to Korea. The girl replied that he, in turn, would also be able to see his family and asked why he never called them. After all, he is their only child. They are probably very sad that he never calls them. The girl glanced at her friend. She asked if they should go there now. In this case, he could take his parents with him and she could take her aunt. They can eat tofu soup there, relax in a cafe on the embankment, or go to the hot springs. The girl offered different options, after which she turned around, noticing that the main character was slowly falling asleep. She tugged at his shoulder and exclaimed that he seemed very tired. But Yumi did not have time to finish the last word as her car flew into a huge truck and immediately overturned. Meanwhile, the news said that last night at 2326 Pacific time, there was a terrible accident on the East Coast. KNG founders Chelso Kang and Yumi Gong were heading home. When the truck crossed the median, it crashed into their car. It was a direct collision. Dr. Kang and Yumi Gong are immediately sent to the hospital. Due to the severity of the accidents, both of them are in critical condition. The main character's employees listened to this news. The boy couldn't breathe. He thought that if he inhaled, he might die. From one thought, he rushes about or thinks that he is doing it. Can his body move even an inch? The doctors noticed that the patient was reacting. Well, that's impossible. His brain seems to be showing signs of activity. The doctors started calling Dr. Kang. They asked if he could hear them. The boy felt a heaviness in his chest, as if something was pressing on her. The doctors asked if they were sure that he was not sleeping, and they asked to call Mr. Song. The doctor told him that she knew how uncomfortable he was, but asked him to be patient. They cleaned his lungs. The main character was on a drip in the hospital. Then Min Su flew into his room. Kang immediately opened his eyes and looked at him. The boy asked if he could hear him. Will he recognize him? He told the main character that he immediately called his parents. I explained that they would arrive soon. He was very happy that the boy woke up, after all, if he had lost him too. Coming closer to him, Min Su asked him to rest some more. There is no need to exhaust yourself after what happened. The friend got ready to leave and said that he would be back soon, but Kong immediately grabbed his hand. Minsu asked what he wanted. The boy began to write letters on his palm. He wanted to know how Yumi was doing now. The girl has already been buried. On the monument it was written that we will never forget Yumi in this life. 
Minsu began to tell Kong that when the accident happened, the truck crashed straight into the driver's seat, and by the time the ambulance arrived, it was already too late. He drove the main character in a wheelchair straight to Yumi's grave. Kong couldn't talk yet, so he wrote on the computer. He asked what caused the accident. Minsu said that the police say the driver was drunk. Kong asked what happened to the driver. Minsu explained that he was arrested, well, during the investigation, he committed suicide in his cell. The guy's face changed when he told this to the main character. He explained that there was something unclean here, so he hired a private detective to look into the matter. The guy said that he would tell him about it a little later and wished him to get well soon. The main character wanted to know about their company. Then Minsu closed his eyes and tilted his head down. He explained to the boy that there was a crisis in KNG. In an instant, KNG almost lost both of its owners. There were big losses in management. Minsu stood up to say that according to the will, Yumi transfers all her shares to him in the event of your death. But suddenly Zhang Hangong, the head of GJ Group, appeared and laid claim to Yumi's property as her biological father. Well, while the main character was in a coma and only a small part of the shares was at his disposal, Minsu did not have that much power in the company. Therefore, no one could stop him. He took Yumi's share for himself and became the main co-owner of the company, after which this man sold all his shares in Iker. The boy talked about this company with sadly lowered eyes. He explained that this is why IKR is now the main co-owner of the KNG company. The main character began to write on the computer asking what happened to the space shelter. Has its construction been canceled? The boy explained that while Kong was in a coma, the ICCR withdrew the project, calling it useless and impractical. They focused on making money from resources from the moon. They said it would bring more benefits to the company. The main character began to become interested in the ICCR, to which the guy replied that it was really all into the hands of the IKKR. He is sure that the boy's accident was also staged. At first, he didn't suspect IKR. Well, when the driver committed suicide and the case was quickly closed, he began to suspect that the accident was not just an accident. So he began to investigate everything on his own. But I couldn't find any clues. He only had suspicions that something was wrong here. After which the incident with the will happened and Director Gong immediately sold his shares to the IKKR company. Kong wrote that one accident is not enough to doubt the organization. It is quite reasonable for Director Gong to sell Yumi MKKR's shares. Min Su, looking at the boy, replied that at first glance it seemed so. Well, later he found out that Director Gong sold the shares at twice the market price. Min Su continued to tell the main character that after that accident, KNG shares became almost twice as cheap. But Ikiar bought them at the old price. Looking at the boy, he asked if this was suspicious. Kang had sweat running down his face. Intuition tells him that this was some kind of secret deal, so he began to study the affairs of the ICCR managers, looking for any clues. And I found out that they all sold their shares the day before this accident. It was as if they knew it would happen, and then bought shares at a discounted price. When the price stabilized, they made money again by selling shares. The boy didn't talk about only a few people. He spoke about many in the ICKR company. Not a single person has acted like this, after which his suspicions were confirmed. The guy explained that, to be honest, most likely the managers only wanted to profit from all this. The organization cannot control all activity, so a blind spot has formed, ideal for crime. The guy bets that Ikar's main goal was to take over the bulk of KNG's shares. After all, they had been striving for this for a very long time. He thinks about not agreeing with Director Gong to get rid of the two of them through this accident and then transfer Yumi's shares to Dr. Gong and naturally allow the IKR company to seize KNG. Their plan was a complete success. The main character wrote that he thought it was not a coincidence that they began to act right after the construction of a colony on the moon was completed. Minsu leaned over Dr. Kong and opened his eyes wide. He asked if the boy really wanted to say that they needed the rights to the moon, and he asked what else they needed. The main character wrote that it was all too timely, don't you think? Minsu replied that in any case, he remains the owner of the company, no matter how dire the situation is. Once he recovers, he can figure out how to eliminate them. But the main character, turning away from him, said that no, it would be too late. Minsu said that a big project like a space shelter takes time. She and Yumi were in a hurry. A slight delay won't mean anything. 
but the main character began to write him a message again. He typed that it was too late. Minsu exclaimed that he did not understand what the boy meant. Then Kong again typed that all because soon the Earth will be destroyed by an asteroid called Rama. The main character sat in a wheelchair looking at the monument to Yumi Gong. Minsu asked in what sense. After all, this is only talked about in economic and political circles. An asteroid that will destroy the Earth or something like that, like a joke to defuse the situation. Kong turned to the boy and typed, asking how long they have been talking about this. The guy replied that, not very long ago, for about two months the main character asked how long he had been unconscious. Minsu replied that it was about a year. He began to ask the boy how he knew about this asteroid. After all, few people know about him, but he was in space all this time. The boy did not let up. He asked the main character to say that he knows about it. Streams of sweat were running down his face. Min Su was very worried and wanted to know more about it. Then Dr. Kong wrote to him, why he thinks he founded the KNG company. And I set goals for myself one after another in such a short time. How could he make such decisions, including his financing? How could he know that Min Su would be so successful and moreover not be mistaken in all of this? But the boy couldn't understand what he was talking about. He looked at the main character for an answer. He looked at him excitedly and questioningly. Kong wrote that he knew what would happen, what he could achieve. Which of those around you will be successful? That's why he came to him many years ago, because in his past lives he was a successful businessman. The main character began to explain to his comrade that he is reborn again and again to stop this asteroid. She and Yumi did their best. Minsu, after listening to the boy, said that what he just told him was surprising, but it's not hard to believe. This is similar to the teachings of the Druids. He asked again if the boy was reborn again and again. He believed him according to the teachings of the Druids. He exclaimed that this is also part of the life cycle. He is the second after Yumi who believed the main character without being afraid of his story. Min Su, looking somewhere into the distance, said that there are still supernatural forces in this world. At this time, it was raining heavily, but they continued to talk at Yumi's grave, Minsu said, looking at the sky that the druids were right all this time. If he had told him about this earlier, he would not have believed it. Turning to the main character, he told the boy to know that even if he had not revealed his secret to him, he would still have helped him at all costs. He would help him because he is his friend. Having said this, Minsu brought the umbrella to the boy, since the rain has already completely wet them. After this, Dr. Kang was taught to walk slowly, one praying little step at a time. The guy was walking towards his goal to get out of his wheelchair as quickly as possible. The doctor told the boy that he was doing great, and when he wanted to continue trying, the doctor asked him to stop and not overload himself. You need to remember that recovery is a long process and be patient so as not to do anything stupid. The boy replied that he understands all this, but he cannot afford long training. Then Minsu came to visit him. He told the main character that he looked much better than usual. Looking at his friend, he exclaimed that the very fact that he can already speak means that there is already some progress. Dr. Kong asked how things were going. Did everything go well? Minsu reassured the boy that everything went well, and they accepted all his proposals. They agreed to everything, including the construction of additional buildings on the moon. This includes producing the work of construction workers for space, mass producing as much reusable equipment as possible, launching it all into space. However, the price they set was higher than he expected. Kong replied that for now, they will pay them as much as they want. The boy thanked his friend, explaining that he should have done this. Now that Rama had been spotted, he was running out of time and money to build the space shelter he had planned. He still can't just sit and wait for his death. The boy is determined to do everything possible to prepare for the asteroid in the remaining time. The main character, looking somewhere in the distance in front of him, thought that besides, he would not be able to look Yumi in the eyes if he gave up. Turning to his friend, the boy asked if he had gathered people who had been fired from KNG. Minsu replied that he collected it. When he told them that the main character wanted to create a new company, they immediately agreed. Dr. Kang said that he left KNG and founded a new company. Now KNG belongs to Ikar, and he was just a name. He sold all his shares in KNG. Like Minsu, he sold shares of NGS. 
and they founded a new company called Cosmos Cosmos. The main character wanted their company, Cosmos Cosmos, to be a new starting point in building a space shelter. But now that it is limited in time, it is impossible to start construction independently from scratch. They need to borrow as many developments as possible from KNG. To be honest, they would have to finish the construction of the space shelter themselves. They should have continued the project until the ICCR realizes the scale of the disaster and provides them with everything they need. Minsu asked if they would do something with them. The boy asked with whom. Minsu asked if Kong would allow them to go unpunished. After which, having finished talking about this, the doctor came up and the main character said goodbye to his friend. Kong told Dr. Dennis to pick up where they left off. The doctor explained that if he overdid it, he would suffer long-term consequences. He understands that the boy wants to get back on his feet quickly. Well, taking risks is also dangerous. The main character, looking into his eyes, replied that he was ready for these consequences. He needs to get back on his feet as soon as possible. This is the only priority now. Meanwhile, a man in a huge building asked if they were saying that they were unable to stop the asteroid. He was told that it was true. The asteroid is simply too big for them and their technology to stop. When Rama was discovered and it became clear that it was heading towards the Earth, they decided to send all nuclear warheads at it at once but the chance of destroying the asteroid was only 1%. He is afraid that the existing capabilities are not enough to stop the asteroid approaching the Earth. The people sitting at the meeting were very worried when they heard this. The gray-haired man was wondering what they should do now. After all, the asteroid is really flying. Another member of the company was asked whether to prepare for the evacuation of people into space, to which he replied that, yes, we need to start building a shelter in space. The man sitting opposite exclaimed, Why do this? Can't they go underground or evacuate to the moon? Then the old man replied that there was no point in hiding underground because the asteroid would most likely destroy the Earth's crust. In addition, it may take decades before the Earth becomes habitable again, and living on the moon for so long is very risky. The employee asked if they put all the resources into this, how big the shelter would be. The old man replied that if they tried, they could build a shelter with a capacity of about 2,000 people. The man sitting opposite was surprised why there was so little. Do they really underestimate the capabilities of their organization? The old man said that this is really the most they can do. Money is not the problem. The whole problem is time. It is necessary to build robots and devices for processing resources. And all this requires much more time and checks than they think. The man tilted his head and said that it is now impossible to transfer this to mass production. The old man asked if they were taking into account Dr. Kang's developments. The man with the bald head replied that they don't take it into account. Well, it's all up to you, and the man exclaimed that he thinks this needs to be taken into account. Then most likely they will be able to solve this problem. And now a man with a bald head was sitting opposite the main character. He explained to him that the Ikiar really needed his help. Dr. Kang, looking at the man, wondered how they turned to him. When, in a past life, no matter how much he waited, this still could not happen. Is it because he started preparing for this in advance? It's a great relief that everything is finally happening as he predicted before. The man with the bald head exclaimed that he knew this all sounded stupid, but he understands that this is all the absolute truth, in fact. The main character listened to the man very carefully, thinking what to answer. He began to say that there was a misunderstanding. It's not that it's hard for him to believe what he told Dr. Smilov. He's just not as surprised as one might expect. Kang said that he had foreseen this. Smilov was very surprised and wanted to find out more. Kang began to explain that, after all, this was not the first time an asteroid had crashed into the Earth. The Cretaceous Paleogene extinction also occurred due to a meteorite fall. Smilov asked if that was why he wanted to build a space shelter, to which Kong asked if people shouldn't have a place outside the atmosphere in case things get worse. However, he assumed that this day would come. Smilov thought that the boy was much bigger and a dreamer than expected. Just think, he only got this far because of the idea of destroying the Earth. Well, wait a minute, he was right in the end. Is he really just a dream, or can he see the future? Still, Dr. Smilov thought that this sounded rather stupid. He said that if the main character expected this, then he would definitely work with them. Dr. Kong turned to the man and answered positively. 
he asked how he could refuse if the fate of all humanity was at stake. Then Dr. Smilov closed his eyes and exclaimed, turning to Dr. Kong, that he knew that the boy would finally agree. But the main character turns his head towards the doctor and told him that he has one condition, more precisely two conditions. The first is that he wants to lead the construction of the shelter. Secondly, at least half of those who will be evacuated will be chosen by him personally. Meanwhile, at the meeting, a gray-haired man asked if he could be persuaded to abandon these demands. Dr. Smilov replied that he thought it was impossible. He spoke as if he was giving in to them, but he wanted to include his family and employees on the list of evacuees. He doesn't think the boy will agree to other conditions. If you think about it this way, then complying with Dr. Kang's demands is still the best option. The gray-haired man asked why he thought so. To which Dr. Smilov explained that because the size of the shelter that Dr. Kong guarantees to build will be four times larger than what they can build. Plus, if they remove Dr. Kong, they will use the same resources he used to build the shelter. Then, they will not be able to build a shelter even half the size of the original project. The gray-haired man was very surprised and asked if he had heard correctly. Dr. Smilov answered that it was correct. They are faced with a choice between a shelter four times the size and half the size of the initial design. The gray-haired man asked if he wanted to say that they were so much worse than the main character. Don't they have the same devices as KNG? Dr. Smilov explained that this is so, but they have specialists who work on the devices, but they do not have such specialists. As far as he knows, KNG no longer has specialists in space construction. They all left when the space shelter project was abandoned. Now everyone is a specialist in Cosmos Cosmos, Dr. Kang's new company. Current King employees can't compete with Cosmos Cosmos technicians. Not considering the fact that they have Dr. Kang and he, in turn, is a visionary leader. If it weren't for them, they personally would have had a lot of mistakes and problems. Over time, they would certainly improve. Well, as they already understand, they don't have much time. Therefore, in this case, they will not cope without them. The gray-haired man told dear Dr. Smilov that this was exactly where he should have started. After all, they almost said something stupid to Dr. Kong. The female employee laughed and exclaimed that his demands were indeed reasonable. The man sitting next to her agreed with her, and he said that they could definitely agree to this. The gray-haired man asked Dr. Smilov to tell the main character that they agreed and he should begin work immediately. The doctor hesitated and the man asked what he was waiting for. The newspaper headline said that Dr. Chelso Kang had returned to KNG. Will this speed up his return to building a city on the moon? The KNG Space Development Corporation has asked its director to return to speed up the construction of a city on the moon. Dr. Kong announced that he was going to pave the way for a new lunar era by completing the construction of a city on the moon as soon as possible. The public thought that he returned to KNG because the ICCR had finally realized his importance. In the comments they wrote whether Chelso Kang really returned to KNG. It seems that it was not so easy for him to start all over again, and he agreed to work with them. If only KNG without Chelso Kang was worth anything to ICAR. Is Chelso Kang really such a pro? They wrote positively in response. Do they really think that after Dr. Kang returns, KNG's stock prices will rise again? In this case, we decided to hold our shares. He couldn't build a space shelter himself. People became very interested in what might happen to the project to build a city on the moon after the founder returned. However, all this was just a cover for them, to hide the truth from everyone. They focused all their efforts on building a space shelter. Point Largange L-12 Earth Moon is a point of gravitational constancy. The employee asked Miss Kim why she was waiting so long. We need to quickly bring the necessary materials. It slows down construction. The man was very worried and nervous why everything was taking so long. The girl asked if they had gone crazy because it was very dangerous. But they replied that they needed to buy a new batch in bulk. At first, it was too fast. It was necessary to slow down. The girl exclaimed that she was not fast. She just needed to back up. But something was wrong. Everything collapsed. The main character asked what the damage was and if they could leave everything as it was. The girl replied no, because she was told that she would have to replace parts that broke during the collision. 
Dr. Kang asked what the delay would be in this case, to which Dr. Smilov replied that about 10 days. Replacing parts will take more than six hours, but the loss of one of the operators disrupts the work schedule due to cleaning and the destruction of sanitary facilities. He began to list many points and ended with the fact that this all adds delay time. The boy closed his eyes, listening to what the doctor said. Kang said they may ask employees to work overtime until they find a replacement. They will deal with the clouds when they construct the ship. He thinks that he will go and assess the sanitation situation himself. Dr. Smilov followed the boy and asked if he could really fix everything himself. Kang asked if they could draw him a map showing the location of the collision and the location of the wreckage. The doctor asked if everyone heard what the main character said, and I asked who had the data. He gave instructions to immediately send everything to Dr. Kong. He asked the guy if he really wanted to change all the components that they were producing on the lunar base. Does he really have a list of necessary parts in his head? Dr. Kong replied that there is. After all, he himself saw how helpless they were in collecting parts made in other places. How could he change something? When the boy returned, Dr. Smilov asked if the problem had been solved. Kong explained that he had adjusted the construction request and now had to sort out the problem with the sanitary equipment. He is confident that once this is all sorted out, the process can be accelerated. Dr. Smilov asked if he could help with anything. The boy replied that he could make sure that all the equipment was ready for sending into space as soon as possible. Dr. Smilov replied that it was not difficult. He will ask the operator to work overtime until they find a replacement. Kong thanked the doctor for this. He answered the phone saying it was him, and he said on the phone that the number of working hours needs to be increased, and so the construction of the space shelter progressed. The main character thought that he would feel relief as soon as he completed the project of building a space shelter, still feeling the burden. The weight of disappointment is that he couldn't carry out his original plan, and the fact that Yumi is not there to board with him. The boy stood thoughtful. Someone asked him if he had finished his work, after which he walked around and chilled. It was Min Su. He told Dr. Kang something is cool here. He now understands why he likes it, to which the main character replied that he liked the view and he asked if he had come to say goodbye to him. Minsu responded positively and said that he was leaving tomorrow. He wasn't sure if they would have time to talk. Minsu said that he is sure that he does not need this goodbye because they will see each other if he does not return. Kong said that it was so, but he will not consider that the past and the present are the same person. The boy said, looking at the main character, that in this case he is Minsu 5 and there he will be Minsu 6. Kong exclaimed something like that. Min Su said that the boy answered as if he had already made up his mind. He told the guy that he could consider the next Min Su just a friend with amnesia. Kong said that there is something that distinguishes his past and his present. He just can't imagine how different this Yumi was from the last one. Min Su looked at him and asked how much. The main character explained that past Yumi always believed him when he asked her for help. But this Yumi was more difficult to convince. Minsu thought about it and replied that everything was clear to him. Therefore, it is easier for him not to consider them the same person. He had to say goodbye to the same people many times. Kong asked if he now understood why he did not want to tell him his secret. Minsu replied that he understood, not just because he thought he wouldn't believe him. It was also difficult mentally. The main character asked if it really looked like he was suffering. Minsu explained that if everything was fine, he would hardly have opened up to him. Kang said they were just talking about the asteroid. Minsu said that in fact, no. Instead of finding a plausible reason, he told him everything. This means that all this actually weighed on him. He thinks that the boy doesn't realize this yet. Even though the Kang perceive each person differently in each life, it is impossible to consider them completely different people. He cannot help but remember past lives when a person with the same face and style of behavior stands in front of him. Meanwhile, Rocket 23 is ready for takeoff. The boy thought that with every memory he remembered again that the person he knew was no longer there, and it tormented him. In addition, the more he thinks about how to behave with each person in order to get the desired reaction, the more he perceives people as mechanisms and it torments the rest of his soul. I wonder if this is how Min Su sees him. 
Weeks passed after Port David completed its task. It went from being a busy place to being a wasteland. The evacuees left Earth on rockets. Rocket boosters used many times were stored in a secret location to prevent misuse. Now there was only one rocket left in Port David to transport the remaining people. These people remained to continue to play their role as leaders of humanity. One of them, sitting in a spacesuit, said that it was worse than he thought. The gray-haired man asked what he was worried about. After all, he won't feel anything. It's no different than a roller coaster ride. The man replied that he knew, but they were not young. He remembers the last time he rode a roller coaster. And he exclaimed that, thank God, Dr. Kang is alive. What would happen if we imagined that he died then? The man asked and closed his eyes, lowering them down. The gray-haired man asked not to talk about it. He is sure that Dr. Kang would like the accident not to be remembered. The man agreed with him. He forgot that radio communications are open to everyone. And he asked Dr. Kong for forgiveness. The boy replied that everything was fine. The preparations are completed, and he closes the hatch. The man thought that he would need to apologize to him again when they arrived at the Ark. In any case, the man closed his eyes and thought that he was really very glad that Dr. Kong was alive. Some time passed. The gray-haired man asked if he had fallen asleep, and he asked if anyone could hear him. The guy who was next to him asked if anyone was here and what was happening. He asked why he was tied up. The gray-haired man was also surprised how it was connected. He felt the same. Another employee woke up and asked what the noise was. They're still in space. It's all kind of strange. The gray-haired man said that he would like to remove his seatbelt and asked if this could be done. When he opened his eyes, he saw that he was closed in a flask and tied. The man opposite asked Daniel why he was also tied up. Daniel, in turn, asked Alexi what was going on. After all, the boy was also tied up while in this flask. The gray-haired man exclaimed that he did not know who he was, but asked him to stop doing such things. At least they have an idea of who they are. The man shouted that this was completely outrageous. Does he think he can get away with this? And he asked for their immediate release. Then the boy turned to them and told the respected IKR administration that they must have slept very well. The bound, gray-haired man saw Dr. Kang on the big screen in front of him. He immediately indignantly asked what was happening on the Ark. The guy who was also tied up said it didn't look like an Ark. He holds the papyrus that are still on the ground. The gray-haired man turned in his direction and said that they had boarded the ship, to which the guy replied that they don't remember taking off. The man asked who could have dropped them off. Who could it be? Turning to the screen to the main character, the guy exclaimed that he knew that they had staged an accident. Kong said that he thought for a long time about how to reciprocate for what he had done. And this seemed to him the best way. The gray-haired man said that nothing should have pointed to them. Kang explained that this was the case at first, but the deeper he dug, the more evidence he received, and he said that they were greedy. If they only wanted his company, he might never have thought that they were behind that accident. Then the haired man came here and apologized to Dr. Kang and he said that it was necessary to more persistently dissuade them when his colleagues first started talking about taking the company away from him and about what they will gain from his accident. He was powerless to prevent it, and so he made the most of it. He hopes that the boy understands him. Then the second gray-haired man turned his head in his direction and exclaimed that this was all nonsense. After all, it was he who proposed such a plan. The other man asked not to listen to him. After all, it was he who proposed the plan and killed his girlfriend. The bald man said he was just an innocent bystander. In fact, this is a gray-haired man-leader, who said in turn I turned to Kong that he does not need to be reminded that the ICCR is an organization that is managed by more than one person. So why does he think they want to make him a scapegoat? Of course, because he was the only one who did not agree with the plan. They offer it to him in exchange for pardon. Kong thought that they could fall so low. This will be useful knowledge if he remembers it in his next life. Kong said that they took KNG to save Ikar. He thinks that means they only wanted the rights to the moon. The gray-haired man replied that when it became known that a private company was moving in the direction of development on the moon, the ICRC began to lose ground. More and more people began to believe that a private company would do the job, that it would be better to finance them instead of having an international organization an organization where all countries could share the fruits of their labors with each other. The CCIR could still exist as a symbol of international cooperation, 
but they had no influence. There were only subordinate organizations. Well, if only they had the rights to the moon and also development technologies. The gray-haired man moved his eyebrows to his nose and said that in that case it would be a completely different story. They could consider themselves an independent organization, free from politics. They could grow as a new force, and the moon would be their territory. Therefore, his colleagues resorted to this plan. Kang asked, in that case, wouldn't the promise of sufficient profit be enough? What could he offer to satisfy the ICCR? They should have given them a chance to invest in their company. They should have warned them right before they successfully developed reusable missiles. If they did that, many in the ICRC would take their side. Because, frankly speaking, for them, working in the interest of the organization is the same as working in personal interests. The main character asked if they couldn't just combine their shares with Ikear just to take over the KNG company. The gray-haired man explained that the management structure of their company made this impossible. A separate parent company had to be created to operate KNG. Then he would have the overwhelming majority of the shares. He could give a large percentage of the shares to those he trusts. So getting rid of one or more people would not cause stock prices to plummet. Thus, it would be too risky for them to target their company. The parent company of KNG is led by Chelso, also important links to Yumi and Yunsu. The man said that in all honesty they were too naive when it came to running the company. He is sure that he just wanted to take care of his friends by giving them a larger share. But the management of the company should not be based only on this. The gray-haired man said that Ikar needed to help and save his face. You had to let them do something, let them contribute to the research. There was no need to remove them from the councils because they thought they could handle it themselves. The main character replied that he would try to remember it. The gray-haired man asked what exactly to remember. Then they heard some sound. Did he release some strange gas? What kind of nonsense is this? Kang replied that he doubted they would understand even if he told them about it. But when they come to their senses, they will understand that they cannot even bite their own tongue, and they will be in such a state when Rama collides with the ground. IV therapy will keep them breathing. The guys in the flasks immediately closed their mouths so as not to breathe this gas. The main character said that they would still remain sane. It's all great to understand what's happening to them. They will witness the inevitable destruction of the Earth by an asteroid that will fly to Earth. The boy recalled how he and Yumi climbed the slope, and she said that she was very tired. The girl asked if they needed to run away, then the world would end soon. Yumi thought it all sucked. She would rather watch the end of the world while sunbathing somewhere on a yacht or on the beach. In front of him was a jar of juice. The boy closed his eyes and lowered his head down. This moment has always been so long. I wish it would go faster. When this life ends, he can. And then the main character opened his eyes again, waking up in his bed. They opened the door to his room and said it was time to get up. His mother woke him up again so that he would not be late for school. But she saw her son lying with a fever. Min Su told Yumi that Kong had not been at school for a week. He must be seriously ill with something. Their friend suggested they visit him. Min Su said that he had already offered him, but the boy told him not to come. He says it's just a cold. He doesn't want them to get infected. Yumi was very surprised that the main character answered him. The girl immediately got angry. She began calling the boy names and told her friends that he was ignoring all her messages and calls. Yumi sent him voicemails. She asked if he was sure that he didn't want them to come. She is very worried about him, and she asked him to write to her when he felt better. Is he really so sick that he can't even check the message? Why doesn't he answer? Did he really break his fingers? Is he deliberately ignoring her? Then the main character again received a message on his phone. It was written there that he and Minsu were already approaching his door. The boy actually heard a knock on his door. When Minsu came in, he said that he didn't look very good. Apparently, he's really still sick. Yumi approached the window and asked the boy what really happened. Kong replied that he most likely overworked himself. Yumi asked if he couldn't write to her about this. He just doesn't understand how worried she was. The boy's mother came into the room and asked the boys if they wanted something to drink. She offered them juice. Minsu immediately rushed to help Mrs. Kong. She said that it was not worth it, but the boy still insisted. I said that he helps very well, leaving the main character and Yumi alone. 
The girl turned her head in his direction and said that he could rest as much as he needed if necessary. He and Min Su would sort out all the space development stuff while he recovered. The boy thought about what it feels like to see people risen from the dead. But he can't be happy about it. He definitely missed Yumi. Well, now I know everything that happened, then he can't look at her. In fact, he thinks it would be better if she left. The girl looked questioningly at Kong. He said, looking into her eyes, that it seemed to him that he no longer needed her. Now he has Min Su. Yumi was very surprised, and looking into his eyes said that he was talking some kind of nonsense. Why would he suddenly do this? Looking at him, the girl asked again if he had returned from the future, to which the boy replied that yes, and he saw the end of the world again. Yumi said that he was acting very strange. A couple of months ago, he came to her and said that he could not stop the asteroid without her help. Does he really think that she will believe that he suddenly doesn't need her anymore? He got Minsu involved because he said her money wasn't enough to build a space shelter. And now he says that he no longer needs her. The girl asked if he even understood what he was talking about. She doubts it. After all, the main character is definitely out of his mind. The girl approached the boy and asked him to tell him what really happened to him. Yumi did not stop and ask the main character to tell him what happened to him. Minsu entered the room carrying a tray of tea. Looking at his friends, he exclaimed that he too would like to know what was really happening. Yumi laughed and asked what he meant. After all, they didn't talk about anything so important. The main character turned to the boy and said that everything was really as he had heard. He is living this life again for the sixth time. The boy was not at all afraid and said that it was simply incredible. Were the druids right? This boy was as strange as the main character and his friend Yumi. He exclaimed that this is all part of the life cycle. And what happens to the main character is one of his many forms. Yumi, looking at Min Su, asked Kong if he was sure that it was possible to initiate him into the secret. Kong replied that of course he was sure. After all, he himself told him last time that if he had told him the truth when they were younger, he would have believed him. The girl got angry and asked if he really wanted to tell Means everything when he wanted to throw her out but still he must explain himself on this matter. The girl did not let up and asked why he suddenly wanted her to leave. What happened in his past life? Yumi said that she would not budge until he gave her a reasonable explanation. Kong sat on the bed with his head down. The girl clenched her fists and walked towards the main character's bed. She kept asking what went wrong. Then the main character began to say that everything was going smoothly for them. They successfully created reusable rockets, even built a space station like a base on the moon. All that remained was to build the space shelter that they had planned to build from the beginning. But some became more and more envious of them the closer they got to building a base on the moon. The management of the IKR wanted to make a profit from the construction of a base on the moon, so they stood in their way. As a result, the space shelter received several times less than they had planned. Minsu exclaimed that all this does not explain why he wants to drive Yumi away now, if Iker wanted to keep him as he progresses, doesn't Yumi become more important? He also wondered why the boy wanted to kick the girl out. The main character grabbed his blanket and remembered everything that happened to them then. And yet he decided and answered his friends that it was all because Yumi died. This was during his last attempt. As they worked hard to build a space shelter, those who wanted to remove them planned her death. The girl listened to the boy very carefully. Streams of sweat ran down her face. Kong said that now he must act differently in the future. He doesn't know what awaits him, but as long as Yumi is with him, she won't die at their hands again. He's too dangerous to mess with. Minsu escaped danger because he was not directly involved with the company he and he ran. But he wants Yumi to leave this time, because it's too dangerous for her. The girl immediately clenched her fists and called the boy an idiot. In the end, everyone died. She died while helping him either from an asteroid or from old age. She will die like everyone else. What if she dies? After all, if they don't stop the asteroid, it will still kill her. Aren't they the same thing? He simply has no choice. The girl explained that it was not their choice. And taking the main character by the chest, she approached him. She exclaimed that if he wants to stop the asteroid and save the Earth, then he definitely needs her. Well, even if it costs her life, she asked if he was out of his mind to which the boy replied that this is how it is, he needs to rest more. The girl lowered her head and said that she could not speak for Yumi from a past life, because technically they were different people. But she thinks that Yumi would be glad that she could help him. 
The boy listened to her carefully with his head down. He recounted to them the events of his past life in more detail, including the accident with Yumi. Minsu said that these people do not deserve forgiveness. How can you kill someone out of pity? They will definitely pay for it. The main character exclaimed that this is not necessary. After all, he made sure they got what they deserved when he came out of his coma. This time, they only need to take care that they do not decide to act in the same way. And if possible, it would be useful to win them over to their side. They need to use all possible resources. The girl asked if he knew how to get them to cooperate with them. Kang replied that he knew because they gave him an idea. It won't be easy at all, but they were ready to say anything when they were pushed. Yumi said that this time they should definitely succeed. She was sure that she was ready to help the boy at any cost. She meant the space shelter. The main character exclaimed that he knew about it, and this time they definitely won't screw it up. He will do this once and for all. When Minsu went outside, he asked Yumi if she was okay. She looked at him questioningly. Then the guy explained that anyway, she had just heard that she had been killed. The girl explained that she was of course scared, but she was most worried about Chelso and not about herself. And now twenty years have passed. The main character thought that his memory was telling him that he needed to change something to make it work, possibly shock absorber material, or change something in the cooling system. He went through everything, hoping to understand what to do. Someone called the main character. He immediately answered the call and Dr. Kang was told something. He replied to let that person in. This is an important guest. A gray-haired man walked into the office and told Kang that he was interested in seeing the workplace of a man who runs a private space development company. I must say that this is better than he imagined, the gray-haired man said, holding his hands in his pockets. Kang, in turn, was reading something. Then he exclaimed that he had finally found it. The issue was what needed to be added to the cooling system between the double heat shield. He ran somewhere. The man at that time sat down on a chair and watched the boy. Kong in turn apologized, and he said that it was rude of him to make him wait. The man replied that not at all. It was as if he was witnessing a historical moment. It reminded him of Archimedes' Eureka story. However, his proposal for financing KNG, he would like to inquire whether this proposal is still valid. The boy replied that he was. The man said that based on what he sees at the moment, society is right in believing that he is on the verge of creating reusable rockets. It seems he no longer needs investment. The main character said that financially the man is right, and I thought that in this case he needed connections. The gray-haired man exclaimed that now he understands that there is no reason to worry, and he asked what share the boy wanted to sell him. Kang replied that it was about half a percent. The man asked at what price. Kang replied that the latter was the over-the-counter price. The man thought this proposal was amazing. The amount spent will be immediately returned fivefold. He could earn even more once the company goes public. At this price, he thinks he can buy 2%. Kong said he fears the company's future profitability will be too great to allow him to sell more at such a low price. He asked whether half a percent would be enough. The value of this share will increase by what? No, a thousand times. Kang asked to accept his proposal as it is. The man was surprised how it would increase so much. Then the boy handed him a notebook containing a plan. The man said that he did not know that their company was working on anything other than reusable rockets. And he said that he would look at reusable rockets. He began to read what was written there about automated robots, also about the space station, and even about the formation of the moon and the construction of a base on the moon. It even wrote about a space shelter. The man exclaimed in surprise at what big plans the main character has. Kong said that he is not the kind of person who takes lightly the various areas of knowledge necessary to carry out the plan. He knows it won't be easy enough, but he is confident that everything will work out. The gray-haired man said that he did not think that he was offering him this half a percent because he demanded something from him. He thinks that the main character wants to enlist his help in the future, and he pointed his finger at the boy's plan. Kong replied that, to be honest, he made this offer to get to know him better. But it would be untrue if he said that enlisting his help was not one of his intentions. Then the man said that in this case he could ask him for a little more. And raising his hand up, he asked, How about one percent? Kang replied that he was already generous by half a percent. He is afraid that if he gives more percentage, it will affect the company. The man leaned over to the boy again and asked, 
How about selling him 1%? He will hold half as a sign of their partnership. And a year after the company becomes public, it will sell half of it to him. The main character thought that he wanted quickly and profit. Still, he is greedy. Then the boy said that if a man wants to promise such a thing, he sees no reason to refuse. In this case, he raises the offer to 1%. But he, in turn, must fulfill his part of the deal and sell him half a percent back. As a result, he managed to meet with all the leaders of the ICCR. These were the same people who in his previous life told him that in order to cut profits, KNG would make them allies. Communication with these people was far from pleasant. It wasn't their employee who asked if they could at least lower the price if they couldn't offer a larger share. After all, he was asking for too much, and his stock prices had risen over the past three months. A female employee said that it's difficult for her to invest now, and she asked if they could give her preferential rights to purchase in the future at the current price. After all, she doesn't want to take risks. Another employee said that if he couldn't offer him more shares, he wanted the guy to show him sincerity in another way. His nephew has company. He'd like the guy to list him as his supplier and they purchased goods from him at a price higher than the market price. Then he will have his full support. The gray-haired man also said that they are now partners, and he asked if he could share inside information from time to time so that he could earn money from the outside. He assures that no one will ever know about it. Everything will remain between them. The main character thought that none of them accepted his initial conditions. They made their demands to varying degrees, and he had to rack his brains to satisfy their greed. The man laughed as he left and said that it was nice to talk with Dr. Kong. The boy told him that he was looking forward to his support. Then suddenly Yumi and Minsu came to him, who brought food for them. The girl asked him to eat with them. Minsu said that he has full confidence in this game, and he added that they would be the first to try it after his scientists. He assures him that it tastes like real meat. The main character approached the microphone and exclaimed that today is a holiday, and I asked those around me if they agreed on this. The people immediately answered yes. When KNG announced their plans to open a third space center in Toosville, it was shown on TV. Kong said that today they are starting a new era. What they have achieved so far opens the door to space exploration for humanity, and along with the company's mission. Their next target will be heading into space. There, they will build a space station that will serve as a starting point for the colonization of the moon. Once they achieve these two goals, space will become their second home. The main character explained to those around him that he had already done so much, so he promised that he would achieve all the goals they had set. So he asked his employees to continue to believe in him and join his journey, after which he thanked everyone who listened to him. The presenter asked what comes to people's minds when they hear about the KNG Space Development Corporation. Most likely, they know about them as the company that invented reusable rockets. However, that won't soon be the only thing that defines this company. Because KNG began operations on the KNG-1 space station, located in low Earth orbit. The KNG-1 space station is outstanding for several reasons. One reason is the innovative use of centrifugal force to create artificial gravity. Long term, humanity will soon return to the moon. KNG today announced that they will be working with ICAR to create a research base on the moon that will also serve as a resource base. Two organizations plan to colonize the Earth's satellite. The base will be built on the south pole of the moon, and the first inhabitants have already been selected. KNG astronaut candidate Yong Su Guk was asked what his emotions were. The guy exclaimed that he was very excited. KNG definitely deserves its title at the forefront of space development. KNG has taken another huge leap in space development. After announcing the completion of a fully operational base on the moon, the company shared plans to expand the base into a city for human habitation. In addition, KNG announced that they will simultaneously pursue the company's long-term goal, namely the construction of a space shelter. What does it mean to open the door to the possibility of people living in space? The person in front of the camera said that this was all definitely true. They live in the era of Chelso Kong. Members of the company watched the news and listened carefully to what the main character and presenters said. The gray-haired man exclaimed what was wrong with him. Not only does he completely ignore them, but he also invests more in building a space shelter than a city on the moon. 
The man said that it is obvious that the latter will be much more profitable, not to mention how all this will affect the company's stock price. He discussed this situation with his employees. After all, they will not have to issue new shares in order to receive additional funds. The employees lowered their heads and closed their eyes. The gray-haired man asked why they were all silent. Aren't they angry that this guy is looking down on them when their influence has diminished while he earns his fame? Then the gray-haired man who was sitting with his eyes closed glanced at Petion and asked if he had read Dr. Kang's plan. If something doesn't suit him, then he should have said it earlier. It would be wrong for them to stand in the way of a person who is already at the finish line of achieving his goal. The plan aims to fit the present situation in the best possible way. Now, building a city on the moon is the best plan of action. The man said it was for him, but not for Dr. Kang. The bald man joined in the conversation and asked if Dr. Kong had said that a city on the moon was nothing more than a way to increase the value of shares. So he doesn't understand why the man is unhappy. Then the gray-haired Petion exclaimed, What about their shares? Do they really not care that the price will drop significantly if KNG is released again? The woman said that if he was worried about it, then let him sell them at three times the price and buy them cheaper. She understands that he was overcome by greed when he heard about the project on the moon. But the space shelter is not so profitable. In addition, Dr. Kang assured them that he would continue working on the city on the moon after the construction of the space shelter was completed. So why don't they wait? The man sitting at the table said that Dr. Kong personally compensated everyone for everything, and he has demonstrated his honesty many times already. However, they still haven't done enough to pay Dr. Kong for his gifts. Since they can be so unscrupulous and ask a person to give up his dream, Petion exclaimed that since dinner apparently had nothing more to discuss, he would go, after which the man said goodbye to his employees. The bald man asked how the meeting was, to which Petion replied that it makes no difference whether he attends it at all or not, and he added that he trusts them with the decision, until recently the increased demands were met, through full use of the space center in St. Tuzville and its possible expansion. However, there were limits to how much time and space could be used. Therefore, KNG, in collaboration with the CCIR, decided to build a new space center near St. Toosville. Meanwhile, some shooter was looking for a target, pointing a machine gun at the center of the company. He thought that from here he would not miss, so he needed to act without mistakes. He was told to get rid of Dr. Kong at any cost, but the guy with the gun could not find the main character. Well, he should have been here. The guy spent a long time looking for the main character after which he finally found the guy and pointed the gun barrel at him. Some helicopters began to fly over him, and the guy lowered his weapon, raising his hands up. In the meantime, Petion called him and asked if everything was ready, if everything worked out for him. Someone told him on the phone, asking if this should remove all doubts. Then he hung up. The man thought that this voice was quite familiar to him. Was it really Daniel? Then several guys began to come into Petion's office, one of them thanked the gray-haired man for saving them from the need to issue a warrant. After which, entering the room, they said that they were from the police, and they said that the man would have to go with them to the department. The main character asked on the phone how everything went. He was told that everything went smoothly, and that man was removed from the car after which he was arrested. He immediately thanked Director Klasky, the gray-haired man, for helping him. He exclaimed that his help was simply invaluable, and Director Klasky, in turn, advised the main character to be extremely careful and strengthen his security. Kong recalled that the director told him that he had a feeling that Petion wanted to cause him inconvenience. He explained that the man could come for him, after which they developed such a plan. The director exclaimed that he had done nothing of the sort. Didn't he detect the shooter from satellites? Kong said that in any case, Petion would not have fallen into the trap so easily if the director had not filled him in on the details of the ceremony. The boy explained that, to be honest, he recently had a bad dream. He thinks it was a sign. Director Klasky said that he didn't know the kid believed in such things. The main character said that he cannot help but believe because they are sometimes quite accurate. The director laughed and said that it was quite interesting. He asked what the boy was dreaming about. There may be some warnings. To which Kong replied that they were just restless dreams. He dreamed that an asteroid shaped like an American football was entering their solar system and heading towards Earth. 
This really bothered him, and the dream was very detailed. The largest axis of the asteroid was 160 kilometers, and the smallest was 80. Honestly, it was terrible. The director laughed and said that his health was affecting him greatly. He concluded that the boy works too much. He should take better care of himself. The main character agreed with Yumi. She approached the boy and asked if it would work. Kang put it on the phone and answered the girl that he didn't know. Well, that's what they said in the reports. In this life, he studied all the leaders of the ICCR as they studied him in his previous life. He collected as much information about them as he could, including details of their family members, the net worth and personalities of each. Yumi asked, who would have thought that she seemed so superstitious? She would never have thought looking at him. The boy explained that it is difficult to understand something about a person based only on his behavior. But now, they can only set traps. Then, Director Klasky returned the folder to his employee and said that this should be denied. The employee read to the director that the next proposal is from Dr. Smilov. He wants to study the recently discovered asteroid Rama. The director asked what to do in this case. It's quite expensive. The employee responded that the recent decline in space flights would make anyone question the usefulness of their agency. He thinks it's worth funding the event for the sake of public relations, even if their budget suffers. The director agreed with the boy. He said that we need to add this to the plans. The loan was approved. Yumi said that they want 30% of their shares in the base on the moon as collateral. For 10 years and they agreed to lower the interest rate by 80% from the standard. Yumi exclaimed that these were excellent conditions. Kong replied that she worked hard to achieve such a good agreement, but she could immediately agree. The girl said that this was nonsense. Even the terms of a loan can affect the value of a company's shares. People will become suspicious if she doesn't bargain. It may seem like they are almost done, but they don't know what will happen next. They can't be sure that everything will go according to plan. The main character said that everything would be fine. He was told that Dr. Smilov had come to see Director Klasky. Yumi asked if Principal Klasky was calling him again. The girl said that she was starting to be jealous, that he picks up the phone when he's relaxing with her. The main character said that he needed to talk to this man about the asteroid. Yumi said that he was too boring because she was just joking. After answering the call, he asked how Director Klasky was doing. The boy in turn replied that he was fine, except for the terrible dreams. He asked if he could ask what he was calling about, to which a very surprising answer followed. The director wanted to hear more about his dream. The main character asked the director. According to him, an asteroid he had written was discovered and it suddenly changed its direction. The director asked if the boy wanted to adjust the probe's trajectory because the asteroid suddenly changed course. Dr. Smilov said that they suspect that this phenomenon is explained by the shape of the asteroid. Well, this is just a hypothesis. The only thing he can be sure of now is that if Rama changes course, it will pass through the asteroid belt. Perhaps in the process, it will collide with other asteroids. So he recommends starting a new project and expecting it to happen. The director asked if he was sure about this. The doctor asked what he meant and began to wait for the man to answer the call. He asked if he could guarantee this. This asteroid will not change its course. The director told Kang that he still had doubts when he first learned about the asteroid. Well, when I heard Dr. Smilov's report, I decided that I needed to meet with him, and he asked the boy if he was a seer. He asked who he was. Then the main character answered the man that he had already lived in the future in a future where an asteroid destroyed the entire Earth. After which the boy laughed and said that if he had said something like that, the director would definitely not have believed him. In fact, his company studies asteroids as well. He explained that they had assembled a small team to help them build a space shelter, but they were able to detect the asteroid a little earlier thanks to better equipment. After calculating the asteroid's path, he decided they would need a contingency plan. But as he knows, his company does not have enough influence in this area, unlike Ikear. He thought that the director would not believe him if he said this directly. Therefore, I hoped that he would take a closer look if he saw such hints. The director asked if he really was in the future and did not have the gift of foresight. The boy asked how such illogical things could even exist. And I said that these are their calculations of the asteroid's path, and I handed some kind of magazine to the man. He added that they were confident that he would hit the ground. 
The space shelter they are building could become a place for evacuation, but with the current speed of construction, he is afraid that they will be able to finish the construction before the asteroid hits the Earth, but only if the KNG company and the ICKR company work together. With the full support of the CCIR, KNG will be able to speed up the construction of the space shelter. While the public was disappointed by this sudden collaboration, most saw it as a beautiful partnership between a private company and a public organization. They were in awe of how quickly human civilization was developing. And thus, the construction of a space shelter in orbit of the moon became instantaneous. More robots, more people, and more resources sent to the moon. All this began to expand and gain momentum. Construction progressed continuously thanks to the resources produced on the moon. As a result, the large-scale O'Neill cylinder with a capacity of 500,000 people was almost completed at the Lagrangian point L2, before news of the asteroid spread. Angular acceleration is complete. The current rotation speed is 0.32 revolutions per minute. KNG Space Center. The mass of both cylinders is 1,005 kilograms. No noteworthy structural distortions were found. No problems were found with the internal ventilation system either. Looks like they sent a team of explorers to make sure that everything works according to the protocol. It was a clear success. They finally succeeded. They exclaimed that. And you no longer need to be afraid that they will all die. One of the employees began to cry, and the second asked him what kind of tears he had. After all, they knew that everything would work out. How could they fail when Dr. Kong is with them? The man replied that he was not crying. He was crying, as he noticed. They made a general conclusion that these tears are because they are simply happy. The main character raised his hand up and exclaimed that they did it. Port David Space Center. The Chosen Ones were evacuated again and flew into space. For some time, Port David was busy sending and receiving rockets, but soon the excitement subsided and the space center gradually lowered. Between the rockets and the people, there was only one rocket left for the last launch, and now preparations for its dispatch began. They announced that there were two minutes left. There is a disconnect from the service structure. The main character was in a spacesuit. His heart was beating loudly. His partner Yumi's heart was also beating loudly. She took the boy by the hand and asked him not to worry because she would be next to him. The main character thought that he was finally able to live his life and not come back. Despite many attempts, everything happened at the same time. The time he lived with the new one and again. Knowing that this cycle is finally coming to an end is exciting in itself. But he feels much better because Yumi is with him. And then the countdown began. Four, three, two, one, zero, and the rocket rose up. The boy wondered why he was upset. The girl held his hand, and so they began to rise up holding hands. As soon as the last evacuees left the Earth, nuclear warheads were released around the world. Aimed at artificial satellites in low orbit, various launch sites and rocket production facilities in each country. This was done to prevent people from trying to escape into space. The structures were destroyed, so rockets could no longer be built or launched, while the satellites were destroyed in order to create a shield of debris around the Earth, in case the people remaining on Earth will somehow be able to build a rocket and fly away. Public unrest was inevitable once the truth came out, but the ground was completely closed in order to avoid retribution. Director Klasky said that everything went according to plan, and he said that they were now completely safe. Morning came, the main character got up, cleaned himself up, and went down the elevator to his workplace. The employees immediately greeted him, and they asked if he had taken some beer with him from planet Earth. The boy was holding a bag of sandwiches and a can of beer in his hands. One of the employees asked whether beer was on the list of prohibited products. The second replied that it was because it was not necessary. Then Kong smiled and explained to the guys that he had brought it with him secretly. He knew that today he would need to drink. One of the guys was surprised and asked if he was breaking his own rules. The second one said that food and drinks were not allowed in the control room. The third asked if he only took one can with him. If they were already breaking the rules, then they should have taken it too. Kong said that next time he will bring them something tasty, and he asked for forgiveness for this. They said that they would forgive him, but only this time. Then the guys said that he had better treat them with something tasty, to which the boy immediately agreed. Rama will impact the ground in three minutes. The main character looked at a huge monitor with various circuits. 
He held a can of beer in his hands and thought about why he was trembling when opening it. Why is he so tense? The boy began to open a can of beer and was very worried. Since before he was always reborn, he thought he should have felt relief. And finally I opened the jar. Kong couldn't understand why he was worried then because it was all over. All that remains is to move forward. An asteroid enters the atmosphere. There was a collision with an asteroid. The main character opened a can of beer and began to drink from it. And then there was some kind of explosion again. The boy opened his eyes and found himself in his room. A shiver ran through his body. He couldn't understand why this happened again. The boy couldn't understand why he came back again. He began to remember how they took off and ended up on another planet. Closing his eyes, he thought that this could not be a dream. Did he misunderstand his mission? Until now, the goal he kept in mind was to save as many people as possible. But he was forcibly returned to the past. Approaching the mirror, the boy thought that most likely he had misunderstood his goal. He wanted someone to tell him why he came back. He could not understand why he was sent back. Looking at the sky, he asked for an answer, wondering what they wanted from him. Yumi asked while sitting at a bus stop with the main character whether it all ended as he said, to which the boy replied that yes, that's exactly it. When he opened his eyes, he was here again. Everything happened as usual. Yumi said that she told him to tell her immediately when he returns from the future. The boy apologized and said that he did not hide it. It was as if his head was empty. He didn't know what to do next. Yumi said that he managed to build a space shelter, even seeing from space how an asteroid crashed into the Earth, and I asked why, in this case, he returned again. The boy began to explain that he didn't understand this either. When he woke up after the collision, he was back in his room. Then the girl began to think and asked what if something else happened. She said it was just a guess. And she asked what if the blast wave of the asteroid was so huge that it destroyed the space shelter. But he said that Rama is an unusual asteroid. He also said that it seems somehow artificial. What if it's actually an alien weapon? Moreover, it is so powerful that it destroys everything around, including the space shelter. Could this be possible? The main character grinned and thought that he had never thought about this. But this particular option sounds very plausible. Also, given the appearance and trajectory of movement, it cannot be ruled out that it is artificial. This destructive force can instantly destroy L2. These may be creatures unknown to mankind. And if something interacted with him during the explosion, it could return him to the past. Kang immediately said thank you to Yumi. She said that her theory was completely crazy. Kang exclaimed that there was still a possibility. Yumi said that she was doing research in this area. She thought it would help her with brainstorming or data analysis. The boy exclaimed that he was glad that she was doing this. And he said that if her theory was correct, then the basic principles of the last attempt should be followed. He thinks some details need to be changed. First, reduce the size of the space shelter, in order to reduce cost. Then the boy thought and said that it was necessary to concentrate on the main thing. And then, 20 years later, the KNG Space Development Corporation has once again left its mark on the history of space exploration. The TV presenter said that this time the company hopes to send people to Mars. Their non-reporter Sori Heo is already there. The reporter said that right now he is on the KNG space station. He sees what previously could only be imagined. Behind him they see a space shelter called a space city. An amazing sight. He himself is still in shock. As soon as the main checks are completed, the space city will begin to accept passengers and travel to Mars. The space city will be located in the orbit of Mars. It will be a platform for future exploration of the Red Planet and the preparation of shelters for all humanity. Kong told Yumi to be careful, to which the girl replied that he sounded like they would never see each other again, and she asked him to better try to fly to them, because if it doesn't arrive. The girl paused a little and added that if he didn't arrive, she would hate him until the end of her days. The main character answered someone's phone. There was a guy named Taihu in touch. He said he needed to talk to him. The boy asked if he wanted to increase the engine power and change the characteristics of the drilling machine. Taihu asked why. Does he really want to ruin something that is already working? Stronger doesn't mean better. The current configuration is the most efficient, and the engine will last longer. Taihu asked what the problem was with the drilling machine. She is powerful and strong. 
This is too weak for a drill rig. Why does he want to suddenly change everything? After which the guy opened his eyes and told him not to say that he had been reborn again. He wondered if this was because the installation was not built by his company. Kong responded that KANG, unlike CCIR, does not force people to buy their products. Taehu asked if he thinks he doesn't know how he and the head of the IKR help each other. Take this research center, for example. Didn't he open it to provide them with missiles? The main character replied that this was precisely one of the goals of their cooperation. The guy exclaimed that he finally admitted it, and he asked to be released in this case. Hasn't he done enough for him as his friend? Why is he doing this to him? Maybe stop exploiting your friends. The boy thought that this was expected. He doesn't think the guy will understand anything if he tells him the truth. Taehu said that Yumi runs after him like a dog. She only flew away because he used her for money. Minsu was left with nothing after investing in it. Is it really his turn now? Taehu exclaimed that this would not happen. He will not allow him to manipulate him. Then the main character, taking the guy by the hands, said that an asteroid was approaching the Earth. The guy asked if the asteroid was definitely approaching. Kang, looking at him, answered honestly that this is why he needs his help. Rama is an almond-shaped asteroid, with the largest axis of 160 kilometers and the smallest of 80. Frankly, there are reasons to believe that this is an alien device or weapon created by antimatter. Its destructive power is great enough to take over the Earth and destroy everything including the Moon and Lagrange. Taihu began waving his hands and saying that the boy wanted to deceive him. Does he really think he's an idiot? What kind of aliens or antimatter could there be? Did he seriously think that he could believe this? Kong replied that he was really serious. Taihu called him names and said that he couldn't go back to the past. The main character said that he knows that it's hard to believe, but it's really true. He's been back there six times already, and now he lives for the seventh time, and all in order for him to stop the asteroid. The guy laughed in response and said that the story was becoming more and more interesting. Aliens, time travel, there will also be further reincarnation or something. Tehu was sarcastic and asked if God had really warned him that humanity was in danger. He is sure that God did just that. This is probably why he has been so interested in space development since childhood. Therefore, he built a colony on the moon, builds a space shelter, and also evacuated Yumi and Minsa. After which, after thinking, he said that this makes some sense. Of course, it is very strange to admit that an asteroid approaching the Earth is an alien weapon. Nothing explains how he ignores symmetry and Lorentz invariance while traveling through time. But he carries out his crazy plans almost perfectly and is ahead of schedule. He knows all the right answers because he encountered them completely in the future. The boy thought that this really explained his incredible expertise in various fields of science. Moreover, it is a delightful story. Leaning towards the boy, he asked why he told him about this only now. It should have been told from the very beginning. Then Kong asked if they believed him now. Tehu replied that this really explains a lot. For example, why Yumi and Minsu flew to Mars, and why he insisted on being on the development team. The main character exclaimed that he thought the boy would never believe that he was moving in time. Taihu wondered if it was because he was studying theoretical physics. The guy laughed in response and exclaimed that he knew nothing at all about his friend. Among them, Kong has the most outstanding scientific thinking. Now he understands why he wants to increase engine power. This will reduce the travel time to the asteroid. And he understands why change the drill to a regular stone drill. He also added a manned module to the probe. Although he can't take all the credit. After all, Kang helped him with the development. However, he understands why he wanted to hide the umbrella. Leaning towards the project, he paused a little. Kang asked if everything was okay. He stood next to his comrade, holding a marker in his hand. Taihu said that it's not about the project at all, and in something else. The main character asked what. The guy gave him a very strange, exciting look. Streams of sweat ran down his face. He asked if it was single or was it a probe. Meanwhile, the news anchor reported that Radmanis, a probe built by the CCRC in collaboration with the KNG Space Development Corporation, is finally ready for launch. And today, Dr. Odeli Arquette will share the details with them, researcher at the Joint Research Institute that developed the space probe. The presenter thanked the doctor for coming. Odalie replied that she was glad to be here.
The presenter asked if she could tell them what task the Rhodomantis would perform. The woman replied that Rhodomantis should go to Europa, one of the satellites of Jupiter. She continued to explain, What is most likely is that Europa is suitable for life in their solar system. Well, the girl didn't have time to continue when the presenter immediately cut her off. She said that they had received news that the Rhodomantis space probe had been launched. One of the assistants said that they would now show the video sent to them by KNG. The presenter thanked Dr. O'Delly for coming. The woman, in turn, thanked her for the invitation. The correspondent said that it looked very cool. They did a tremendous job. It is better to build a rocket or probe directly in space. It was Chelso Kang who created another masterpiece. In the correspondence, they answered that he was the only one who thought it looked like computer graphics. Something is clearly wrong here. Did he really have the nerve to say that something created by a world-famous scientist was a montage? I bet he's unemployed and living in a basement. The answer was whether he really thinks the Earth is flat. I'm texting Taihu for a second. I thought that they had figured them out. And he said that some people are too fast. Meanwhile, the main character said that the control system of the mini-satellite needs to be checked. Sub-M. That's what the guy used to say. Drilling rig control system. The guy sitting next to him at the control panel began checking. He turned to Kang and said that everything was fine. He needed to fasten his seatbelts. He asked if the boy knew what the initial acceleration would be. Kang replied that, of course he knows. Who does he think developed all this? The guy bowed his head down, closing his eyes and said that in this case they would start the engine. He asked everyone to get ready, and in a few seconds they will launch. Taihu told the main character that this life is very interesting and very unpredictable. After which the engine started, Taihu, sitting in his spacesuit, laughed and exclaimed that this is exactly what he was talking about. The boy had incredible emotions. Just recently he asked the main character why the probe was single seat. Kong told him that this was for security reasons. If possible, he would not put anyone in danger. In addition, this way the probe will move at higher speeds and with less cost and load. Taihu said that he understands the security issue, but does not understand everything else. What if there is an accident and something happens to him? Taihu explained to him before the flight that more people were needed there. More people, more areas can be reached. What if something happens during the probe landing? After all, he may die due to something that could have been prevented if there had been more people on board. What if the asteroid can't stand it while he's digging or something else? He thinks that he will have a better chance of success if he stops trying to solve all the problems on his own and invites someone else. He advised taking people with you and stop hoping for a time loop. To which the main character replied that the boy was really right, and he invited him to fly with him. Tehu wanted this but asked why he suddenly decided so. Kong replied that before their conversation he was determined to fly alone, but now he has changed his mind. Taihu said that the emulsion is sitting because he trusts it. Well, does he understand that he is asking him to risk his own life? Kong replied that now he is the only one he can ask. Will he fly with it to the asteroid? If it becomes clear that they will redirect it, they will turn it to Mars. And in truth, he cannot imagine a better candidate than him in solving the problems with the Rama asteroid. After all, he is a unique kind of genius. Taihu coughed and said that if the boy wanted to suck up, he could have done it better. Kong replied that he is the best person he knows, so he asks to help him. Then his friend immediately agreed, but he said there was some problem. Two is too few. It is necessary for at least one more person to fly with them. Even during the Apollo mission, the crew consisted of at least three people. Kang said that he would like someone else to fly with them. Well, he simply doesn't know who else he could trust so much. Instead of hiring someone else and jeopardizing the mission, he would rather fly with just them. Taihu asked if he could recommend anyone. Then, extending his finger upward, he asked if he knew a boy named Yong Su, and he explained that this is an astronaut who works for him, Yong Su Guk. His father gave him this name because he believed that he could succeed if he knew Korean, English, and mathematics. The boy explained that despite his name, he personally prefers to study science and space in particular. Even as a boy, he said that he dreams of becoming an astronaut because he prefers to learn things from his own experience, rather than from books. He would like to be the first person to set foot on Mars, but this does not mean that he would like to live there permanently. His goal 
is to go where no man has gone before. The teacher asked if he said that he dreams of becoming an astronaut and flying to Mars. The boy answered yes, but he heard that in order to get to Mars, you need to be an expert in certain fields. Therefore, he wanted to study mechanical engineering and civil engineering at the same time. Additionally, being an expert in more than one field will increase his chances of being hired as an astronaut. Once he becomes one, he will learn to control the spaceship and will be able to fly on his own. He also wants to go into outer space. It seems to him that being in zero gravity is very cool. But that doesn't mean he doesn't like gravity. If it seemed to him that gravity was not cool, then he would prefer Mars. The teacher exclaimed that this was a wonderful dream. She would like to hear more, but she needs to let everyone speak. Yong Su asked when he should tell him more. The boy was very happy to see if he could continue when everyone told about themselves. I asked the teacher if this could be done after school, or tomorrow, or during lunch break. As a child, this boy was very talkative. Well, now he is a completely different person. Yong Su told Kang that he still couldn't believe that the guy had captured a probe that was supposed to be heading towards Europa. He said that the boy was more wealthy than he thought. The main character said that he did not have time to build another probe. Yong Su asked if he was sure about this, that Rama is an artificial asteroid. Roughly speaking, it seems to him that this is an object with which he can interact. Because there is definitely something artificial there from the surface features to the explosions he used. He doesn't think that one asteroid could have enough energy to destroy the Earth. The main character in this case thanked the boy for believing in Rama and time loops. Yong Su said that it would be cool if there was direct evidence, but it's not hard to believe judging by what he saw. Isn't this an adventure? The guy exclaimed that he was very glad to take part in this, and it doesn't matter where they go if he can leave it at that. He invited his comrades and companions to leave their mark on history and then fly back home. Meanwhile, the director reported that the asteroid had changed course. As expected, it is moving along the trajectory that Kong predicted with amazing accuracy. If he was right about the asteroid, then it cannot be destroyed. And its destructive power is much greater than it is estimated. This is just a real nightmare, said the director. He said that he would speed up construction and connect as many people as possible. He is confident that everything will work out if they stick to the detailed plan. After which, he passed out. Taehu said that it seems he will take back his words about being jealous of the main character's life. The countdown began again. Four, three, two, one, zero. The landing was successful. Kang exclaimed that they were off to a good start. He wants to reboot the SMS and notify Mars of their arrival. The boy asked Yong Su to release many satellites. Then he asked Taihu to switch the main screen to an infrared image. Taihu asked him to first look at this disgusting thing for which he came all this way. Young Su asked him to give him a minute. Taihu asked Kong if he was sure that the surface was covered with ridges and craters, like any other asteroid. In addition, gravity and pressure show that it is not made of metal. The circulation is random. No matter how it looks, it doesn't seem artificial to him. The main character answered no. Looking in front of him, the boy exclaimed that Rama was precisely artificial. The employee turned to the director and exclaimed that they were receiving a signal from Rama. Then she said that she was sending everything to the computer. They immediately rushed to the computer. The man said that he was Daniel and asked if he was talking to Dr. Kang. The answer came that it was indeed Dr. Kang. He reported that they landed successfully. The soil is more unstable than expected, so it is difficult to find a way to get inside. They request the help of geologists. Daniel turned to his employee and asked what he was waiting for, and he exclaimed that this was his chance. The doctor asked the main character if they were okay. Well, the boy replied that everything was really fine. All their requests will be fulfilled. And the preparation of the lunar city, as well as the rockets, is almost complete. He understood everything, so he will keep the chat open. Daniel said that the fate of humanity is now in their hands. Taihu said that Kong was right. The asteroid is indeed artificial. Yong Su said that they need to start research immediately. Taihu said that he would release the drones. The main character in turn closed his eyes and thought that let it be him. Let this be the answer to his question. Video broadcast from drones in the cavern shows a strange internal structure. The walls of the cavern, which serve as a ceiling according to the laws of gravity, 
are completely covered with these strange structures. They are smooth, translucent, geometric in shape, and it is unknown who made them and why. Whichever way you look at it, it seems that they are completely uninhabited. The main character asked Young Su if he could lower the drones a little. We need to understand the general topography more precisely. The guy began to do as Kong asked him, and he said that there seemed to be a gravitational anomaly. It interferes with the drone's movement. The main character was very surprised and asked what caused it. The boy didn't know the answer to this question. He didn't even know where to look for this answer. After which he changed abruptly as if he understood something. The guy said they seemed wrong. I think it's a nuclear bomb. Kang was very surprised by what the boy said just now. Is this asteroid core actually the engine? These structures are not dwellings, they are amplifiers. It could be an explosive or simply an engine component. The main character, tilting his head down, said that the blast wave reached the space shelter. Yong Su continued what Kong started to say, and he said that this was because something similar to the mass of the structure crashed into the ground. He asked the main character what they should do now. The boy explained that we need to find a control room and what else can be done in this case. Then the guy asked how they would do it, that is, they will definitely find it if they look hard enough, but they don't have much time. For now, they will start with one of the columns connected to the core. If they are dealing with an advanced alien civilization, then there is a high chance that there are clues to the most important compartments. Young Su said that he doesn't know if he is being too optimistic. Aliens may build things differently. They may be a millennium ahead of them. The guy was completely covered in sweat and said that this could really be the end for the Earth. The main character asked the boy not to worry. He sat with his back to him, apparently thinking how to explain all this. After which he turned and said that the second team would fire nuclear missiles at him. He foresaw everything in advance. Yong Su asked if the boy flew here thinking that he would die. Kong said that he would do anything to survive. Well, if there is no other way out, then he is ready to sacrifice his life. And he said that now, it's enough to talk. It is necessary to return to the probe and briefly tell Tay and the Earth what they discovered. You need rocket fuel for the drill and an extra drill. The guy asked the main character if he was sure that he didn't want to rest. Well, the boy replied that he was sure that he had had enough rest. There is little resistance when penetrating the core. He assumed that the columns were made of reinforced concrete, which was strong enough to compress and stretch. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case. Unlike the outer layers of the asteroid, which consist of soil, the columns are impenetrable. Kong thought as he touched them what they were made of. He is sure that even unknown alien material will not withstand 30,000 degrees. The main character said that if it cannot be drilled, then they can melt it. However, even after they drilled a hole deep enough for a hand to fit through, they still did not break through the column. The boy explained to everyone else that it would take forever. Standing in front of the hole on the column, he said that he thought this was a considerable axis, and he told Yansu that the drill needed to be changed. It hasn't worn out much, but he doubts it will last much longer. Also, trying to break through the minor axis would be a waste of time. Need to try the larger axis. After which he asked Teha if he wanted to stay in the probe. The guy replied that it was too boring not to see anything with his own eyes. All they left him with was sitting in this probe. Then the main character, looking at the boy, said that Yong Su was already waiting for him outside. Therefore, he can safely go to him. Tehu asked if they succeeded, but Kang simply asked him to put on the helmet. He said it was time to go inside. When they went inside through the broken hole in the column, the main character exclaimed that everything worked out for them because they broke through the column. Taihu asked if it was a tunnel. It seems these aliens are the size of people. Kong laughed and suggested to his comrade to widen the entrance. Taihu noticed that the main character needed to sleep. He said that the boy had already done enough and asked to leave it to him. When asked why, the guy replied that he had never rested before. They had already rested at least a little. He will enlarge the hole and Kong needs to take a nap. The boy still agreed. As he lay through the hole in the column, he noticed that his comrade was missing. He began to call Teha, ask if he can hear it. He couldn't figure out where he could be. Where could he have run away? After which I finally found my friend. He was in some kind of control room. The main character approached him and asked if he understood how it all worked. Is it possible to redirect an asteroid? Taihu replied that he had not found out yet. Well, he knows one thing for sure, and he asked the boy to look at it. When the main character looked, he said that they had been right all along. 
The asteroid is programmed to crash into the Earth. They watch this on a huge screen. Kong asked if it was really a bomb. Taihu replied that he thought it was most likely a spaceship, which is completely faulty. Kong asked why he thought that this ship was broken. Then his friend asked him to put his hand on him. Isn't this all amazing? It feels like you've got an extra brain. Kang replied that it is so. It feels like this brain is thinking on its own. The information was in his head before he could realize that it was the first time an alien computer was being used. This information greatly helped him understand the messages appearing near the pillars. These were error signals indicating that repairs were needed, like huge road signs warning that the controls are faulty. Nothing works. The main character, without removing his hand, thought about what they should do now. How can he change course? How can he free himself from repeating life? Taihu exclaimed, looking up somewhere and calling names at the aliens. He asked if they dumped their garbage on the ground. Do they really think that the Earth is a trash can? When the main character introduced strange creatures, in order to better understand them, other things appeared. It was like a dictionary. But since he couldn't read the words, he was completely useless. The boy began to drill something in this system. Taihu got scared and asked what he was doing. Why does he cut a hole? He can break it without him realizing it. Kong said that maybe they could do something if they connected to their computer. Taihu approached the boy, placing his hand on his back. He explained to the guy that he needed to return to the ship. Kong showed Young Su a video of their discovery and told him what happened. How they found the control room, still functioning, but to a limited extent. He told him that it was impossible to know anything for sure, because the asteroid was faulty and it was unknown how to fix it. The main character continued to explain to the boy that the only option is to destroy the core. Closing his eyes, he said that first he needed to rest. Yong Su asked if Kong thought it was still possible to interact with the Rama control system. Kang said that he couldn't say for sure, but if the device is still intact, then it's possible. There must be another way to connect it to their computer. Yong Su said that he knows experts in such things. If a person was well versed in his field, he would have heard about him to which the guy replied to the main character that she is not very famous, so he may not know about her. The guy asked if he remembered Yong He. Kong immediately remembered Yong He Min. Tehu screamed when he heard this name. They began to remember how the girl introduced herself in class. She stood in front of the class and said that she dreams of something. Well, I asked the teacher if this might be unrealistic. She said she could. After all, dreams don't always have to be real. And she asked the girl to continue. Talk about your dream. The girl stood in front of the class and began to talk thoughtfully. She said that she wanted to become an expert in terraforming. And here we have the Yong He Min Research Institute. The girl grew up and said that she thought that these factors could be attributed to noise. She said that she needed to add another filter. Then get the formula of the modified matrix. The employees immediately began to carry out her orders. They told Dr. Min that they were calling her. The girl asked the employee to say that she would call back later because I'm very busy right now. Then it came from the phone that if she didn't pick up the phone, they might freeze their funding. Then Dr. Min immediately turned her head and asked who it was. They told her that they didn't know, but the payment had decreased a minute ago. She doesn't think it's a bluff. The doctor went outside and started calling. She asked what they needed. They forced her to pick up the phone. Why did she need to go to the roof? It turns out that the girl had already climbed almost to the very roof. At the other end of the phone, they said that they were on the roof. The girl said that it would do. Isn't that what they insist on? And she asked me to wait a little. When she climbed onto the roof above her head, she saw a helicopter. She couldn't understand what was happening at all. In front of us is the headquarters of the ICAR. The man said that this is why they always argued about the need for another planet for the life of humanity. Not surprisingly, the video of the probe's launch looked like a montage. Dr. Min asked, sitting opposite the gray-haired man, what he wanted her to do. He asked her to look at the file called R11. The girl asked if this was a control system. The man replied that she grasps everything on the fly. The director said that they found out that there is a control system inside the asteroid. It seems to work directly through a person's brain when a person places their hand on it. His people said they couldn't get any data from there for them to analyze. He is afraid that this is beyond his experience. 
Dr. Min said that if she had been warned earlier and studied Rama herself, she might have been able to help, but now she can't do anything. The girl apologized for disappointing him. The director asked her not to leave the earth without hope. In addition, this request from her friend to bring her here. He also insisted that she get a ticket to Mars. The girl was very surprised and asked who the friend was. When she found out, she said that she and Yong Hee were really good friends and kept in touch. She always wanted to do terraforming, but now she is studying how to analyze the brain and compile its database. Yong Su told the main character that she said that she gave it up because it was impossible to use with their technology, but she still believes that humanity needs more than one planet to live on, so she changed direction to bioforming. Kong replied that everything was clear to him, so she decided to study how to make it possible for a person to survive on other planets, for example, replacing bones with other materials. Yong Su replied that she was studying the transfer of their consciousness into existing devices. It's faster and more practical than remaking human bodies, so she studies the brain. The main character exclaimed that this was decisive, after which they received a message from the Space Center. This is from Icar. Looks like he managed to find Yong He. Meanwhile, Dr. Min was texting them. She said hello and didn't ask how far they had climbed. Then she thanked her for the ticket to Mars. She couldn't believe they were telling her all this just now. And she wrote that she should have told her about this earlier. Then the guy wrote in what sense she meant earlier. After all, this is the first time they've talked since middle school. Didn't Principal Klasky tell her that? The girl asked in a message to Young Su if this was it. Well, she received an answer that this was Chel So Kong. The main character told Yong Hee about everything that happened in the cave, about how they found the control room, how the control system is ahead of human technology. Dr. Min apologized in the message, and she said that him telling her about this would not solve anything. She told Principal Klasky that it was impossible, and it was. Helping them connect to the alien computer is beyond her power. Kang asked if they could go back in time what he would have to do to become friends with her. She could have found a way if she had started much earlier. The girl asked what he was talking about. Is he really that upset? They both know that time travel is impossible. The main character answered the girl that he was traveling. He is stuck in a time loop that forces him to relive his life again. The boy wrote that everything was fine. She didn't have to believe him. Let him consider this just the chatter of a crazy classmate. And he asked what he could do to make friends with little her. She asked if he was serious, to which the boy asked her and began to explain that they had very little time. After this, another team from the ground arrived at Rama, with nuclear bombs to destroy the asteroid core. Looking at the data on the way here, he was surprised by the scale of the core. The bombs must explode before they reach the core, because the core consists of a complex alloy coated with ceramics, as described in the report. A man standing next to Kong asked if the ceramic shell was heat-resistant. Kong replied that she was stable, therefore sending bombs there would be the best solution. Then the man said that he did not understand his logic. At least they can try. If they want to increase the chances of saving the Earth, they must put the bombs inside as soon as possible. Meanwhile, Yong Su was pushing his comrade Taiha out, but he didn't want to leave. The guy said that he was staying. Yong Su asked if he had gone crazy and what was wrong with him. Taihu said that he can do whatever he wants with his life. After all, there is no guarantee that an escape on Mars will leave humanity alive. Well, if he stays, then maybe. He will be able to go back in time with Chelsea, and he asked not to stop him. Kang closed his eyes and told the boy that if he stayed, he would simply die a terrible death. Therefore, he advised the guy to leave and not make his life difficult. Taihu asked how he knew all this. Have you really tried it? Yong Su knocked the guy out with one punch. He said they don't have much time, but he's glad he's here with him, hoping that in his next life he will find it too. And then they said goodbye. The main character stood looking out the window. The detonation of the shells will begin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. The shells detonated but failed to destroy the Rama. The plan failed. Kong asked if there were any changes in the asteroid's course. He was told that no changes had been detected. Not even any errors were found. They changed course to Mars. The guy asked Dr. Kang not to be upset. After all, he did everything he could. This is St. Toosville. And so they embark on Project Noah. 
The main character thought about what he was told. He did everything he could. The boy opened a jar of juice, and he said that next time he would end this once and for all. So it really is a spaceship. Yumi was next to the main character. She asked if the boy thought that whoever sent Rama wants to destroy them because he believes that people are a hostile life form. Kong replied that one can only hope that she did exactly that. He lowered his head down again, thinking. The boy was sitting next to his classmate on a bench. Yumi patted him on the back and said that now they know a lot. Does he want to invent something like a neurochip this time? Kong replied that he wanted to. To be precise, a brain-computer interface. He wants to focus their investment on research into brain data collection and analysis. Yumi asked if they would make it on time. Kang said that there were promising results in the laboratory. Well, everything was already nearing the end. And he already has a person in mind for this job. It just so happens that she also studies at their school. The main character closed his eyes and continued to explain what she herself told him about how they could become friends. The girl was very surprised. And so Yumi called Chelso. She asked him if he had ever heard of Clark and Asimov. They write interesting books. The boy replied that of course he had read. Min was thinking about her own things but heard their conversation. Kong said that he recently read about terraforming Venus or something like that. It was very interesting. Yumi asked if terraforming on Venus is possible. There is also a very weak own magnetic field. Kong replied that it was possible. The planet's magnetic field is influenced by its internal activity. The Earth's magnetic field, for example, is created by the movement of fluids along the outer shell of the Earth. But the surface of Venus is very hot, so scientists suspect that this interferes with any movement on the shell. Min was already listening to them carefully. She exclaimed that if they cooled the mantle, they could cause movement in the shell, which in turn will create a magnetic field, is she correct? The main character and Yumi were very happy. They realized that the girl had taken the bait. The plan was a success. Young He didn't have any friends who shared her interests, so they quickly became friends with her. She naturally became friends with their comrades Minsu and Taehu. They also communicated more with Yong Su, who was actually friends with Yong He. They are absorbed in their personal little worlds. Finally, we found friends with whom we could share our dreams. Time passed. A whole year of his eighth life had already passed. The main character looked closely at the girl. Once he trusted Yonhi enough, he followed her advice from his past life, told her about time travel and his plans. The girl asked the boy if he wanted her to help him with bioforming. Then Kong asked if she believed him. Min replied that she knew him well enough to know that he was not someone who would lie. Min Su and Yumi want to help him, and none of them trust people just like that. And here is also Tehu. Here the girl asked if they had told Taya to convince her to give up terraforming and do bioforming instead. Indeed, Tehu told her about this. Allegedly, this is all for her own good. He asked her to dream about what is achievable. Does she really think terraforming is possible? He argued that bioforming is possible, but terraforming is unlikely. Tehu told the girl that she needed to return to reality. How long will she hold on to her dream? Min asked if they forced him. Kong swore that they didn't ask Taiha to do this. Then Yonhi asked to forget about it and tell her about everything in more detail. She wanted to know what exactly was required of her. The main character said that the research is NK. He wants her to research NKI for them. The girl listened carefully and was very surprised. Kong explained that this means creating an interface for connecting the human brain to devices. Simply put, move information from the brain to the computer directly, like the brain-controlled computers in the comics. Young He asked if they really wanted her to find a way to study the computer in the alien spaceship, to which the boy replied that this is exactly what they want. The girl explained that she had never thought about this. Well, when they told her a secret and asked her to help. Then the main character interrupted her and asked to listen. He explained that she will soon become the best in this field. Of course, this will not be easy at all because you will need to work a lot, but in the future, he will find a way. The girl immediately replied that she would go, and she said that you need to study what you need to do and read as much as possible about NKI. She told the guys that she would start immediately, after which she immediately ran to begin training. Yumi looked after her and said that she was right. Yong-Hu believed him because she recognized him best. 
The girl told the main character that she was glad that everything worked. People like her are rare, after all. But she would never have believed it if Kong had not told her about her father. After all, if you think about it, it's very strange, as if only great minds gathered in their class. How do they manage to find the right people in their own class when they need them so much? Yumi looked at the boy and said that maybe that's why he was the chosen one, to travel through time. Kong replied that who knows, but it sounds real, especially if someone threw him into a time loop so that he could save the Earth. Yumi asked if she should call someone else. Kang replied that it's not worth it yet. After all, you need to act with extreme caution. They need to prepare for a different possible future. And now 20 whole years have passed. Before us is a huge, bright research institute of the girl Yong He. There were employees in the office at their workplaces. The girl was in some kind of glass flask. The employees were already ready to begin. And so the system initialization began. The girl was lying in this glass flask. The connection check has begun. They realized that everything was working. Her thoughts are transferred to the computer. They succeeded. She knew that everything would work out. Can't wait to show off to the main character. Then she asked to wait a minute. And she wondered if all her thoughts were being broadcast even if she wasn't concentrating. With this degree of migration, they will be able to get dates from Rama. The girl opened her eyes and exclaimed that she didn't want to tell anyone about it yet, and we decided to leave it at that for now. She asked the guys to turn off the connection. The employee was very surprised that she wanted to turn off the system, after which I realized that they were really too carried away. When Dr. Min came to her senses and the flask was opened, she immediately asked to show her the data. She really wants to see what thoughts were transferred. The main character has already spoken on the phone, wondering what happened next. Was there a visual display of thoughts or reducing the size of the device? The girl explained that given the success they have already achieved, visual display is not difficult and he doesn't have to worry about shrinking. Dr. Min told the boy that as soon as the analysis was completed, she thought that they would be able to do everything without an MRI. The main character exclaimed that this is a great job and he told the girl that he would soon come to her laboratory. He thought that so far everything was going smoothly. Trying to make the most of their time, she and Yumi told Yong Su and Taehu everything about Rama and time loops right after high school graduation. Yong Su explained that he couldn't answer him yet. Well, if he really is telling the truth, it will show at that time, and asked if this was a problem. At first, Yong Su decided to doubt it. Taehu said that if this is true, then it's really awesome. Perhaps closed time curves occur when matter meets antimatter. The chronology hypothesis would not be violated at the microscopic level. Well, if the explosion is so huge that it can destroy the Earth, then it can create a mini black hole and bend space and time. If one enters microscopic quantum gravity, it may be possible to travel through time. Tehu took the boy by the shoulders and asked why he was telling him about this only now. After all, if he had known about this earlier, he would have entered theoretical physics. On the other hand, he can still do it. He'll probably change direction next year. Friends believed him in their own way, each at their own time. In this way, he was able to gain their support early on, perhaps because they had a clear picture of the future. But this time, everything went much more smoothly than during his previous attempts. Minsu developed his cell technology much faster. And Yong Su is more active on the side and has explored bases on the moon and Mars. He also took on the task of creating a spacecraft on the KNG space station. After the development of the fusion engine, Taihu left the CCRC and joined the KNG. This helped speed up work on the spacecraft. During this, Yumi made the most of what was happening so that they would not be short of resources. However, in life, everything is never perfect and too smooth. Here, the main character was notified that he was getting a call from the KNG space station. The guy thought it must be Min Su, but Yong Su was in touch. The main character asked what happened to his face. Did something really go wrong? The boy, looking at him, exclaimed that something was clearly wrong with Tai Hu. He sends the wrong parts. The guy grabbed his head with his hand, closing his eyes. He explained that we were talking about the injector siphon. First he sent him nine Bs, then eleven As, and then he sent him the wrong parts three times. Then this happened again. Well, this is not even the strangest thing in everything that happens to him. He told them sorry. Kong immediately found the guy and asked if he had gone crazy. What is this anyway? 
Looking at the drawings, he asked why he was developing a gas phase core when they were already racing against time on their projects. He doesn't know why he called him here, in order to develop an engine for a spaceship, because that's why he founded this institute. Then the guy put his hands on his head and exclaimed that Kong had caught him. The main character asked if this was all he could tell him now, after which he began to shout at him and asked if he didn't understand that he almost ruined everything. What he, Yumi, Minsu, and Young Su have been working on all this time. Taehu replied that he was exaggerating. He agreed that he made a mistake in sending the parts. Well, this only happened three times. He already realized the mistake and told Young Su that he would send the correct ones. Kong exclaimed that three times is a lot. In addition, he entrusted the task to a newcomer. Even the best employee cannot be trusted to do this. They only found three errors, but there may be more of them and whether he is telling the truth. Taehu asked if he knew about this, and he said that he admits that this is serious. Well, he's already fixed everything. He sent the correct details. Kong asked if he knew what Young Su was doing. Double checks every detail in the parts they have already assembled. Each one personally, one at a time. Why don't they assign another person to check the details? Does he really think this will solve the problem? What if the engine explodes and what they worked on all their lives goes down the drain? Or he will get lost in outer space because the engine suddenly stops working? And he will no longer be able to go back in time. Does he really want this because they have come such a long way together? That's what he thinks. Another person checking details. Will it really fix everything? The guy asked him for forgiveness and said that he didn't think. Taehu began to explain to the boy that he had already come up with a solution to this problem. He just wanted to check if it worked. The main character asked what it was all about. This is not what they use in the engine. Taehu replied, no. He just wanted to try. He actually thought it might help him in his next attempts if it all worked out. And he asked the main character if he had already thought about this. Kong apologized and replied that he really wanted to do this research. Maybe not for him, but he only has this life. Small team. He can work on this with no more than a team of ten people, but definitely not here. Taehu did not let up. He began to put forward his new versions. But the main character stood his ground. He said that otherwise, the boy would do everything himself. When Taehu asked if he was leaving, Kong headed towards the exit and said that he needed to find a replacement. He needs someone to develop the engine for the spacecraft. Taehu laughed and asked if he needed any recommendations. Maybe Charlotte, she is great at managing people. He can help him persuade her. They are good friends after all. But the main character replied that he already had someone in mind. He wants to talk to Dr. Odeli Arquette. Kong said that he would continue to do what he had been doing until now. Tell him what he did and ask for help. He had already spoken to Dr. Arquette. This girl, of course, did not immediately believe him. She was very surprised. Kong noticed that she was not entirely sure. Odali agreed with the boy. Then he showed her the image. It was the asteroid she saw, or the very fact that this is actually a spaceship is, of course, very difficult to believe. He asked the girl if she knew that the Brain Data Research Institute was collaborating with them. They were able to develop technology that reads thoughts and translates them into images. Kong opens the doors in front of her and said that he will show her everything that he told. This is really not a joke. Perhaps this is not entirely proof, but he thinks there will always be doubts. When the boy opened the doors for her, and she entered the room and was very surprised, she realized that all this time the main character had been preparing for this. And so the girl said that the tenth launch pad was a cover, but in fact he wants to fix this extraterrestrial ship he was talking about. Kang said it sounds like she's starting to believe him. The girl explained that there were too many things for it to turn out to be a lie. Everyone knows that he hates wasting resources. The doctor asked how long he had been preparing all this. The boy replied that creating robots takes time, so it's been a long time. He started as soon as he built this place. Dr. Odley asked what exactly they needed from her. Maybe he wants her to develop even more robots or helped with some other tasks. Then Kong explained that he was passing it all on to her. Because he needs someone to build another spaceship while he's on Rama. The first manned umbrella must reach Rama as soon as possible to analyze its control system. After this, the second spaceship will bring reinforcements. She should be the one to do this. 
You need to build a ship from scratch, not just an engine, and you also need to manage modifications and launch and also transportation. The girl listened to the main character, opening her eyes wider and wider into yours. He explained that she would do all this as the general director. Odley was surprised that she had to work on one project and manage it, and even as a general director, she said that people definitely wouldn't like this. Kang said that he is the largest shareholder in this company, so it's up to him to decide. Besides, she's the only one who can handle it, Dr. Odili agreed after some thought. She told the boy that she would try. Kang extended his hand towards her and exclaimed that he couldn't wait to work with her. After they shook hands, the main character decided to briefly introduce her to their plans. After the KNG successfully launched the parts to build a city on Mars, humans moved closer to colonizing the planet. Thanks to the large number of scientists who landed there, although the planet still remains unfavorable for life. He imagines how humanity will walk on its surface without a spacesuit. And as a first step towards such a future, he goes to Titan, which is Saturn's largest moon. It will bring the methane it finds to Mars and inject it into the atmosphere to form water and air. The boy continued to say that after this he would make Mars suitable for life, with friends who have shared his dream for a long time. People applauded the new endeavor. No one doubted that one day this would become a new page in the history of mankind. With high expectations placed upon them, they set off for Titan on the previous probe. And so the change in course begins. They turn to 21, 30, 122. Then they copy 21, 30, 122. Was it really necessary to organize such a grandiose demonstration for this? Who knows? Maybe if they had told the truth, the funding would have been better. Kang said he might not be CEO, but doubts investors would be willing to finance them if he told them he wanted to stop an asteroid that wanted to destroy the Earth. Yumi exclaimed that the boy really understood everything correctly. Yong Su asked, what now? Will they really just get lost in space? And today it's about 1.52. The first previous probe encountered a problem. They suspect they are micrometeors. The Pressvi's main engine and communication systems were damaged and the probe was thrown off course. Most likely, the probe will fly out of the solar system. Then KNG will build another probe as soon as possible to save their scientists. The doctor said all this to the cameras, after which she said that this was the end of their press conference and thanked all the participants. People around her began to stop her, wondering why she wasn't answering questions. What a press conference this is. She just made an announcement and that's it. People asked whether she would save them. After all, in the schedule that she published, it is written that the ship should not slow down. Can the second ship catch up with it? When the girl left, people shouted back at her, asking about all this. They needed answers. After all, the people of the planet should know about this. However, contrary to the announcement, the previous moved straight to Rama. The girl thought that everything seemed to be going according to plan. The main character said that she did a great job, all thanks to his plans. At this rate, they think they will be able to finish the second ship even earlier. The boy wrote to Dr. Odily that if everything continued like this, she would no longer need his instructions. He will contact you when they arrive at Rama. The doctor looked out the huge window straight into the sky. She thought that she would really like to fly with them. Meanwhile, the first ship had already reached its destination. Dr. Min exclaimed that now that she sees it with her own eyes, it is stunning. Yumi agreed with her and said that this was all terrifying. Just think that a cave of this size is the engine compartment. How does this spaceship move? Its speed is probably close to the speed of light. Well, definitely much slower than now. Most likely it is not accelerated, but even slowed down. The video recording of the cave has been completed and has already been sent. Yong Su asked how Dr. Kang was doing. Did he find the metal wall he was talking about earlier? The main character replied that he found it. The guy said that they were almost there too. Kang said that he had found the wall and was now cutting through it with a plasma cutter. If everyone completed their tasks, then he asked them to quickly go to the appointed place, and they agreed to meet in the asteroid control room. Dr. Min closed her eyes and realized how it all works. She was very interested. It's like awareness combined with visual imagination. She said that these aliens seem to have other senses besides sight. The main character asked if she could analyze it. The girl replied that she needed to try, but she thought that it was still possible. She may be wrong, but she has a feeling that the control system is trying to help them. The main character said that judging by the data that he saw even earlier, 
this system seemed to want to communicate with them. Yong Su approached the guys and said that the analyzer was already ready. The Rama analyzer is a mechanical brain that Young He designed to work just like their own. At first glance, the device is quite strange, but it is designed to analyze data without human intervention. She understands that the design is not particularly important, but at first glance, the device is strange. Because they were focused only on functions, Dr. Min said it might look strange, but every part is needed for something. The guys asked if it all worked. Dr. Min said that it was responding to the data they sent. The main character suggested waiting a little. Dr. Min lowered her head, noticing that nothing seemed to be changing. It simply displays their downloaded data. She thought there was no point in expecting much meaning. It doesn't seem to be able to respond to text or pictures other than its own. How to show Koreans a book in Arabic or Greek. The main character suggested leaving plan A and starting plan B. He thinks there is no point in continuing to move in this direction. Min, lower your head, agreed with the boy. She believes that even aliens believe that there is no need to program their computers to have their own consciousness. From the data they were able to analyze, she learned that Rama uses sexagesimal. Yong Su wondered if this was the same system that the ancient Babylonians used. Could they be somehow connected with the aliens who built this ship? Dr. Min replied that it was impossible to say for sure. She thinks you can't base their observations on themselves. Then Yumi turned on and said that she tried to decipher some symbols. She thinks that the first most likely means a star, the second ice, and the last means water in liquid form. She came to this conclusion because the first symbol is found with images of stars and planets, Enceladus, Europe, and the second and third characters appear with these two images. The main character immediately wondered what it could be, Enceladus and Europa, where there may be a connection between them. He asked how the girl matched these symbols with ice and water. She began to explain that water is a symbol and showed it on the screen. It also appears in the description of Rama Earth. She wondered what these bodies had in common, and it turned out to be the presence of water. The main character, looking at what the girl was showing, exclaimed that this was quite logical. Yong Hu said that both Enceladus and Europa most likely had ice in common. The girl replied that it was true. This symbol also appears when describing the rings of Saturn, so she assumed it was probably ice. Dr. Min said that if they combine what she calculated and the symbols deciphered by Yumi, then the text will be translated as the third planet from the 20 water star. This is quite reasonable. Yumi explained that she was also working on other symbols, so she'll let you know if she can decipher anything else. Dr. Min looked at Yong Su and asked if he was able to find out anything. Then the guy replied that he climbed into the Rama registry to find out where he was from. He wanted to understand the reasons for the breakdown and the destination. Yumi asked if he had found the answers to these questions. The boy replied that he had not found it, but he was able to approximately find out the path he had taken. And he found out that they had big problems. The main character immediately became wary that he meant big problems. The guy continued that to begin with. He was able to verify that Rama entered the solar system, passing through Delta Pavoni, Epsilon Indian, and Alpha Centauri. As they all understand, he does not think that Rama made this journey without anyone's help. Dr. Min asked if he was hinting at the fact that it was a warp. The boy said that this is indeed the most likely explanation. If these are indeed warp engines, then things become much more complicated. Dr. Kang immediately lowered his head to his knees, very worried. The guy thought that in his case, he concentrated on elements of denial. Knowing them and what the highlighted words mean can help them translate the text more accurately. So he extracted some words from the text displayed by Rama. This was overridden by the command and yielded something. The main character was very excited. He walked over to the computer screen and exclaimed that he needed to check something. Dr. Min approached the boy and also looked at the screen. She asked if Rama was seriously heading towards the ground. Is it really for the sake of water? Kong saw the same image that Rama showed in the control room. There was the word water, which Yumi deciphered, and the elements of negation, which he deciphered. The meaning of these phrases is clear as day. The large cavern they believed to be the engine compartment was initially filled with water. But for unknown reasons, the water disappeared, preventing the functioning of the transmitter. It is unknown what the water was used for. 
Did it serve as fuel? Possibly a particle retarder or coolant. But one thing was certain. The reason for the Rama problems was the lack of water. Knowing this, they could conclude that Rama was trying to reach the ground to replenish its supply of water in liquid form. Yonghu said that this explains why there is an image of Enceladus in Europa. They could be an alternative. The main character agreed with him, and he said that despite the fact that there is water on both satellites, Rama is still heading towards the Earth. This means that he cannot break through the ice crust to get water. Dr. Min asked why crash into the ground then. Why not just take water and fly away? Yumi said that they found ice on both poles of Rama. This means there is water on the surface here too. Dr. Kang said that they cannot know for sure. The ice on the surface may be water that has leaked from the cave. The boy thought that one problem was coming after another. So what now? Maybe you should fill the cavity with water and see what happens next. Well, how can you do this? Yumi advised melting the ice to provide water for the room. Then why not submit a request for a second space shelter, so that they send lasers and other heat sources directly to them? Kong said that he sent an adjusted version of Yumi's proposal to Earth. He requested that mirrors be installed in space so that the sun's rays would be directed directly at Rama. He wasn't sure they would get it done in time, but he needed to notify the ground as soon as possible so the plan could begin. Apart from the challenge of building reflective panels on the Earth and the Moon and installing them in space to direct sunlight towards Rama, there was still the task of moving water from the melted ice into the cavity. Come up with an alternative if this plan fails. Yumi told Kong that he apparently didn't mention her suggestion to use a second hideout. The main character said that this is definitely a good idea, but it is not a solution. This is the last hope for those who are now on Earth. Yumi, of course, agreed with the boy, but she asked what if the reflectors were not installed in time. Dr. Kong replied that in this case, this attempt would also be a failure. Yumi said that it was still very ineffective. Why not try harder instead of starting over? But then Kong interrupted her. He asked what if he didn't actually go back in time? What if he moves from one parallel universe to another? Everyone in his previous attempts is dead. He thinks that while there is such an opportunity, we need to try to save as many people as possible. As requested, mirrors will be installed in space. They will be stopped at the Lagrangian point L4. They will shine sunlight on Rama once they are done. Regarding the delivery of water to them, they are thinking about supplying pieces of ice to Rama. To do this, they want to install a capture device on the vehicle. Here, the main character was called out by an employee. She said that she had just uploaded a file to the server and asked if he would look. Kong told Yumi that she was the best. Yumi uploaded a file containing data that could help determine the water temperature required for Rama to function correctly and how they can get that temperature. Water at 4 degrees Celsius. The main character thought that this way they would no longer have to worry about how to get water at the right temperature. All that remains is to figure out how to put water into the cavity or find some other way. He notified the Earth of an alternative plan, but was unsure if it would work. They were trying to find the internal Rama pump, and Yong Su still found him. He found the pumping mechanism, but he's not sure if this can be called pumping. He figured out how Rama moves matter from the outside to the inside. The main character was very surprised and asked how he figured it out. Yong Su replied that it was a warp drive. The bastards who built it used it to transport matter. Dr. Kang was very surprised by this and said that he felt like a caveman. He can't figure out exactly how it works, but it seems to him that something in the core is controlled by the warp drive. Warp drives can move materials up to a distance of about one kilometer from the surface. Well, it says here that it can only move steam or water. The main character asked why there was no ice. Then Yong Su showed him whether he saw this image on the left in the picture. It seems this engine is needed to melt ice. Well, it seems to be broken. If it worked, you would have already melted the ice on the surface. Then Rama, I would have to go all the way to the ground. The main character said that it needs to be tested, and he asked the guy to send some of their water to Rama, and so that he doesn't forget to grab a heater so that the water doesn't freeze. Based on the results of the study, it turned out that the Rama control functions still work. The drops of water they sent suddenly evaporated on their way to Rama, and they appeared only in the cavity. Therefore, they in turn continued to try to find a solution. And suddenly, Yong He was able to find him. This was their new chance for advancement. 
Dr. Min asked permission to first clarify that the Rama engine is working, contrary to their guesses. It's still functioning. However, it is now dormant. The doctor explained that it was unknown what function the water performed and why it disappeared, but the lack of water put the engine to sleep. It works at a minimum force, just enough to prevent the antimatter from exploding on the surface and allowing it to react to anything. Yong Su asked if they turn on this engine. Will everything be fine? Dr. Min replied that everything would be fine. The problem can be solved by filling the cavity with water. Yumi asked what about the other problem? Will they start brainstorming? Dr. Min replied that this was not necessary. She had already found another solution. Everything is very simple. You just need to provide Rama with enough solar energy. Everything else will decide itself. Once the light melts the ice on the poles of Rama, it will send water into the cavity. As a result, the engine will be powered by solar energy, after which it will restart itself. This means you need to direct the light to Rama. Dr. Min agreed with their opinion. But she continued to explain that according to calculations, 470 zettawatts per hour would be needed, or at least 243 petawatts to provide the engine with the necessary energy. The main character was very surprised, and I remembered the Kardashev scale, a method of measuring the technological development of a civilization based on the amount of energy used. No civilization can ignore the laws of the universe. But the more developed a civilization is, the more energy it consumes. The hypothetical classification is based on the assumption that the progress of a civilization depends on how much energy it consumes. According to this scale, earthly civilization has not yet reached the level of the first type and therefore falls into the zero type. Energy consumption on Earth has not yet reached one petawatt. They can collect enough energy if they place a mirror the size of the Earth as close to the sun as possible, and they will direct the rays to Rama with close to ideal accuracy. However, all he could achieve in this life was the construction of two cylindrical structures, which were no more than 80 kilometers in length and 12 kilometers in diameter. After conducting an analysis, they concluded that Rama normalization was not possible. This will require a huge amount of energy, not just water. And such an amount of energy is unattainable. Therefore, they are asked to stop working on reflectors and transporting water. Instead, they ask them to send them atomic bombs. The chances of success are extremely low, but it's still worth a try. It is also necessary to redirect all efforts to the construction of a second space shelter for evacuation. This may be their hope. Dr. Odelli listened to all this, very worried. Yumi asked the main character what will happen now. He didn't understand the question. Then the girl asked if he planned to start all over again. The boy, looking at the ceiling, replied that no. He decided to stop trying if it didn't work this time. Atomic bombs were ineffective, after which they headed to Mars. Meanwhile, their comrade Minsu greeted the guys, and he said that they did everything they could. Having met his friends, he asked them to pass, and he explained that he personally chose a special place for their new homes. The guys were very surprised at how beautiful the view was. Yumi exclaimed that it was really beautiful. Whoever designed this did a good job. Dr. Min asked how he managed to replicate the sky. And in other areas, the ceiling is completely different. The main character listened silently and looked into the distance. He can live in such a place and not miss the land. They have done enough to help humanity get back on its feet. He thinks that this will really be enough. His comrades also agreed with him. They still have a lot to do before the mission fails. The development of regulations and administrative issues has never been more important, so that such a large population can survive in a limited space. Meanwhile, the last evacuees left the ground. On the second space shelter, called the Ark, they traveled about 150 million kilometers to Mars. The space city finally found its first and only neighbor. It was important to promote cooperation with the Ark, whose administrators pursued interests other than the space city. And suddenly the day came for Rama to collide with the Earth. The boy asked who wants beer. Taihu immediately replied that he was just thirsty, and he asked where they dug it up. It's hard to find beer here. Yumi asked to wait a little, and I asked if they brought it from the Ark last time. She asked where they hid it because she had not seen it anywhere. And what the main character answered is that there are such places. And taking the jar in his hands, he brought it to himself. 
Now he understands why he doesn't remember how his previous two attempts ended. He couldn't believe that this little thing could destroy the whole earth. The earth perished, but they in turn remained. And now we need to move forward. Tehu was holding a can of beer in his hands. The main character asked if he could contact the Ark. I'm sure everything is in order, but I still need to check because there is no more land. After all this, they got drunk. They tried to drown their sadness with alcohol and jokes. There was a feeling that a mountain of work awaited them. But they allowed themselves to devote the day to sharing their common grief. Then Tehu burst into the main character's room. He called Dr. Kang to tell him that they had a problem. The boy explained that they had lost contact with the Ark. The main character immediately began to sweat. Tehu grabbed his head and exclaimed that it must be Gamma Luchi. The explosion created gamma rays at levels much higher than they had anticipated. The walls of the space shelter will not support them. More gamma rays were created because matter collided with scattered antimatter. The concentration of antimatter inside Rama is higher than they expected. Or moving gamma rays could create an environment where creation and destruction happen over and over again. It seems they didn't look at the destruction of the planet in such detail. Taihu said that according to his calculations, they have ten, then paused. He exclaimed that it was still five minutes before the gamma rays affected their body. The main character tilted his head down and thought that he had screwed up again. You couldn't give up no matter how hard it was, if he wants humanity to survive. If he wants to survive, then under no circumstances should he stop searching for a solution. Will this really be the next life? Taihu asked the main character to fly away from the solar system in his next life. After all, based on the consequences of the explosion, there will be no safe place in the solar system. Taihu was quite excited. He asked the main character to build a spaceship and fly beyond the solar system. After all, there is no other way. He asked to help him develop the engine he was working on and go somewhere like Alpha Centauri. If successful, the engine will allow travel at a speed equal to 10% of the speed of light. But he doesn't know whether he will be able to find a suitable place to live. But you can always gather resources and continue searching for the originating location. Kong is going to run into an asteroid or something anyway. With Minsu and Yunga's research, Yungsu's skills as an astronaut, and Yumi's ability to make money, he's confident he'll succeed. Stretching his hand forward, the boy asked the main character to use everything he had and don't screw it up under any circumstances. And then Dr. Kang woke up again. After waking up again, this time he remembered everything. Almost all the memories remain. This is due to the fact that he died outside the influence of Rama. Death near the collision is the reason why only fuzzy memories remained from the past life. The flow of space and time, which he thought was the cause of the time loop, instead of helping him, only hindered him. Another phenomenon separate from the collision it saw his time travel and many of his memories disappear due to the passage of time and space. This has been a stumbling block all along. The main character spoke, thinking about what happened. After all his movements, it was the turn of his ninth life. Yumi asked what the main character said. Well, the boy replied that he didn't say anything and asked where he stopped. Yumi explained that he was talking about building an interstellar spaceship and sending it to Alpha Centauri. Kong said that this was his plan. She asked why she had the feeling that he would not go there with them. The main character replied that it was because he couldn't. He doesn't know why yet, but there is a fact that he can return with his memories intact, so he can find a way to stop Rama. The boy sat thinking about how to do it right. Yumi asked if it would be better for him to evacuate. After all, there is no guarantee that attempts are unlimited. Uh, the main character said that one day he will give up or he will have to do it. But for now, he wants to build the perfect spaceship. Kang said all this to the girl in all seriousness. Yumi asked him to wait. After all, if he really remembers everything, doesn't that mean he knows which products will be popular? Surely he should know what will happen to the market in the future. The girl really gave him a good idea, giving him positive thoughts. Then the main character approached her and began to whisper in her ear that he also had something, even a lot, to tell her. He told her that with the money they now have, they can do a lot. And here is the next tenth life of the main character. His comrades gathered around the conference table. Kang said that their plan failed, but they made great progress. Taihu successfully created a gas core engine. They managed to build a complex with a capacity of 100,000 people. He thinks that their target, of course, is an air-breathing engine. 
Taehu said that he knew that he would succeed. This is technology. Kung told Min Su that he had successfully developed an enzyme that slowed down cellular metabolism by 30% during cryogenic sleep. It is amazing. He didn't have high hopes for it. They have somehow advanced the issue of hypersleep or other ways to prolong life and slow down aging. Kong said that lengthening telomeres again led to the development of cancer, and regarding aging as someone synthesized in cells above, but this was recognized as ineffective for prolonging life. It was impossible to transport them back in time using brainwaves. Dr. Min was upset and said that it still couldn't be done. In addition, it was not possible to invite more people to the team. What happened to the laser? The next 11th life of the main character has arrived. Not much has changed since the last attempt. No progress with telomeres, and it has not yet been possible to reduce the anti-aging device. The same thing happened with brain dating. They sat together again at the same table at the conference, and again they said that their attempts to speed up technological progress with the help of foresight also failed. The twelfth life of the main character has begun. They all gathered at the table again. Dr. Kong exclaimed that they had failed again. The laser Rami developed became a weapon. The thirteenth life of the main character has begun. Still the same picture. Dr. Kang said that they failed again. The only thing worth mentioning concerns his time loop. Each time, a whole three months are missed. But due to the distortion caused by the destruction of the Earth, it is not the same again. And here is the fourteenth life of the main character. They all gathered around the table again. The boy exclaimed that they had another failure. The fifteenth life of the main character. Again, nothing happened. The Earth exploded. Another failure. The sixteenth life of the main character. Everything is the same. The same again and again. The seventeenth life of the protagonist. He already began to ask what kind of attempt this was. It seems to be the twentieth after which the twenty-third went. He's already lost count. The main character no longer remembered what he told them last time. He felt that this had already happened. He wondered if he was even in a time loop. How many times have they all gathered together like this? Perhaps ten or thirteen? The boy thought that he still couldn't give up. After all, they had come such a long way with their comrades. In front of them is an interstellar colony ship. It was Alphys. His journey takes forty years. All the comrades were initially in huge glass flasks. In another life, the flasks opened. Yumi climbed out of her flask and sat down on the edge. She put her hand to her head, which was very dizzy. The girl thought it felt like a hangover, but still much better than she thought. Taihu, who grabbed his head and said that his body was aching a little, as if he had been sleeping in an uncomfortable position, and he asked whether forty years had really passed because it feels like he just took a little nap. The clock shows that exactly forty years have passed, but they haven't aged a bit. Kong read the messages. The director was interested in the order or he. He wrote that he was sure that by the time the guy saw this message, many years would have passed. When they went to Alpha Centauri aboard the Alphys, they unfortunately failed. He thought they would be able to evacuate in time, but the gamma rays turned out to be much more powerful than he expected. He deeply regrets the delay in the construction of the spacecraft, despite the fact that he warned. It was worth remodeling it to increase capacity. His decision cost them their lives. But he finds solace in the fact that those aboard the Alphys survived. He is consoled that humanity has a chance to continue to exist, after which the director wished everyone success. And he said that, after all, they didn't need his wishes. Fate has brought them to where they should be now. The message was expected, even if the main character remained on Earth and helped Daniel with the construction of the spaceship. The boy thought that nothing would have worked out anyway. After all, you've already seen this gathering many times. Proxima B is an exoplanet that looks like a capsule from a gotcha machine. From its mother star, Proxima Centauri, it is covered in steaming oceans and red deserts, while the other side is covered with ice. It has water, an atmosphere, land suitable for life, and a fairly strong magnetic field. The planet was not so different from what they expected. Yes, it's possible that they just thought that way. Then Alphys got in touch. They asked if they could hear them. Yumi came running and asked the guys what happened. They replied that Minsu was injured, but it's not that serious. 
The surface of the planet was covered with huge volcanoes that erupted regularly. They thought that Proxima B would be a paradise for them, but it was not suitable for survival. Then they went to the third planet near Alpha Centauri B, to the planet Alpha Centauri BD. And now two years and five months later, Alpha Centauri Feve. As with their attempt at Proxima B, they studied first. However, the briefing on Alpha Centauri B will begin now. They confirm the existence of four planets orbiting the star. And since there is nothing unique in the asteroid belt of this system, he will only talk briefly about the planets. The first planet, BB, is too close to the star as they expected. A planet without water, very similar to Mercury. Second planet, BD. They have an orbit located in the Goldilocks zone. But according to their data, it has a mass that is 30% of the Earth's, and in size only 40% of the Earth. In addition, there is no atmosphere, so it is impossible to live on its surface. Third planet, BD. Based on the results of the study, it is suitable for life. Temperatures average in the mid-60s, but there may be water below the surface if they find a material that can serve as fuel. Well, it looks like she's completely frozen. They thought about whether they could even build on such a planet. Dr. Odley said that she didn't think so. Colonization is most likely possible. The director and his partner asked the main character if he was okay. Turning to them, the boy replied that he was fine. I just laughed at the absurdity. After the main character said this, his comrades immediately looked at him. Young Su asked who he was talking to. Well, the boy told them that now they only have two choices. The first is to move from galaxy to galaxy without an end goal. The second to live in space, feeding from planets like Alpha Centauri BD. I would like to hear their opinion on this matter. The girl asked if they would fly to Calcium Centauri, to which she was told that no one would really fly there, because they came to the conclusion that none of the four planets are suitable for life. Well, don't measurements of black body radiation show that the average temperature is plus 35? The main character replied that it was so, but measurements of the radiation from the absolutely black body of Venus showed that its temperature is plus 30. This data is very reliable. The guy raised his hand up and said that he had one question that did not apply to promising planets. He was given the right to respond. The woman raised her hand and also asked why they allow it to be possible to live in space and not look for a new planet to colonize. Someone is asking this because he didn't know that this research was the true purpose of this mission. The main character was holding a jar of juice in his hands. He raised it up, remembering everything that happened to him. The boy realized that all this was because they were the last representatives of humanity. The main character asked for forgiveness for not telling them about this earlier. He kept this whole truth secret because he was afraid that it would harm their mission. The Earth was destroyed by a collision with an alien spaceship filled with antimatter. As a result, humanity remaining within the solar system was also destroyed. They are the only survivors because they decided to leave the solar system in time. They sat at a large table discussing everything that happened to them. The boy exclaimed that he knows that all this is hard to believe. Well, it's really true. He had just uploaded the evidence to the server and asked everyone else to take a look at it. He continued to say that he understood that they would need time to understand everything. After which, the main character said that he would continue the meeting tomorrow at the same time. He would like to hear their suggestions about what she should do next. They all saw the message that came from the Earth. They asked Dr. Kang if he foresaw that this could happen. When the boy answered that he had foreseen it, they asked him how. He replied that with KNG technology, they could predict that an alien ship would collide with Earth. So the secret worked with the CCCR to evacuate as many people as possible outside the solar system. They can observe the results. One of the guys asked if he already knew that the Earth would be destroyed. Then why didn't he warn people about it? Why do only a few know about this? The main character replied that it was because he knew and that it was useless to warn. They would not believe him. But he knew how the future would change depending on his decisions. The boy explained that warning everyone never ended in anything good. But it doesn't matter now. He would like to hear their opinion and come to a common decision on further actions, after which the main character wanted to see the voting results of everyone else. 32% voted to remain, 6% voted to fly away, and the rest abstained. He then concludes that the abstainers agree to both options. The main character thought that this was understandable. After all, they recently learned that the Earth was destroyed. Then, someone raised their hand. 
The boy thought that he needed to thank them for the fact that they took the news more calmly than he did. It was Yumi Gong. She raised her hand and introduced herself. The girl said that she was a resource manager, and she asked me to let her speak because it seemed to her that they had missed something. She asked why BC was the only planet they were considering for settlement. Shouldn't they explore more planets? Collect more data before making a final decision, especially considering that the temperature of the absolutely black body of the planet AS is about 25 degrees. She thinks it's worth exploring this planet. The main character said that he had already provided several reports about this planet. As they all know, AS is very close in Alpha Centauri. The boy asked if they wanted to explore the remaining planets of Alpha Centauri, after which, looking around at everyone around him, he asked why they shouldn't vote. Ninety percent of the crew voted to continue the study, so they are going to explore a new planet. They studied the planets of Alpha Centauri in order. AEAD, the crew analyzed each planet, analyzing every little detail very carefully. Both objectively and subjectively, they searched for the planet most suitable for their settlement. And finally, we found something incredible on the speaker system. The main character exclaimed that he thought it was something artificial. Exactly what covers the planet? He exclaimed that they had finally found it. 